Good evening from the Magnus Arena at the University of Denver in Denver, Colorado. I'm Jim Lara of the PBS NewsHour, and I welcome you to the first of the 2012 presidential debates between President Barack Obama, the Democratic nominee, and former Massachusetts Governor Mitt Romney, the Republican nominee. This debate and the next three, two presidential, one vice presidential, are sponsored by the Commission on Presidential Debates. Tonight's 90 Minutes will be about domestic issues and will follow a format designed by the Commission. There will be six roughly 15-minute segments with two-minute answers for the first question, then open discussion for the remainder of each segment. Thousands of people offered suggestions on segment subjects or questions via the internet and other means, but I made the final selections, and for the record, they were not submitted for approval to the commission or the candidates. The segments, as I announced in advance, will be three on the economy and one each on health care, the role of government, and governing, with an emphasis throughout on differences, specifics, and choices. Both candidates will also have two-minute closing statements. The audience here in the hall has promised to remain silent. No cheers, applause, boos, hisses, among other noisy, distracting things, so we may all concentrate on what the candidates have to say. There is a noise exception right now, though, as we welcome President Obama and Governor Romney. Jim. Gentlemen, welcome to you both. Let's start the economy, segment one, and let's begin with jobs. What are the major differences between the two of you uh, about how you would go about creating new jobs? You have two minutes. Each of you have two minutes to start. A coin toss is determined. Mr. President, you go first. Well, thank you very much, Jim, for this opportunity. I want to thank Governor Romney and the University of Denver for your hospitality. Uh, there are a lot of points I want to make tonight, but uh, the most important one is that uh, 20 years ago I became the luckiest man on earth because Michelle Obama agreed to marry me. And so uh, I just want to wish, uh, sweetie, uh, you happy anniversary and let you know that a year from now, we will not be celebrating it in front of 40 million people. Uh, you know, four years ago, we went through uh, the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression. Millions of jobs were lost. The auto industry was on uh, the brink of collapse. Uh, the financial system had frozen up. And because of the resilience and the determination of the American people, uh, we've begun to fight our way back. Uh, over the last 30 months, we've seen 5 million jobs in the private sector created. Uh, the auto industry has come roaring back, and housing uh, has begun to rise. But we all know that we've still got a lot of work to do. And so the question here tonight is not uh, where we've been, but where we're going. Uh, Governor Romney uh, has a perspective that says uh, if we cut taxes, skew towards the wealthy, and roll back regulations, that uh, we'll be better off. I've got a different view. I think we've got to invest in education and training. I think it's important for us to develop new sources of energy here in America, that we change our tax code to make sure that we're helping small businesses and companies that are investing here in the United States, that uh, we take some of the money that we're saving as we wind down uh, two wars uh, to rebuild America, and that we reduce our deficit in a balanced way that allows us to make these critical investments. Now, it ultimately, it's going to be up to the voters, to you. Uh, which path we should take. Uh, are we going to double down on the top-down economic policies that help to get us into this mess, or do we embrace a new economic patriotism that says America does best when the middle class does best? And I'm looking forward to having that debate. Governor Romney, two minutes. Thank you, Jim. It's an honor to be here with you, and I appreciate the chance to be with the President. 
I'm pleased to be at the University of Denver. I appreciate their welcome and also the Presidential uh, Commission on these debates. And congratulations to you, Mr. President, on your anniversary. I'm sure this was the mo most romantic place you could imagine <laughs> here, here with me. So I, <laughs> congratulations. Um, th this is obviously a very tender topic. I've had the occasion over the last couple of years of meeting people across the country. I was in uh, Dayton, Ohio, and a woman grabbed my arm and she said, I've been out of work since May. Can you help me? Uh, and yesterday was at a rally in Denver, and a woman came up to her with a baby in her arms and said, Ann, my husband has had four jobs in three years, part-time jobs. He's lost his most recent job, and we've now just lost our home. Can you help us? And the answer is yes, we can help, but it's going to take a different path, not the one we've been on, not the one the president describes as a top-down uh, cut taxes for the rich. That's not what I'm going to do. My plan has five basic parts. One, get us energy independent, North American energy independent. That creates about four million jobs. Number two, open up more trade, particularly in Latin America. Crack down on China if and when they cheat. Number three, make sure our people have the skills they need to succeed and the best schools in the world. We're far away from that now. Number four, get us to a balanced budget. Number five, champion small business. It's small business that creates the jobs in America. And over the last four years, small business people have decided that America may not be the place to open a new business because new business startups are down to a 30-year low. I know what it takes to get small business growing again, to hire people. Now, I'm concerned that the path that we're on has just been unsuccessful. The president has a view very similar to the view he had when he ran four years ago, that a bigger government, spending more, taxing more, regulating more, if you will, trickle-down government would work. That's not the right answer for America. I'll restore the vitality that gets America working again. Thank you. Mr. President, uh, please respond directly to what the governor just said about trickle-down, uh, his trickle-down approach, he's, as he said yours is. Well, uh, let me talk specifically about what I think we need to do. Uh, first, we've got to improve our education system. And we've made enormous progress drawing on ideas, both from Democrats and Republicans, uh, that are already starting to show gains in some of the toughest to deal with schools. Uh, we've got a program called Race to the Top that uh, has prompted reforms in 46 states around the country, raising standards, improving how we train teachers. So now I want to hire another 100,000 uh, new math and science teachers and create 2 million more slots in our community colleges so that people can get trained for the jobs that are out there right now. And I want to make sure that we keep uh, tuition low for our young people. Uh, when it comes to our tax code, you know, Governor Romney and I both agree that our corporate tax rate is too high. Uh, so I want to lower it particularly for manufacturing, taking it down to 25 percent. But I also want to close uh, those loopholes that are giving incentives for companies that are shipping jobs overseas. I want to provide tax breaks for companies that are investing here in the United States. Uh, on energy, Governor Romney and I, we both agree that we've got to uh, boost American energy production. And oil and natural gas production are uh, higher than they've been in, in years. But I also believe that we've got to look at the energy sources of the future, like wind and solar and biofuels, and make those investments. So all of this is possible. Now, in order for us to do it, we do have to close our deficit. And one of the things I'm sure we'll be discussing tonight is uh, how do we deal with our tax code? And how do we make sure that we are reducing spending in a responsible way, but also how do we have enough revenue to make those investments? And this is where there's a difference because Governor Romney's Central economic plan uh, calls for a $5 trillion tax cut on top of the extension of the Bush tax cuts, so that's another trillion dollars, and $2 trillion in additional military spending that uh, the military hasn't asked for. That's $8 trillion. Uh, how we pay for that, reduce the deficit, and make the investments uh, that we need to make without uh, dumping those costs onto middle class Americans, I think, is one of the central questions of this campaign. Both of you have spoke spoken about a lot of different things, and we're going to try to get through them in as specific a way as we possibly can. But first, uh, Governor Romney, do you have a question that you'd like to ask the president directly about something he just said? Well, sure. I'd like to clear up the record and go through piece by piece. First of all, I don't have a $5 trillion tax cut. I don't have a tax cut of the scale that you're talking about. My view is that we ought to provide tax relief to people in the middle class. But I'm not going to reduce the share of taxes paid by high-income people. High-income people are doing just fine in this economy. 
They'll do fine whether you're president or I am. The people who are having the hard time right now are middle-income Americans. Under the president's policies, middle-income Americans have been buried. They're, they're just being crushed. Middle-income Americans have seen their income come down by $4,300. This, this is a tax in and of itself. I'll call it the economy tax. It's been crushing. At the same time, gasoline prices have doubled under the president. Electric rates are up. Food prices are up. Health care costs have gone up by $2,500 a family. Middle-income families are being crushed. And so the question is how to get them going again, and I've described it. It's energy and trade, the right kind of training programs, balancing our budget, and helping small business. Those are the cornerstones of my plan. But the President mentioned a couple of other ideas I'll just note. First, education. I agree, education is key, particularly the future of our economy. But our training programs right now, we've got 47 of them housed in the federal government, reporting to eight different agencies. Overhead is overwhelming. We've got to get those dollars back to the states and go to the workers so they can create their own pathways to getting the training they need for jobs that will really help them. The second area, taxation. We agree we ought to bring the tax rates down, and I do, both for corporations and for individuals. But in order for us not to lose revenue and have the government run out of money, I also lower deductions and credits and exemptions so that we keep taking in the same money when you also account for growth. The third area, energy. Energy is critical, and the President pointed out correctly that production of oil and gas in the U.S. is up, but not due to his policies, in spite of his policies. Mr. President, all of the increase in natural gas and oil has happened on private land, not on government land. On government land, your administration has cut the number of permits and licenses in half. If I'm President, I'll double them and also get the, the oil from offshore in Alaska. And I'll bring that pipeline in from Canada. And by the way, I like coal. I'm going to make sure we can continue to burn clean coal. People in the coal industry feel like it's getting crushed by your policies. I want to get America and North America energy independent so we can create those jobs. And finally, with regards to that tax cut, look, I'm not looking to cut massive taxes and to reduce the, the revenues going to the government. My, my number one principle is there'll be no tax cut that adds to the deficit. I want to underline that. No tax cut that adds to the deficit. But I do want to reduce the burden pay, being paid by middle-income Americans. And, I ha and to do that, that also means I cannot reduce the burden paid by high-income Americans. So any, any uh, language to the contrary is simply not accurate. Mr. President? Well, I think uh, let's talk about taxes because I think uh, it's instructive. Now, uh, four years ago when I stood on this stage, I said that uh, I would cut taxes for middle-class families. Uh, and that's exactly what I did. Uh, we cut taxes for middle-class families uh, by about $3,600. And the reason is because I believe that we do best when the middle class is doing well. And by giving them those tax cuts, they had a little more money in their pocket. And so maybe they can buy a new car. They are certainly uh, in a better position to weather uh, the extraordinary recession that we went through. They can buy a computer for their kid who's going off to college, which means they're spending more money, businesses have more customers, businesses make more profits, and then hire more workers. Now, Governor Romney's proposal that he's been promoting for 18 months calls for uh, a $5 trillion tax cut on top of $2 trillion of additional spending for our military. And he is saying that he is going to pay for it by closing loopholes and deductions. The problem is that uh, he's been asked a over a hundred times how you would close those deductions and loopholes, and he hasn't been able to identify them. But I'm going to make an important point here, Jim. Uh, when you add up all the loopholes and deductions that upper income individuals uh, can, are currently taking advantage of, you take those all away, you don't come close to paying for $5 trillion in tax cuts and $2 trillion in additional military spending. And that's why independent studies looking at this said the only way to meet Governor Romney's pledge of not reducing the deficit or, or, or not uh, adding to the deficit is by burdening middle class families. The average middle class family with children would pay about $2,000 more. Now that's not my analysis, that's the analysis of economists who have looked at this. And, and that kind of top-down top economics where folks at the top are doing well, so the average person making three million bucks is getting a $250,000 tax break, while middle-class families uh, are burdened further, that's not 
what I believe is a recipe for economic growth. All right. What is the difference? Well, uh, let's just stay but, on taxes. But I, but for, I get, uh, right, right. Yeah, yeah just, uh, let's just stay on taxes for yeah. a moment here. Well, but, but what is virtually, the difference? Ev virtually everything he just said about my tax plan is inaccurate. All right. So, so if, if the tax plan he described were a tax plan I was asked to support, I'd say absolutely not. I'm not looking for a $5 trillion tax cut. What I've said is I won't put in place a tax cut that adds to the deficit. That's part one. So there's no economist can say Mitt Romney's tax plan adds $5 trillion if I say I will not add to the deficit with my tax plan. Number two, I will not reduce the share paid by high-income individuals. I, I know that you and your running mate keep saying that, and I know it's a popular thing to say with a lot of people, but it's just not the case. Look, I got five boys. I I'm used to people saying something that's not always true, but just keep on repeating it and ultimately hoping I'll believe it. But that, that is not the case, all right? I, I will not reduce the taxes paid by high-income Americans. And number three, I will not, under any circumstances, raise taxes on middle-income families. I will lower taxes on middle-income families. Now, you cite a study. There's six other studies that looked at the study you described and say it's completely wrong. I saw a study that came out today that said you're going to raise taxes by three to four thousand dollars on middle-income families. There are all these studies out there, but let's get at the bottom line. That is, I want to bring down rates. I want to bring the rates down at the same time, lower deductions and exemptions and credits and so forth, so we keep getting the revenue we need. And you think, well, then why lower the rates? And the reason is because small business pays that individual rate. 54% of America's workers work in businesses that are taxed not at the corporate tax rate, but at the individual tax rate. And if we lower that rate, they will be able to hire more people. For me, this is about jobs. Right. This is about That's getting jobs started. for the American people. Yeah. Do you challenge what the governor just said about his, his own plan? Well, for 18 months, he's been running on this tax plan. And uh, now, five weeks before the election, uh, he's saying that his big, bold idea is, never mind. And uh, the fact is that if you are lowering the rates the way you described, Governor, then it is not possible to come up with enough deductions and loopholes that only affect high-income individuals to avoid either raising the deficit or burdening the middle class. It's, it's math. It's arithmetic. Now, uh, Governor Romney and I do share a deep interest in encouraging small business growth. So at the same time that my tax plan has already lowered taxes for 98% uh, of families, I also lowered taxes for small businesses 18 times. And what I want to do is continue the tax rates, the tax cuts that we put into place for small businesses and families. But I have said that for incomes over $250,000 a year, that we should go back to the rates that we had when Bill Clinton was president, when we created 23 million new jobs, went from deficit to surplus, and created a whole lot of millionaires to boot. And the reason this is important is because by doing that, we can not only reduce the deficit, we can not only uh, encourage job growth through small businesses, but we're also able to make the investments that are necessary in education or in energy. And we do have a difference, though, when it comes to definitions of small business. Now, under under my plan, 97% of small businesses would not see uh, their income taxes go up. Governor Romney says, well, those top 3%, they're the job creators, they'd be burdened. But under Governor Romney's uh, definition, there are a whole bunch of millionaires and billionaires who are small businesses. Donald Trump is a small business. And I know Donald Trump doesn't like to think of himself as small anything, but, uh, but that's how you define small businesses if you're getting business income. And, that kind of approach, I believe, will not grow our economy because the only way to pay for it without either burdening the middle class or blowing up our deficit is to make drastic cuts in things like education, making sure that uh, we are continuing to invest in basic science and research, all the things that are helping America grow. And I think that would be a mistake. All right. Jim, let me just come back on that, on that point, which just is for the, these, just for the these small businesses excuse, we're talking about. Excuse me, just, uh -huh. just so everybody understands. Yeah. We're way over our first 15 minutes. It's fun, isn't it? It's okay. It's great. That's great. okay. No problem. <laughs> now, you all don't have, you don't have a problem. I don't have a problem because we're still on the economy. Right. But we're going to come back to taxes and we're going to move on to the deficit and so, a lot of other things, too. Okay. But go ahead, sir. You bet. 
Well, President, you're, Mr. President, you're absolutely right, which is that, that uh, with regards to 97 percent of the businesses are not, not taxed at the 35 percent tax rate, they're taxed at a lower rate. But those businesses that are in the last 3 percent of businesses happen to employ half, half of all the people who work in small business. Those are the businesses that employ one quarter of all the workers in America. And your plan is to take their tax rate from 35 percent to 40 percent. Now, and I talked to a guy who has a very small business. He's in the electronics business in, uh, in St. Louis. He has four employees. He said he and his son calculated how much they pay in taxes. Mm -hmm. Federal income tax, federal payroll tax, state income tax, state sales tax, state property tax, gasoline tax. It added up to well over 50 percent of what they earned. And your plan is to take the tax rate on successful small businesses from 35 percent to 40 percent. The National Federation of Independent Businesses has said that will cost 700,000 jobs. I don't want to cost jobs. My priority is jobs. And so what I do is I bring down the tax rates, lower deductions and exemptions. The same idea behind Bowles Simpson, by the way. Get the rates down, lower deductions and exemptions to create more jobs because there's nothing right. better for getting us to a balanced budget than having more people working, earning more money, paying more taxes, that's by far the most effective and efficient way to get this budget balanced. Jim, I, uh, you may want to move on to another topic, but I, I would just say this to the American people. Uh, if you believe that we can cut taxes by $5 trillion and add $2 trillion in additional spending uh, that the military is not asking for, $7 trillion, just to give you a sense, over 10 years, that's more than our entire defense budget. And you think that by closing loopholes and deductions for the well-to-do, somehow you will not end up uh, picking up the tab, then Governor Romney's plan uh, may work for you. But uh, I think math, common sense, and our history uh, shows us that's not a recipe for job growth. Look, we've tried this. We've tried both approaches. Uh, the approach that Governor Romney is talking about is the same sales pitch that was made in 2001 and 2003. And we ended up with the slowest job growth in 50 years. We ended up moving from surplus to deficits, and it all culminated in the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression. Now, Bill Clinton tried the approach that I'm talking about. We created 23 million new jobs. We went from deficit to surplus. and Businesses did very well. So in some ways, we've got some data on which approach is more likely to create jobs and opportunity for Americans. And I believe that the economy works best when middle class families are getting tax breaks so that they've got some money in their pockets. And those of us who have done extraordinarily well because of uh, this magnificent uh, country that we live in, that. Uh, we can afford to do a little bit more to make sure we're not blowing okay. up the deficit. Jim, the, the, pre the president began this segment, so I think I get the last word. So well, I'm going to take. Well, you're going to get the first right. word in the next segment. <laughs> well, but but he gets the first word of that segment. I get the last word of that segment. I hope. Let me just make this comment. <laughs> he first can, of he all, can let me, he can, let, me, work. let me let me repeat. Let me repeat what I said. Right. I'm not in favor of a five trillion dollar tax cut. That's not my plan. Okay. My plan is not to put in place any tax cut that will add to the deficit. That's point one. So you may keep referring to it as a five trillion dollar tax cut but that's not my plan. Okay. Number two, let's look at history. My plan is not like anything that's been tried before. My plan is to bring down rates, but also bring down deductions and exemptions and credits at the same time so the revenue stays in, but that we bring down rates to get more people working. My priority is putting people back to work in America. They're suffering in this country. And we talk about evidence. Look at the evidence of the last four years. It's absolutely extraordinary. We've got 23 million people out of work or stop looking for work in this country. All right. It's just, it's, we've got, we got, when the president took office, 32 million people on food stamps, 47 million on food stamps today. Economic growth this year, slower than last year, and last year slower than the year before. The, the going forward with the status quo is not going to cut it for the American people who are struggling today. All right, let's talk, we're still on the economy. This is theoretically now a second segment still on the economy, and uh, specifically on what to do about the federal deficit, the, the federal debt. And the question, you each have two minutes on this, and Governor Romney, uh, you, you go first because the president went first on segment one. And the question is this, what are the differences between the two of you as to how you would go about 
tackling the deficit problem in this country. Well, good. I'm glad you raised that. And it's a, it's a critical issue. I think it's not just an economic issue. I think it's a moral issue. I think it's frankly not moral for my generation to keep spending massively more than we take in, knowing those burdens are going to be passed on to the next generation. And they're going to be paying the interest and the principal all their lives. And the amount of debt we're adding at a trillion a year is simply not moral. So how do we deal with it? Well, mathematically, there, there are three ways that you can cut a deficit. One, of course, is to, to raise taxes. The, number two is to cut spending. And number three is to grow the economy. Because if more people work in a growing economy, they're paying taxes and you can get the job done that way. The president's would, president would prefer raising taxes. I understand. The problem with raising taxes is that it slows down the rate of growth. And you can never quite get the job done. I want to lower spending and encourage economic growth at the same time. What things would I cut from spending? Well, first of all, I will eliminate all programs by this test if they don't pass it. Is the program so critical it's worth borrowing money from China to pay for it? And if not, I'll get rid of it. Obamacare is on my list. I apologize, Mr. President. I use that term with all respect. By I like the way. It. Good. Okay, good. So, so I'll get rid of that. I'm sorry, Jim. I'm going to stop the subsidy to PBS. I'm going to stop other things. I like PBS. I love Big Bird. I actually like you, too. But I'm not going to keep on spending money on things to borrow money from China to pay for it. So that's number one. Number two, I'll take programs that are currently good programs, but I think could be run more efficiently at the state level and send them to the state. Number three, I'll make government more efficient and to cut back the number of employees, combine some agencies and departments. My cutbacks will be done through attrition, by the way. This is the approach we have to take to get America to a balanced budget. The president said he'd cut the deficit in half. Unfortunately, he doubled it. Trillion dollar deficits for the last four years. The president's put in place as much public debt, almost as much debt held by the public as all prior presidents combined. Mr. President, two minutes. When I walked into the Oval Office, I had uh, more than a trillion dollar deficit greeting me. Uh, and we know where it came from. Two wars that were paid for on a credit card, two tax cuts that were not paid for, and a whole bunch of programs that were not paid for, and then uh, a massive economic crisis. Uh, and despite that, uh, what we've said is, yes, we had to take some initial emergency measures to make sure we didn't slip into a Great Depression. But what we've also said is, let's make sure that we are cutting out those things that are not helping us grow. So 77 government programs, everything from aircrafts that uh, the Air Force uh, had ordered but weren't working very well, 18 government, uh, 18 government programs for education that were well-intentioned but weren't helping kids learn. We went after uh, medical fraud in Medicare and Medicaid uh, very aggressively, more aggressively than ever before, and have saved tens of billions of dollars, $50 billion of waste taken out of the system. And I worked with Democrats and Republicans to cut a trillion dollars out of our uh, discretionary domestic budget. That's the largest cut in the discretionary domestic budget since Dwight Eisenhower. Now, we all know that we've got to do more. And so I put forward a specific $4 trillion deficit reduction plan. It's on a website. You can look at all the numbers, what cuts we make and what revenue we raise. And the way we do it is $2.50 for every cut. We ask for a dollar of additional revenue, paid for, as I indicated earlier, by asking those of us who have done very well in this country to contribute a little bit more to reduce the deficit. Governor Romney earlier mentioned uh, the Bull Simpson Commission. Well, that's how uh, the commission, bipartisan commission that talked about how we should move forward suggested we have to do it in a balanced way with some revenue and some spending cuts. And this is a major difference that Governor Romney and I have. Let, let, let me just finish this point because you're, you're looking for contrast. Uh, you know, when Governor Romney stood on a stage with uh, other uh, Republican candidates uh, for the nomination. And he was asked, would you take $10 of spending cuts for just $1 of revenue? And he said no. Now, if you take such an unbalanced approach, then that means you are going to be gutting our investments in schools and education. It means that Governor Romney talked about Medicaid and how we could send it back to the states, but effectively this means a 30 percent cut in the primary program we help for seniors who are in nursing homes, for kids who are with disabilities, 
Mr. President, and, and that is not a right strategy for us to move forward. Way over the two minutes. Sorry. Uh, Governor, what about Simpson Bowles? Will you support Simpson Bowles? Uh, Simpson Bowles, the president should have grabbed that. No, I mean, do you if, support Simpson Bowles? I have my own plan. It's not the same as Simpson Bowles. But in my view, the president should have grabbed it. If he wanted to make some adjustments to it, take it, go to Congress, fight for it. That's what but, we've done. Made some adjustments to it, and we're putting it forward before Congress right now. A $4 but, trillion but dollar been, plan. But you've been president four balance. years. You've been president four years. Right. You said you cut the deficit in half. It's now four years later. We still have trillion dollar deficits. The CBO says we'll have a trillion dollar deficit each of the next four years. If you're reelected, we'll get to a tri trillion dollar debt. I mean, you have said before you'd cut the deficit in half. And the, this four, I love this idea of four trillion in cuts. You found four trillion dollars of ways to reduce or to get closer to a balanced budget, except we still show trillion dollar deficits every year. Th that doesn't get the job done. Uh, let me come back and say, why is it that, that I don't want to raise taxes? Why don't I want to raise taxes on people? And, 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 and actually, you said it back in 2010. You said, look, I'm going to extend the tax policies that we have. Now, I'm not going to raise taxes on anyone, because when the economy is growing slow like this, when we're in recession, you shouldn't raise taxes on anyone. Well, the economy is still growing slow. As a matter of fact, it's growing much more slowly now than when you made that statement. And, and so if you believe the same thing, you just don't want to raise taxes on people. And, and the reality is, it, it's not just wealthy people. You mentioned Donald Trump. It's not just Donald Trump you're taxing. It's all those businesses that employ one quarter of the workers in America, these small businesses that are taxed as individuals. You raise taxes and you kill jobs. That's why the National Federation of Independent Businesses said your plan will kill 700,000 jobs. I don't want to kill jobs in this environment. Let me make one more point. Okay, let me, and that, let's let and him that, answer the taxes thing for a moment. Okay. okay. Mr. President. Well, we, we've had this discussion before. Uh, no, the about that, the idea that in order to, do, to reduce the deficit, right. there has to be revenue in addition to cuts. There has to be revenue in addition to cuts. Now, Governor Romney has ruled out revenue. Is it, he's that, he's ruled out true, right? revenue. Absolutely. Okay, so, right. I, look, I, the, the revenue I get is by more people working, getting higher pay, paying more taxes. That, that's how we get growth and how we balance the budget. Right. But the idea of taxing people more, putting more people out of work, you'll never get there. You never balance the budget by raising taxes. Spain, Spain pen, spends 42% of their total economy yeah, on okay. government. Okay. We're now spending 42% of our economy on government. I don't want to go down the path to Spain. I want to go down the path of growth that puts Americans to work with more money coming in because they're working. Yeah. But, but, Mr. President, you're saying in order to, to, to get it, the, the job done, it's got to be balanced. You've got if, to have if we're serious, we've got to take a balanced, responsible approach. And by the way, this is not just when it comes to individual taxes. Let's talk about corporate taxes. Now, uh, I've identified areas where we can right away uh, make a change that I believe would actually help the economy. The, the oil industry gets $4 billion a year in corporate welfare. Basically, they get deductions that those small businesses that Governor Romney refers to, they don't get. Now, does anybody think that ExxonMobil needs some extra money when they're making money every time you go to the pump? Why wouldn't we want to eliminate that? Why wouldn't we eliminate uh, tax breaks for corporate jets? My attitude is if you got a corporate jet, you can probably afford to pay full freight, not get a special break for it. When it comes to corporate taxes, Governor Romney has said he wants to, in a revenue-neutral way, uh, close loopholes, deductions. He hasn't identified which ones they are, uh, but that thereby bring down uh, the corporate rate. Well, I want to do the same thing, but I've actually identified how we can do that. And part of the way to do it is to not give tax breaks to companies that are shipping jobs overseas. Right now, you can actually take a deduction for moving a plant overseas. I think most Americans would say that doesn't make sense, and all that raises revenue. And so if we take a balanced approach, what that then allows us to do is also to help young people, the way we already have during my administration, make sure that they can afford to go to college. It means that the teacher that I met in Las Vegas, a wonderful young lady, who describes to me she's got 42 kids in her class. The first two weeks, she's got them, some of them sitting on the floor until finally they get reassigned. They're using textbooks that are 10 years old. That is not a recipe for growth. That's not how America was built. And so budgets reflect choices. Ultimately, we're going to have to make some decisions. 
And if we're asking for no revenue, then that means that we've got to get rid of a whole bunch of stuff, and the magnitude of the tax cuts that you're talking about, Governor, would end up resulting in severe hardship for people, but more importantly, would not help us grow. As I indicated before, when you talk about shifting Medicaid to states, we're talking about potentially a, a 30 a 30 percent cut in Medicaid over time. Now, you know, that may not uh, seem like a big deal when it just is paper, uh, you know, uh, numbers on a sheet of paper. But if we're talking about a family who's got an autistic kid and is depending on that Medicaid, that's a big problem. And governors are creative, there's no doubt about it. But they're not creative enough to make up for 30 percent of revenue on something like Medicaid. What ends up happening is some people end up not getting help. Jim, let's, we, we, we've gone on a lot of topics there, and so I'm gonna ta it's going to take a minute to go from Medicaid right. to schools to, to Medicaid. oil to yeah. tax breaks and companies right. going overseas. Right. So let's go through them one by one. First of all, uh, the Department of Energy has said the tax break for oil companies is $2.8 billion a year. And it's actually an accounting treatment, as you know, that's been in place for 100 years. Now, it's time to end it. And, and in one year, you provided $90 billion in breaks to the green energy world. Now, I like green energy as well, but that's about 50 years worth of what oil and gas receives. And you say Exxon and Mobil. Actually, this $2.8 billion goes largely to small companies, to drilling operators and so forth. But, you know, if we get that tax rate from 35 percent down to 25 percent, why that $2.8 billion is on the table? Of course it's on the table. That's probably not going to survive if you get that rate down to 25 percent. But, but don't forget, you put $90 billion dollars like 50 years worth of breaks into, into solar and wind, to, to, to Solyndra and Fisker and Tesla and Enter One. I mean, I, I had a friend who said, you don't just pick the winners and losers, you pick the losers, all right? So, so th this, is not, this is not the kind of policy you want to have. You want to get America energy secure. The second topic, which is you said you get a deduction for taking a plant overseas. Look, I've been in business for 25 years. I have no idea what you're talking about. I maybe need to get a new accountant, uh, but, but the, the idea that you get a break for shipping jobs overseas is simply not the case. What Let's we do have right now is a setting me. where I'd like to bring money from overseas back to this country. And finally, Medicaid to states, I'm not quite sure where that came in except this, which is I would like to take the Medicaid dollars that go to states and say to a state, you're going to get what you got last year plus inflation, plus 1%. And then you're going to manage your care for your poor in the way you think best. And I remember as a governor, when this idea was floated by Tommy Thompson, uh, the governors, Republican and Democrats, said, please let us do that. We can care for our own poor in so much better and more effective a way than having the federal government tell us how to care for our poor. So, so let's state, one of the magnificent things about this country is the whole idea that states are the laboratories of democracy. Don't have the federal government tell everybody what kind of training programs they have to have and, and what kind of Medicaid they have to have. Let states do this. And by the way, if a state get, gets in trouble, well, we can step in and see if we can find a way to help them. But, let's but, go. But, but the, right, the right approach right. is one which relies on the brilliance Two of seconds. our people and states, not the federal government. Two seconds, and we're going on still on the economy on another, yeah. but another part of it. Okay. All right. All right. This is segment three, the economy. Entitlements. First, uh, first answer uh, goes to you, uh, two minutes, uh, uh, Mr. President. Uh, do you see a major difference between the two of you on Social Security? Uh, you know, I suspect that on Social Security, uh, we've got a somewhat similar position. Social Security is uh, structurally sound. It's going to have to be tweaked the way it was by Ronald Reagan and Speaker, Democratic Speaker Tip O'Neill. Uh, but uh, it is, the basic structure is sound, but, but I want to talk about the values behind Social Security and Medicare, uh, and then talk about Medicare because that's uh, sure. the big driver uh, of our deficits right now. You know, my grandmother, uh, some of you know, helped to raise me. Uh, my grandparents did. My grandfather died a, a while back. Uh, my grandmother died three days before I was elected president, and she was fiercely independent. She worked her way up only had a high school education, started as a secretary, ended up uh, being the vice president of a local bank. And she ended up uh, living alone by choice. And the reason she could be independent was because of Social Security and Medicare. Uh, she had worked all her life, put in this money, and understood that there was a basic guarantee, a floor under which she could not go. And that's the perspective I bring when I think about what's called entitlements. 
Uh, you know, the, the name itself uh, implies some sense of dependency on the part of these folks. These are folks who've worked hard, like my grandmother, and there are millions of people out there who are counting on this. So my approach is to say, how do we strengthen the system over the long term? Uh, and in Medicare, uh, what we did was we said, uh, we are going to have to bring down the costs if we're going to deal with our long-term deficits. But to do that, uh, let's look where some of the money is going. $716 billion we were able to save from the Medicare program by no longer overpaying insurance companies, by making sure that we weren't overpaying providers. And using that money, we were actually able to lower prescription drug costs for seniors by an average of $600. And we were also able to make a, uh, make a significant dent in providing them the kind of preventive care that will ultimately save money through the, throughout the system. So the, the way for us to deal with Medicare in particular is to lower health care costs. Uh, when it comes to Social Security, uh, as I said, uh, you don't need a major structural change in order to make sure that Social Security is there for the future. We'll follow up on this. First, uh, Governor Romney, you have two minutes on, on uh, Social Security and entitlements. Well, Jim, uh, our seniors depend on these programs, and I know any time we talk about entitlements, people become concerned that something's going to happen that's going to change their life for the worst. And the answer is neither the President nor I are proposing any changes for any current retirees or near retirees, either to Social Security or Medicare. So if you're 60 or around 60 or older, you don't need to listen any further. But for younger people, we need to talk about what changes are going to be occurring. Oh, I just thought about one. And that is, in fact, I was wrong when I said the President isn't proposing any changes for current retirees. In fact, he is on Medicare. On Social Security, he's not. But on Medicare, for current retirees, he's cutting $716 billion from the program. Now, he says by not overpaying hospitals and providers. Actually, just going to them and saying, we're going to reduce the rates you get paid across the board. Everybody's going to get a lower rate. That's not just going after places where there's abuse. That's saying we're cutting the rates. Some 15% of hospitals and nursing homes say they won't take any more Medicare patients under that scenario. We also have 50% of doctors who say they won't take more Medicare patients. This, we have 4 million people on Medicare Advantage that will lose Medicare Advantage because of those $716 billion in cuts. I can't understand how you can cut Medicare $716 billion for current recipients of Medicare. Now you point out, well, we're putting some back. We're going to give them a better prescription program. That's one of that's one dollar for every 15 you've cut. They're, they're smart enough to know that's not a good trade. I want to take that 716 billion dollars you've cut and put it back into Medicare. By the way, we can include a prescription program if we need to improve it. But the idea of cutting 716 billion dollars from Medicare to be able to balance the additional cost of Obamacare is, in my opinion, a mistake. And with regards to young people coming along, I've got proposals to make sure Medicare and Social Security are there for them without any question. Mr. President. First of all, uh, I think it's important for Governor Romney to present this plan that he says uh, will only affect folks in the future. Uh, and the essence of the plan is that he would turn Medicare into a voucher program. Uh, it's called premium support, but it's understood to be a voucher program. Uh, his and running you, mate. And you don't support that? I don't. And, and let me explain why. Uh, again, again, that's for future I understand. people, right? Not for current retirees. For, for, so if, you're, if you, you're 54 or 55, you might want to listen, because uh, this, uh, this will affect you. Uh, the idea, which was originally presented by Congressman Ryan, your running mate, uh, is that we would give a voucher to seniors, and they could go out in the private marketplace and buy their own health insurance. The problem is that because the voucher wouldn't necessarily keep up with health care inflation, it was estimated that this would cost the average senior about $6,000 a year. Now, in fairness, uh, what Governor Romney has now said is he'll maintain traditional Medicare alongside it. But there's still a problem, because what happens is those insurance companies are pretty clever at figuring out who are the younger uh, and healthier seniors. They recruit them, leaving the older, sicker seniors in Medicare. And every healthcare economist who looks at it says, over time, what will happen is the traditional Medicare system will collapse. And then what you've got is folks like my grandmother at the mercy of the private insurance system, precisely at the time when they are most in need of decent healthcare. So 
I don't think vouchers are the right way to go. And this is not my, uh, on, uh, only my opinion. AARP thinks that the, the savings that we obtained from Medicare bolstered the system, lengthened the Medicare trust fund by eight years. Benefits were not affected at all. And ironically, if you repeal Obamacare, and I have become fond of this term, Obamacare, <laughs> Uh, if you repeal it, what happens is those seniors right away are going to be paying $600 more in prescription care. They're now going to have to be paying copays for basic checkups that can keep, keep them healthier. And the primary beneficiary of that repeal are insurance companies that are estimated to gain billions of dollars back when they aren't making seniors any healthier. And, and I don't think that's the right approach when it comes to uh, making sure that Medicare is stronger over the long term. We'll talk about uh, specifically about health care in a moment, but what it, do you support the voucher system, Governor? Uh, what I support is no change for current retirees and near retirees to Medicare, and the President supports taking $716 billion out of that program. What about the voucher? So that's, so that's number one. Okay. All right. Number two is for people coming along that are young. What I do to make sure that we can keep Medicare in place for them is to allow them to either to choose the current Medicare program or a private plan, their choice. They get to choose, and they'll have at least two plans that will be entirely at no cost to them. So they don't have to pay additional money, no additional $6,000. That's not going to happen. They'll have at least two plans. And by the way, if the government can be as efficient as the private sector, and offer premiums that are as low as the private sector, people will be happy to get traditional Medicare, or they'll be able to get a private plan. I know my own view is, I'd rather have a private plan. I, I'd just as soon not have the government telling me what kind of health care I get. I'd rather be able to have an insurance company. If I don't like them, I can get rid of them and find a different insurance company. But people will make their own choice. The other thing we have to do to save Medicare, we have to have the benefits high for those that are low income, but for higher income people, we're going to have to lower some of the benefits. We have to make sure this program is there for the long term. That's the plan that I put forward. And by the way, the idea came not even from Paul Ryan or, or Senator Wyden, who's a co-author of the bill with, with Paul Ryan in the Senate, but also it came from uh, Bill, Clinton's, Bill, Bill Clinton's chief of staff. This is an idea that's been around a long time, which is saying, hey, let's see if we can't get competition into the Medicare world so that people can get the choice of different plans at lower cost, better quality, I believe, okay. in competition. Jim, if I, if I can just respond very quickly. First of all, every study has shown that Medicare has lower administrative costs than private insurance does, which is why seniors are generally pretty happy with it. And private insurers have to make a profit. Nothing wrong with that. That's what they do. And so you've got higher administrative costs plus profit on top of that. And if you are going to save any money through what Governor Romney is proposing, uh, what has to happen is, is that the money has to come from somewhere. And when you move to a voucher system, you are putting seniors at the mercy of those insurance companies. And over time, if traditional Medicare has decayed or fallen apart, then they're stuck. And this is the reason why AARP has said that your plan would weaken uh, Medicare substantially. And that's why they were supportive of the approach that we took. Uh, one last point I want to make. We do have to lower the cost of health care, not just in uh, Medicare and talk Medicaid. Talk about that in a minute. But, but, but overall. Yo, okay. And so... That's, that's a big topic. Can we, oh, can we stay on Medicare? That, we that, that yeah, we're gonna bring, yeah, I want to get to it. But all I want to do is let's, very let's, quickly let's get back before to we leave the economy. Let's get back to Medicare. No, the no, the, no, the no, president no, said no, that no, the government can provide the service at lower cost and without a profit. All right. If that's the case, then it will always be the best product right. that people can purchase. But my, wait, experience, wait minute, Governor, my wait. experience is the private sector typically is able to provide a better product at a lower right. cost. Can we, can the two of you agree that the voters have a choice, a clear choice between Absolutely. the two of you on Medicare? Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So to finish quickly, briefly on the economy, what is your view about the level of federal regulation of the economy right now? Is there too much? And in your case, Mr. President, is there, should there be more? Beginning with you, uh, this is not a new two-minute segment. Just start, and we'll go for a few minutes, and then we're going to go to health care, okay? Regulation is essential. You can't have a free market work if you don't have regulation. As a business person, I had to have regula I needed to know the regulations. I needed them there. 
You, you couldn't have people opening up banks in their, in their garage and making loans. I mean, you have to have regulations so that you can have an economy work. Every free economy has good regulation. At the same time, regulation can become excessive. Is it excessive now, well, do you in, think? In some places, yes. Like other places, no. Me, it can me. become out of date. And what's happened in, with some of the legislation that's been passed uh, uh, during the president's term, you've seen regulation become excessive, and it's hurt the, it's hurt the economy. Let me give you an example. Uh, Dodd-Frank was passed, okay. and it includes within it a, a number of provisions that I think have some unintended consequences that are harmful to the economy. One is it designates a number of banks as too big to fail, and they're effectively guaranteed by the federal government. This is the biggest kiss that's been given to, to New York banks I've ever seen. This is an enormous boon for them. There have been 122 community and small banks have closed since Dodd-Frank. So there's one example. Here's another. In Dodd-Frank, it says... You want to repeal Dodd-Frank? Well, I would repeal it and replace it. You, you, we're not going to get rid of all regulation. You have to have regulation. Okay. Right. And there's some parts of Dodd-Frank that, that make all the sense in the world. You need transparency. You need to have uh, le leverage right. limits for institutions. Well, there's a specific. But let's, let's, but let's, mention, let's, 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 let's me. mention the other one. Let's talk the other big well, one. The no, big no, one. Let's, no, no, let's not. <laughs> okay. let's, let him respond, uh, let's let him respond to this specific on Dodd-Frank and what the governor just said. Well, I think this is a great example. Uh, the reason we have been in such an enormous economic crisis uh, it was prompted by reckless behavior across the board. Now, it, it wasn't just on Wall Street. You had uh, loan officers were, that were given loans uh, and mortgages that uh, really shouldn't have been given because the folks didn't qualify. You had people who were borrowing money to buy a house that they couldn't afford. Uh, you had credit agencies that were stamping these as A1 great investments when they weren't. But you also had banks making money hand over fist, churning out products that the bankers themselves didn't even understand uh, in order to make big profits, but knowing that it made the entire system vulnerable. So what did we do? We stepped in and had the toughest reforms on Wall Street since the 1930s. We said, you've got banks, you've got to raise your capital requirements. You can't engage in some of this risky behavior that is putting Main Street at risk. We're going to make sure that you've got to have a, a living will so, so we can know how you're going to wind things down if you make a bad bet so we don't have other taxpayer bailouts. In the meantime, by the way, we also made sure that all the uh, help that we provided those banks was paid back every single dime with interest. Now, Governor Romney has said he wants to repeal. Dodd-Frank. And, you know, uh, I appreciate, and it appears we've got some agreement that a marketplace to work has to have some regulation. But in the past, Governor Romney has said he just wants to repeal Dodd-Frank. Roll it back. And so the question is, uh, does anybody out there think that the big problem we had is that there was too much oversight and regulation of Wall Street? Because if you do, then Governor Romney uh, is your candidate. But that's not Sorry, what Jim, I believe. That's, that's, just not, that's just not the facts. Look, we have to have regulation in Wall Street. Yeah. That, that's why I'd have regulation. But I wouldn't designate five banks as too big to fail and give them a blank check. That's one of the unintended consequences of Dodd-Frank. It wasn't thought through properly. We need to get rid of that provision because it's killing regional and small banks. They're getting hurt. Let me mention another regulation in Dodd-Frank. You say we were giving mortgages to people who weren't qualified. That's exactly right. It's one of the reasons for the great financial calamity we had. And so Dodd-Frank correctly says we need to right. have qualified mortgages. And if you give a mortgage that's not qualified, there are big penalties. Except they didn't ever go on and define what a qualified mortgage was. Right. It's been two years. We don't know what a qualified mortgage is yet. So banks are reluctant to make loans, mortgages. Try and get a mortgage these days. It's hurt the housing market because right. Dodd-Frank didn't anticipate putting in place the kinds of regulations you have to have. It's not right. that Dodd-Frank always was wrong with too much regulation. Sometimes they didn't come out with the clear regulation. Okay. I will make sure we don't hurt the functioning of our, of our marketplace and our businesses because I want to bring back housing and get good jobs. All right. I think we have another clear uh, difference between the two of you. Now let's move to health care where I know there is a clear difference. <laughs> And that has to do with the Affordable Care Act, Ob Obamacare. And it's a two-minute new, new uh, segment. Uh, and it's, that means two minutes each. And you go first, uh, Governor Romney. You want it repealed. 
you want the Affordable Care Act repealed. Why? I sure do. Um, well, in part, it comes from, again from my experience. Um, I was in New Hampshire. A woman came to me and she said, look, I can't afford insurance for myself or my son. I met a couple in Appleton, Wisconsin, and they said, we're thinking of dropping our insurance. We can't afford it. And the number of small businesses I've gone to that are saying they're dropping insurance because they can't afford it, the cost of health care is just prohibitive. And, and we've got to deal with cost. And unfortunately, when, when you look at Obamacare, the Congressional Budget Office has said it will cost $2,500 a year more than traditional insurance. So it's adding to cost. And as a matter of fact, when the President ran for office, he said that by this year he would have brought down the cost of insurance for each family by $2,500 a family. Instead, it's gone up by that amount. So it's expensive. Expensive things hurt families. So that's one reason I don't want it. Second reason, it cuts $716 billion from Medicare to pay for it. I want to put that money back in Medicare for our seniors. Number three, it puts in place an unelected board that's going to tell people ultimately what kind of treatments they can have. I don't like that idea. Fourth, there was a survey done of small businesses across the country. It said, what's been the effect of Obamacare on your hiring plans? And three quarters of them said it makes us less likely to hire people. I just don't know how the president could have come into office facing 23 million people out of work, rising unemployment, an economic crisis at the, at the kitchen table, and spent his energy and passion for two years fighting for Obamacare instead of fighting for jobs for the American people. It has killed jobs. And the best course for health care is to do what we did in my state, craft a plan at the state level that fits the needs of the state. And then let's focus on getting the cost down for people rather than raising it with the $2,500 additional premium. Mr. President, the argument against repeal. Well, four years ago when I was running for office, I was traveling around and having those same conversations that Governor Romney talks about. And it wasn't just that small businesses were seeing costs skyrocket and they couldn't get affordable coverage even if they wanted to provide it to their employees. It wasn't just that this was the biggest driver of our federal deficit, our overall health care costs, but it was families who were worried about going bankrupt if they got sick. Millions of families all across the country. If they had a pre-existing condition, uh, they might not be able to get coverage at all. If they did have coverage, insurance companies might impose an arbitrary limit. Uh, and so as a consequence, they're paying their premiums, somebody gets really sick, lo and behold, they don't have enough money uh, to pay the bills because the insurance companies uh, say that uh, they've hit the limit. So we did work on this alongside working on jobs because this is part of making sure that middle-class families are secure in this country. And uh, let me tell you exactly what Obamacare did. Number one, if you've got health insurance, it doesn't uh, mean a government takeover. Uh, you keep your own insurance. You keep your own doctor. But it does say insurance companies can't jerk you around. They can't impose uh, arbitrary lifetime limits. They have to let you keep your kid uh, on their insurance, your insurance plan until you're 26 years old. And uh, it also says that there, you're going to have to get rebates if insurance companies are spending more on administrative costs and profits than they are on actual care. Number two, if you don't have health insurance, we're essentially setting up a group plan that allows you to benefit from group rates that are typically 18 percent lower than if you're out there trying to get insurance on the individual market. Now, uh, the last point I'd make uh, before, Two minutes. Uh, before, Two minutes is up, sir. No, I, I, I think I've, I had five seconds before you interrupted me. Was <laughs> it, it, the, the irony is that uh, we've seen this model work really well in Massachusetts because uh, Governor Romney did a good thing working with Democrats in the state to set up what is essentially the identical model and as a consequence, people are covered there. It hasn't destroyed jobs. And as a consequence, we now have a system in which we have the opportunity to start bringing down costs as opposed to just Your leaving five. millions of people out in the cold. Your five seconds went away a long time ago. <laughs> that I All right, Governor, <laughs> Governor tell, tell, the, tell the president directly why you think what he just said is wrong about Obama. Well, I did with my first statement, but I'll go on. Please elaborate. I'll, I'll elaborate, <laughs> exactly right. Um, 
First of all, I like the way we did it in Massachusetts. I, I like the fact that in my state, we had Republicans and Democrats come together and work together. What you did instead was to push through a plan without a single Republican vote. As a matter of fact, when Massachusetts did something quite extraordinary, elected a Republican senator to stop Obamacare, you pushed it through anyway. So entirely on a partisan basis, instead of bringing America together and having a discussion on this important topic, you pushed through something that you and Nancy Pelosi and Harry Reid thought was the best answer and drove it through. What we did in a legislature, 87 percent Democrat, we were together. 200 legislators in my legislature, only two voted against the plan by the time we were finished. What were some differences? We didn't raise taxes. You've raised them by a trillion dollars under Obamacare. We didn't cut Medicare. Of course, we don't have Medicare, but we didn't cut Medicare by $716 billion. We didn't put in place a board that can tell people ultimately what treatments they're going to receive. We, did, we didn't also uh, uh, do something that I think a number of people across this country recognize, which is put, it, put people in a position where they're going to lose the insurance they had and they wanted. Mm -hmm. Right now, the CBO says up to 20 million people will lose their insurance as Obamacare goes into effect next year. And likewise, a study by McKinsey and Company of American businesses said 30 percent of them are anticipating dropping people from coverage. So for those reasons, for the tax, for Medicare, for this board, and for people losing their insurance, this is why the American people don't want Medicare, don't want Obamacare. It's why Republicans said, do not do this. And the Republicans had a, had a plan. They put a plan out. They put out a plan, a bipartisan plan. It was swept aside. I think something this big, this important, has to be done on a bipartisan basis. And we have to have a president who can reach across the aisle and fashion important legislation with the input from both parties. Uh, Governor Romney said uh, this has to be done on a bipartisan basis. This was a bipartisan idea. In fact, it was a Republican idea. And Governor Romney, at the beginning of this debate, wrote and said what we did in Massachusetts could be a model for the nation. And I agree that uh, the Democratic legislators in Massachusetts uh, might have given some advice to uh, Republicans in Congress about how to cooperate. Uh, but the fact of the matter is we use the same advisors and they say it's the same plan. It, when Governor Romney talks about this board, for example, the unelected board that we've created, what this is is a group of health care experts, doctors, et cetera, to figure out how can we reduce the cost of care in the system overall. Because there are two ways of dealing with our health care crisis. Uh, one is to simply leave a whole bunch of people uninsured and let them fend for themselves, to let businesses figure out uh, how long they can continue to pay premiums until finally they just give up and their workers are no longer getting insured. And that's been the trend line. Or alternatively, we can figure out how do we make the cost of care more effective. And there are ways of doing it. So at Cleveland Clinic, one of the best healthcare systems in the world, they actually provide great care cheaper than average. And the reason they do is because they do some smart things. They, they say, uh, if a patient's coming in, let's get all the doctors together at once, do one test instead of having the patient run around with 10 tests. Let's make sure that we're providing preventive care so we're catching uh, the onset of something like di diabetes. Let's, uh, let's pay uh, providers on the basis of performance as opposed to on the basis of uh, how many uh, uh, procedures they've, they've engaged in. Now, so what this board does is basically identifies best practices and says, let's use the purchasing power of Medicare and Medicaid to help to institutionalize all these good things that we do. And the fact of the matter is that when Obamacare is fully implemented, we're going to be in a position uh, to show that costs are going down. And over the last two years, health care premiums have gone up. It's true, but they've gone up slower than any time in the last 50 years. So we're already beginning to see progress. In the meantime, uh, folks out there with insurance, you're already getting a rebate. Uh, let me make one last point. Governor Romney says uh, we should replace it. I'm just going to repeal it, but, uh, but we can replace it with something. But the problem is he hasn't described what exactly we'd replace it with, other than saying we're going to leave it to the states. But the fact of the matter is that, that uh, some of the prescriptions that he's offered, like letting you buy insurance across state lines, there's no indication that that somehow is going to help somebody who's got a pre-existing condition 
be able to finally buy insurance. In fact, it's estimated that by repealing Obamacare, you're looking at 50 million people losing health insurance let's, uh, at a time when it's vitally important. Let's let the governor explain what you would do well, if Obamacare is let, repealed. Let, How would you replace it? What, well, actually, what actually it's, it's, it's a, a lengthy descript description, but number one, pre-existing conditions are covered under my plan. Number two, young people are able to stay on their family plan. Uh, that's already offered in the private marketplace. You don't have to have the government uh, mandate that for that to occur. But let's come back to something the president and I agree on, which is the, the key task we have in health care is to get the cost down so it's more affordable for families. And, uh, and then he has as a model for doing that a, a board of people at the government, an unelected board, appointed board, who are going to decide what kind of treatment you ought to have. No, in my opinion, the government is not effective in, uh, uh, in bringing down the cost of almost anything. As a matter of fact, free people and free enterprises trying to find ways to do things better are able to be more effective in bringing down the cost than the government will ever be. Your example of the Cleveland Clinic is my case in point, along with several others I could describe. This is the private market. These are small, these are inter enterprises competing with each other, learning how to do better and better jobs. I used to consult to businesses, excuse me, to hospitals and to healthcare providers. I was astonished at the creativity and innovation that exists in the American people. In order to bring the cost of health care down, we don't need to have a, a board of 15 people telling us what kinds of treatments we should have. We instead need to put insurance plans, providers, hospitals, doctors on target such that they have an incentive, as you say, performance pay for doing an excellent job for keeping costs down. And that's happening. Intermountain Healthcare does it superbly well. Mayo Clinic is doing it superbly well. Cleveland Clinic, others. But the right answer is not to have the federal government take over health care and start mandating to the providers across America, telling a, a patient and a doctor what kind of treatment they can have. That's the wrong way to go. The private market and individual responsibility always work best. Uh, let me just point out, first of all, this board that we're talking about can't uh, make decisions about what treatments are given. Uh, that's explicitly prohibited in the law. But uh, let's go back to what Governor Romney indicated, that uh, under his plan, uh, he would be able to cover people with pre-existing conditions. Uh, well, actually, Governor, that isn't what your plan does. What your plan does is to duplicate what's already the law, which says you know, if you uh, are out of health insurance for three months, then you can end up uh, getting continuous coverage. And an insurance camp company can't deny you if, you've, uh, if it's uh, been under 90 days. But that's already the law. And that doesn't help the millions of people out there Don't with pre-existing conditions. There's a reason why Governor Romney set up the plan that he did in Massachusetts. It wasn't a government takeover of health care. It was the largest expansion of private insurance. But what it does say is that insurers, you've got to take everybody. Now, that also means that you've got more customers. But when, when Governor Romney says that he'll replace it with something, but can't detail how it will be, in fact, replaced. And the reason he set up the system he did in Massachusetts was because there isn't a better way of dealing with the pre-existing conditions problem. It, it just reminds me of, you know, he says that he's going to close deductions and loopholes for his tax plan. That's how it's going to be paid for, but we don't know the details. He says that he's going to uh, replace Dodd-Frank, Wall Street reform, but we don't know exactly which ones. He won't tell us. He now says he's going to replace Obamacare and assure that all the good things that are in it are going to be in there and you don't have to worry. And at some point, I think the American people have to ask themselves, is, is the reason that Governor Romney uh, is keeping uh, all these plans to replace secret because they're too good? Is it, is it because that somehow uh, middle class families are going to benefit too much from them? No, the, the, the reason is because uh, when we reform Wall Street, when we uh, tackle the problem of pre-existing conditions, right. then you know, these are tough problems, and we've got to make choices. Right. And the choices we've made have been ones that ultimately are benefiting middle-class families right. all across we're, the country. We're going to move to a... a no, I, I have to respond to that, well, which, is, which is my experience as a governor is if I come in and, uh, and lay down a piece of legislation and say it's my way or the highway, 
I don't get a lot done. What I do is the same way that Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan worked together some years ago. When Ronald Reagan ran for office, he laid out the principles that he was going to foster. He said he was going to lower tax rates. He said he was going to broaden the base. You've said the same thing. You're going to simplify the tax code, broaden the base. Those are my principles. I want to bring down the tax burden on middle-income families. And I'm going to work together with Congress to say, okay, how, what are the various ways we could bring down deductions, for instance? One way, for instance, would be to have a single number. I, make up a number, $25,000, $50,000. Anybody can have deductions up to that amount. And then that number disappears for high-income people. That's one way one could do it. One could follow Bull Simpson as a model and take deduction by deduction and make differences that way. There are alternatives to accomplish the objective I have, which is to bring down rates, broaden the base, simplify the code, and create incentives for growth. And with regards to health care, you had remarkable details with regards to my pre-existing condition plan. You obviously have studied up on, on my plan. In fact, I do have a plan that deals with people with pre-existing conditions. That's part of my health care plan. And what we did in Massachusetts is a model for the nation state by state. And I said that at that time. The federal government taking over health care for the entire nation and whisking aside the Tenth Amendment, which gives states right. the rights for these kinds of things, is not the course for America to have a stronger, more vibrant economy. That is a terrific segue to our next segment, and is the role of government. And, uh, and let's see, role of government, and it is, you, you are first on this, uh, Mr. President, and the question is this, do you believe, both of you, but you had the first two minutes on this, Mr. President, do you believe there's a fundamental difference between the two of you as to how you view the mission of the federal government? Uh, well, I, I definitely think there are differences. June, yeah. um, the, the first role of the federal government is to keep the American people safe. Uh, that's its most basic function. And uh, as Commander-in-Chief, uh, that is something that uh, I have uh, worked on and thought about every single day that I've been in the Oval Office. But I also believe that government has the capacity, the federal government has the capacity, to help open up opportunity and create ladders of opportunity and to create frameworks where the American people can succeed. Look, the genius of America is the free enterprise system and uh, freedom and the fact that people uh, can go out there and start a business, uh, uh, work on an idea, uh, make their own decisions. But uh, as Abraham Lincoln understood, there are also some things we do better together. So in the middle of the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln uh, said, Let's help to finance the Transcontinental Railroad. Let's start the National Academy of Sciences. Let's uh, start land-grant colleges, because we want to give these gateways of opportunity for all Americans, because if all Americans are getting opportunity, we're all going to be better off. That doesn't restrict people's freedom. That enhances it. And so what I've tried to do uh, as president is to apply those same principles. And when it comes to education, what I've said is we've got to reform schools that are not working. We used something called race to the top. It wasn't a top-down approach, Governor. What we've said is uh, to states, uh, we'll give you more money if you initiate reforms. And as a consequence, you had 46 states around the country who have made a real difference. But what I've also said is let's hire another 100,000 math and science teachers to make sure we maintain our technological lead and our people are skilled and able to succeed. And hard-pressed states right now can't all do that. In fact, we've seen layoffs of hundreds of thousands of teachers over the last uh, several years. And Governor Romney doesn't think we need more teachers. I do, because I think that that is the kind of investment where the federal government can help. It can't do it all, but it can make a difference. Uh, and as a consequence, we'll have a better trained uh, workforce. And that will create jobs because companies want to locate in places where we've got a skilled workforce. Two minutes, Governor, on the role of government. Your view. Well, for, first, I love great schools. Massachusetts, our schools are ranked number one of all 50 states. And the key to great schools, great teachers. So I reject the idea that I don't believe in great teachers or more teachers. Every school district, every state should make that decision on their own. The role of government. Look behind us the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. The role of government is to promote and protect the principles of those documents. First, life and liberty. 
we have a responsibility to protect the lives and liberties of our people. And that means a military second to none. I do not believe in cutting our military. I believe in maintaining the strength of America's military. Second, in that line that says we are endowed by our creator with our rights, I believe we must maintain our commitment to religious tolerance and freedom in this country. That statement also says that we are endowed by our creator with the right to pursue happiness as we choose. I interpret that as, one, making sure that those people who are less fortunate and can't care for themselves are cared by, by one another. We're a nation that believes that we're all children of the same God, and we care for those that have difficulties, those that are el elderly and have problems and challenges, those that are disabled, we care for them. And we, we look for discovery and innovation, all these things desired, desired uh, out of the American heart to provide the pursuit of happiness for our citizens. But we also believe in maintaining for individuals the right to pursue their dreams and not to have the government substitute itself for the rights of free individuals. And what we're seeing right now is, in my view, a, a trickle-down government approach which has government thinking it can do a better job than free people pursuing their dreams. And it's not working. And the proof of that is 23 million people out of work. The proof of that is one out of six people in poverty. The proof of that is we've gone from 32 million on food stamps to 47 million on food stamps. The proof of that is that 50% of college graduates this year can't find work. We know that the path we're taking is not working. It's time for a new path. All right, let's go through some specifics in terms of what, how each of you views the role of government. How do you, education. Does the federal government have a responsibility to improve the quality of public education in America? Well, the primary responsibility for education is, is, of course, at the state and local level. But the federal government also can play a very important role. And I, and I agree with Secretary Arne Duncan. He's, it's some ideas he's put forward on race to the top. Not all of them, but some of them I agree with and, and congratulate him for pursuing that. The federal government can get local and, and state schools to do a better job. My, my own view, by the way, is I've added to that. I, I happen to believe I want the kids that are getting federal dollars from IDEA or, or Title I, these are disabled kids or, or uh, poor kids or, or lower income kids, rather, I want them to be able to go to the school of their choice. So all federal funds, instead of going to the, to the state or to the school district, I'd have go, if you will, follow the child and let the parent and the child decide where to send their, 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 their student. How do you see the federal government's responsibility to, as I say, to improve the quality of public education in this country? Well, as I've indicated, I think that uh, it has a significant role to play. Uh, through our Race to the Top program, we've worked with Republican and Democratic governors to initiate major reforms, and they're having an impact right now. Do you think you have a difference with your views and, uh, and uh, those of Governor Romney on about education? And you know, this government? is where uh, budgets matter because budgets reflect choices. So when Governor Romney indicates that uh, he wants to uh, cut taxes and potentially benefit folks like me and him. And to pay for it, we're having to initiate uh, significant cuts in federal support for education. That makes a difference. You know, his, his running mate, uh, Congressman Ryan, put forward a budget uh, that reflects uh, many of the principles that Governor Romney's talked about. And uh, it wasn't very detailed. Uh, this seems to be a trend, but, but what it did do is to, if you extrapolated how much money we're talking about, you'd look at cutting the education budget by up to 20 percent. When it comes to uh, community colleges, we are seeing great work done out there all over the country because uh, we have the opportunity to train people for jobs that exist right now. And one of the things I suspect Governor Romney and I probably agree on is getting businesses to work with community colleges so that they're setting up their training programs. Do you agree, uh, Governor? Let, let, oh, let sure. me just finish oh, the yeah. point. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, by what, I going, suspect it'll be going, a small going very well in my state, by, by the way. Yeah. The, uh, uh, where, where they're partnering so that uh, they're designing uh, training programs and people who are going through them know that there's a job waiting for them if they complete okay. it. That I'm, makes a big difference, but that requires some federal support. Let me you, uh, just say uh, one final example. When it comes to making uh, college affordable, whether it's two-year or four-year, one of the things that I did as president was we were sending $60 billion to banks and lenders as middlemen for the student loan program, even though the loans were guaranteed. So there was no risk for the banks or the lenders, but they were taking billions out of the system. And we said, why not cut out the middleman? And as a consequence, what we've been able to do is to provide millions more students assistance, lower 
uh, or make, keep low interest rates on student loans. And this is an example of where our priorities make a difference. Governor Romney, uh, I genuinely believe, cares about education. But when he tells a student that you, know, you should borrow money uh, from your parents to go to college, you know, that indicates the degree to which uh, you know, th there may not be as much of a focus on the fact that folks like right. myself, folks like Michelle, okay. kids uh, who probably who attend University of Denver just don't have that option. And for us to be able to uh, make sure that they've got that opportunity and they can walk through that door, that is vitally important, not just to those kids. It's how we're going to grow this economy over the long term. We're running out of time, Jim, gentlemen. Jim, so I think you have a chance. Yeah, yes, chance. respond to that. Mr. Yes, sir, Mr. Mr. President, you're entitled as a president of your own airplane and to your own house, but not to your own facts. Okay. All right, I'm, I'm not going to cut education funding. I don't have any plan to cut education funding and, and grants that go to people going to college. I'm planning on continuing to grow, so I'm not planning on making changes there. But you make a very good point, which is that the, the place you put your money just makes a pretty clear indication of where your heart is. You put $90 billion into, into green jobs. And, and I, look, I'm all in favor of green energy. $90 billion. That, that, would have, uh, that would have hired two million teachers, $90 billion. And, and these businesses, many of them have gone out of business. I think about half of them, uh, of the ones have been invested in, have gone out of business. A number of them happen to be owned by, by, by people who are contributors to your campaigns. Look, the right course for, for America's government, we're talking about the role of government, is not to become the economic player, picking winners and losers, telling people what kind of health uh, treatment they can receive, taking over the health care system that, that has existed in this country for, uh, for a long, long time and has produced the best health records in the world. The right answer for government is to say, how do we make the private sector become more efficient and more effective? How do we get schools to be more competitive? Let's grade them. I propose we grade our schools so parents know which schools are succeeding and failing so they can take their child to a, to a school that's being more successful. I don't, I don't want to cut our commitment to education. I wanted to make it more effective and efficient. And by the way, I've had that experience. I don't just talk about it. I've been there. Massachusetts schools are ranked number one in the nation. This is not because I didn't have commitment to education. It's because I care about education for all of our kids. All right, gentlemen, look, excuse me one sec. Excuse me, sir. We've got, we've got barely have three minutes left. Uh, I'm not going to grade the two of you and say you, your answers have been too long or, or I've done, done a poor job. You've done or, a great job. Oh, well, no. But the fact is, government, the, the role of government and governing, we've, we've lost a, a pot, in other words. So we only have three, three minutes left uh, in, the, in the debate before we go to your closing statements. And uh, so I want to ask, uh, uh, finally here, and remember, we've got three minutes total time here. Uh, and the question is this. Many of the legislative functions of the federal government right now are in a state of paralysis as a result of partisan gridlock. If elected in your case, if re-elected in your case, what would you do about that? Governor? Jim, I had the great experience, it didn't seem like it at the time, of being elected in a state where my legislature was 87% Democrat. And that meant I figured out from day one I had to get along and I had to work across the aisle to get anything done. We drove our schools to be number one in the nation. We cut taxes 19 times. What would you do as we, president? As president, I will sit down on day one, actually the day after I get elected, I'll sit down with leaders, the Democratic leaders, as well as Republican leaders, and continue, as we did in my state. We met every Monday for a couple hours, talked about the issues and the challenges in, the, in, the, in our state in that case. We have to work on a collaborative basis, not because we're going to compromise our principle, but because there's common ground and the challenges America faces right now. Look, the reason I'm in this race is there are people that are really hurting today in this country. And we face this deficit could crush the future generations. What's happening in the Middle East? There are developments around the world that are of real concern. And re Republicans and Democrats both love America. But we need to have leadership leadership in Washington that will actually bring people together and get the job done and could not care less if, if it's a Republican or a Democrat. I've done it before. I'll do it again. Mr. President. Well, first of all, I think Governor Romney is going to have a busy first day because he's also going to repeal Obamacare, which will not be very popular among Democrats as you're sitting down with them. Uh, but uh, look, my philosophy has been 
I will take ideas from anybody, Democrat or Republican, as long as they're advancing the cause of making middle class families stronger and giving ladders of opportunity to the middle class. That's how we cut taxes for middle class families and small businesses. That's how we cut a trillion dollars of spending that wasn't advancing that cause. That's how we signed three trade deals into law that are helping us to double our exports and sell more American products around the world. That's how we repealed Don't Ask, Don't Tell. That's how we ended the war in Iraq, as I promised, and that's how we're going to wind down the war in Afghanistan. That's how we went after al-Qaeda and bin Laden. Uh, so we've, we've seen progress even under Republican uh, control of the House of Representatives. But uh, ultimately, part of being principled, part of being a leader, is A, being able to describe exactly what it is that you intend to do, uh, not just saying, I'll sit down, but you have to have a plan. Number two, what's important is occasionally you've got to say no to, to, to folks both in your own party and in the other party. And you know, yes, have we had some fights between me and the Republicans when, when they okay. fought back against us reining in the excesses of Wall Street? Absolutely, because that was a fight that needed to be had. When, when we were fighting about whether or not we were going to make sure that uh, Americans had more security with their health insurance, and they said no, yes, that was a fight that we needed to have. All right. uh, and so part of leadership and governing is both saying what it is that you are for, but also being willing to say no to some things. And I've got to tell you, Governor Romney, when it comes to his own party during the course of this campaign, has not displayed that willingness to say no to some of the more extreme uh, parts of his party. That brings us to closing statements. There's a coin toss. Governor Romney, you won the toss, and you elected to go last. So you have a closing two minutes, Mr. President. Well, Jim, I want to thank you, and I want to thank Governor Romney, because I think this was a, a terrific debate, uh, and I very much appreciate it. Uh, and I want to thank the Uni University of Denver. Uh, you know, uh, four years ago, uh, we were going through a, a major crisis. Uh, and yet, uh, my faith and confidence in the American uh, future is undiminished. And the reason is because of its people because the woman I met in North Carolina who decided at 55 to go back to school because she wanted to inspire her daughter and now has a job from that new training that she's gotten, because a company in Minnesota who was uh, willing to give up salaries and perks for their executives to make sure that they didn't lay off workers during a recession, uh, the auto workers that you meet in Toledo or Detroit take such pride in building the best cars in the world, not just because of paycheck but because it gives them that sense of pride that they're helping to build America. And so the question now is how do we build on those strengths? And everything that I've tried to do and everything that I'm now proposing for the next four years in terms of improving our education system or developing uh, American energy or making sure that we're closing loopholes for companies that are shipping jobs overseas and focusing on small businesses and companies that are creating jobs here in the United States or, or closing our deficit in a responsible, balanced way that allows us to invest in our future. All those things are designed to make sure that the American people, their genius, their grit, their determination uh, is, is channeled and, 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 and they have an opportunity to succeed. And everybody's getting a fair shot and everybody's getting a fair share. Everybody's doing a fair share and everybody's playing by the same rules. You know, four years ago, uh, I said that I'm not a perfect man and I wouldn't be a perfect president. And that's probably a promise that Governor Romney thinks I've kept. But I also promised that I'd fight every single day on behalf of the American people and the middle class and all those who are striving to get in the middle class. I've kept that promise. And if you'll vote for me, uh, then I promise I'll fight just as hard in a second term. Governor Romney, your two minute close. Thank you, Jim. And Mr. President, thank you for tuning in this evening. This is, a, uh, this is an important election, and I'm concerned about America. I'm concerned about the direction America has been taking over the last four years. I, uh, I know this is bigger than an election about uh, the two of us as, as individuals. It's bigger than our respective parties. It's an election about the course of America. What kind of America do you want to have for yourself and for your children? And there really are two very different paths that we began speaking about this evening. And over the course of this month, we're going to have two more presidential debates and a vice presidential debate. We'll talk about those two paths, but they lead in very different directions. And it's not just looking to our words that you have to take an evidence of where they go. You can look at the record. There's no question in my mind that if the president were to be reelected, you'll continue to see a middle class squeeze with incomes going down and prices going up. 
I'll get incomes up again. You'll see chronic unemployment. We've had 43 straight months with unemployment above 8%. If I'm president, I will create, help create 12 million new jobs in this country with rising incomes. If the president's reelected, Obamacare will be fully installed. In my view, that's going to mean a whole different way of life for people who counted on the insurance plan they had in the past. Many will lose it. You're going to see health premiums go up by some $2,500 per, per family. If I'm elected, we won't have Obamacare. We'll put in place the kind of principles that I put in place in my own state and allow each state to craft their own programs to get people insured and will focus on getting the cost of health care down. If the president were to be reelected, you're going to see a $716 billion cut to Medicare. You'll have 4 million people who will lose Medicare Advantage. You'll have hospitals and providers that will no longer accept Medicare patients. I'll restore that $716 billion to Medicare. And finally, military. The president's reelected, you'll see dramatic cuts to our military. The Secretary of Defense has said these would be even devastating. I will not cut our commitment to our military. I will keep America strong and get America's middle class working again. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Mr. President. You. The next debate will be the vice presidential event on Thursday, October 11th at Center College in Danville, Kentucky. For now, from the University of Denver, I'm Jim Lara. Thank you and good night. Good evening and welcome to the first and only vice presidential debate of 2012, sponsored by the Commission on Presidential Debates. I'm Martha Raddatz of ABC News and I am honored to moderate this debate between two men who have dedicated much of their lives to public service. Tonight's debate is divided between domestic and foreign policy issues. And I'm going to move back and forth between foreign and domestic since that is what a vice president or president would have to do. We will have nine different segments. At the beginning of each segment, I will ask both candidates a question, and they will each have two minutes to answer. Then I will encourage a discussion between the candidates with follow-up questions. By coin toss, it has been determined that Vice President Biden will be first to answer the opening question. We have a wonderful audience here at Center College tonight. You will no doubt hear their enthusiasm at the end of the debate, and right now, as we welcome Vice President Joe Biden and Congressman Paul Ryan. Very nice to see you. How are you doing? Okay, you got your little wave to the families in. It's great. Good evening, gentlemen. It really is an Good honor evening. to be here with both of you. I would like to begin with Libya. On a rather somber note, one month ago tonight, on the anniversary of 9-11, Ambassador Chris Stevens and three other brave Americans were killed in a terrorist attack in Benghazi. The State Department has now made clear there were no protesters there. It was a pre-planned assault by heavily armed men. Wasn't this a massive intelligence failure, Vice President Biden? What it was, it was a tragedy, Martha. It, uh, Chris Stevens was one of our best. We lost three other brave Americans. And I can make absolutely two commitments to you and all the American people tonight. One, we will find and bring to justice the men who did this. And secondly, we will get to the bottom of it, and whatever, wherever the facts lead us, wherever they lead us, we will make clear to the American public, because whatever mistakes are made will not be made again. When you're looking at a president, Martha, it seems to me that uh, you should take a look at his most important responsibility. That's caring for the national security of the country. And the best way to do that is take a look at how he's handled the issues of the day. On Iraq, the president said he would end the war. Governor Romney said that was a tragic mistake. We should have left 30, he ended it. Governor Romney said that was a tragic mistake. We should have left 30,000 troops there. With regard to Afghanistan, he said he will end the war in 2014. Governor Romney said we should not set a date, number one. And number two, with regard to 2014, it depends. When it came to Osama bin Laden, the president, the first day in office, 
I was sitting with him in the Oval Office. He called in the CIA and signed an order saying my highest priority is to get bin Laden. Prior to the election, prior to the, uh, uh, him being sworn in, Governor Romney was asked the question about how he would proceed. He said, I wouldn't move heaven and earth to get bin Laden. He didn't understand it was more than about taking a, a murderer off the battlefield. It was about restoring America's heart and letting terrorists around the world know if you do harm to America, we will track you to the gates of hell if need be. And lastly, the, uh, the President of the United States has, uh, has led with a steady hand and clear vision. Governor Romney, the opposite. The last thing we need now is another war. Congressman Ryan. We mourn the loss of these four Americans who were murdered. When you take a look at what has happened just in the last few weeks, they sent the U.N. ambassador out to say that this was because of a protest and a YouTube video. It took the president two weeks to acknowledge that this was a terrorist attack. He went to the U.N., and in his speech at the U.N., he said six times he talked about the YouTube video. Look, if we are hit by terrorists, we're going to call it for what it is, a terrorist attack. Our ambassador in Paris has a Marine detachment guarding him. Shouldn't we have a Marine detachment guarding our ambassador in Benghazi, a place where we knew that there was an al-Qaeda cell with arms. This is becoming more troubling by the day. They first blamed the YouTube video. Now they're trying to blame the Romney-Ryan ticket for making this an issue. And with respect to Iraq, we had the same position before the withdrawal, which was we agreed with the Obama administration. Let's have a status of forces agreement to make sure that we secure our gains. The vice president was put in charge of those negotiations by President Obama, and they failed to get the agreement. We don't have a status of forces agreement because they failed to get one. That's what we are talking about. Now, when it comes to our veterans, we owe them a great debt of gratitude for what they've done for us, including your son, Bo. But we also want to make sure that we don't lose the things we fought so hard to get. And with respect to Afghanistan, the 2014 deadline, we agree with the 2014 transition. But what we also want to do is make sure that we're not projecting weakness abroad. And that's what's happening here. This Benghazi issue would be a tragedy in and of itself. But unfortunately, it's indicative of a broader problem. And that is what we are watching on our TV screens is the unraveling of the Obama foreign policy, which is making the world more, more chaotic and us less safe. I, I just want to talk to you about right in the middle of the crisis, Governor Romney, and you're talking about this again tonight, talked about the weakness, talked about apologies from the Obama administration. Was that really appropriate right in the middle of the crisis? On that same day, the Obama administration had the exact same position. Let's recall that they disavowed their own statement that they had put out earlier in the day in Cairo. So we had the same position, but we will, it's never too early to speak out for our values. We should have spoken out right away when the Green Revolution was up and starting, when the mullahs in Iran were attacking their people. We should not have called Bashar Assad a reformer when he was turning his Russian-provided guns on his own people. We should always stand up for peace, for democracy, for individual rights. And we should not be imposing these devastating defense cuts, because what that does, when we equivocate on our values, when we show that we're cutting our own defense, it makes us more weak. It projects weakness, and when we look weak, our adversaries are much more willing to test us they're more brazen in their attacks, and our allies are less willing to With trust With all us. due respect, that's a bunch of malarkey. And in why fact, is that so? Because not a single thing he said is accurate. First of all... Be specific. I will be very specific. Number one, the, uh, this lecture on embassy security. The congressman here cut embassy security in his budget by $300 million below what we asked for. Number one, so much for the embassy security piece. Number two... Governor Romney, before he knew the facts, before he even knew that our ambassador was killed, he was out making a political statement which was panned by the media around the world. And this talk about this, this weakness, I, I don't understand what my friend's talking about here. We, this is a president who's gone out and done everything he has said he was going to do. This is a guy who's repaired our alliances so the rest of the world follows us again. This is the guy who brought the entire world, including Russia and China, to bring about the most devastating, most devastating, uh, um, uh, 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 the most devastating efforts on 
uh, Iran to make sure that they, in fact, stop with their... Look, I, I, I just, I mean, these guys bet against America all the time. Can, can we talk about... Can, let me go back yeah, to sure. Libya. What were you first told about the attack? A, why, why were people talking about protests when people in the consulate first saw armed men attacking with guns? There were no protesters. Because why that's did exactly that go on for weeks? exactly what we were told by, by the who? intelligence community. The intelligence community told us that. As they learned more facts about exactly what happened, they changed their assessment. That's why there's also an investigation headed by Tom Pickering, a leading diplomat in the, from the Reagan years, who is doing an investigation as to whether or not there are any lapses, what the lapses were, so that they will never happen again. And they wanted but, more security there. Well, we weren't told they wanted more security again. We did not know they wanted more security again. And by the way, at the time, we were told exactly, we said exactly what the intelligence community told us that they knew. That was the assessment. And as the intelligence community changed their view, we made it clear they changed their view. That's why I said we will get to the bottom of this. You know, usually when there's a crisis, we pull together. We pull together as a nation. But as I said, even before we knew what happened to the ambassador, the governor was holding a press conference. Was holding a press conference. That's not presidential leadership. Mr. Ryan, I want to ask you about the Romney campaign talks a lot about no apologies. He has a book called No Apologies. Should the U.S. have apologized for Americans burning Qurans in Afghanistan? Should the U.S. apologize for U.S. Marines urinating on Taliban corpses? Oh, gosh, yes. Urinating on Taliban cor corpses? What we should not apologize burning for. Burning Qurans immediately. What we should not be apologizing for are standing up for our values. What we should not be doing is saying to the Egyptian people, while Mubarak is cracking down on them, that he's a good guy, and then the next week say he ought to go. What we should not be doing is rejecting claims for, for calls for more security in our barracks, in our marine. We need Marines in Benghazi when the commander on the ground says we need more forces for security. There were requests for extra security. Those requests were not honored. Look, this was the anniversary of 9-11. It was Libya a country we knew we had al-Qaeda cells there. As we know, al-Qaeda and its affiliates are on the rise in northern Africa. And we did not give our ambassador in Benghazi a marine detachment. Of course there's an investigation so we can make sure that this never happens again. But when it comes to speaking up for our valleys, we should not apologize for those. Here's the problem. Look at all the various issues out there, and it's unraveling before our eyes. The vice president talks about sanctions on Iran. They got, we've had Let's four. move to Iran. I'd, I'd actually like to move to Iran because there's really no bigger national security Absolutely. this country is facing. Both President Obama and Governor Romney have said they will prevent Iran from getting a nuclear weapon, even if that means military action. Last week, former Defense Secretary Bob Gates said a strike on Iran's facilities would not work and, quote, could prove catastrophic, haunting us for generations. Can the two of you be absolutely clear and specific to the American people? How effective would a military strike be, Congressman Ryan? We cannot allow Iran to gain a nuclear weapons capability. Now, let's take a look at where we've got, come from. When Barack Obama was elected, they had enough fissile material, nuclear material, to make one bomb. Now they have enough for five. They're racing toward a nuclear weapon. They're four years closer toward a nuclear weapons capability. We've had four different sanctions to the UN on Iran, three from the Bush administration, one here. And the only reason we got it is because Russia watered it down and prevented the, the sanctions from hitting the central bank. Mitt Romney proposed these sanctions in 2007. In Congress, I've been fighting for these sanctions since 2009. The administration was blocking us every step of the way. Only because we had strong bipartisan support for these tough sanctions were we able to overrule their objections and put them in spite of the administration. Imagine what would have happened if we had these sanctions in place earlier. You think Iran's not brazen? Look at what they're doing. They're stepping up their terrorist attacks. They tried a terrorist attack in the United States last year when they tried to blow up the Saudi ambassador at a restaurant in Washington, D.C. And talk about credibility. When this administration says that all options are on the table, they send out senior administration officials that send all these mixed signals. And so in order to solve this peacefully, which is everybody's goal, you have to have the Ayatollahs change their minds. Well, look at where they are. They're moving faster toward a nuclear weapon. It's because this administration has no credibility on this issue. 
It's because this administration watered down sanctions, delayed sanctions, tried to stop us from putting the tough sanctions in place. Now we have them in place because of Congress. They say the military option's on the table, but it's not being viewed as credible. And the key is to do this peacefully is to make sure that we have credibility. Under a Romney administration, we will have credibility on this issue. Vice President Biden. It's incredible. <laughs> uh, look, um, imagine had we let the Republican Congress work out the sanctions. You think there's any possibility the entire world would have joined us? Russia and China, all of our allies. These are the most crippling sanctions in the history of sanctions, period, period. When Governor Romney's asked about it, he said, we got to keep these sanctions. When you say, well, you're talking about doing more, what are you, are you, you're going to go to war? Is that what you want to do now? We want to prevent war. We're gonna, and I, the interesting thing is how they're going to prevent war. How are they going to prevent war? They say that there's nothing more that, we, that they say we should do than what we've already done, number one. And number two, with regard to the ability of the United States to take action militarily, it is, it is not in my purview to talk about classified information, but we feel quite confident we could deal a serious blow to the Iranians. But number two, the Iranians are, the Israelis and the United States, our military and intelligence communities are absolutely the same exact place in terms of how close, how close the Iranians are to getting a nuclear weapon. They are a good way away. There is no difference between our view and theirs. When my friend talks about fissile material, they have to take this highly enriched uranium, get it from 20% up, then they have to be able to have something to put it in. There is no weapon that the Iranians have at this point. Both the Israelis and we know, we'll know if they start the process of building a weapon. So all this bluster I keep hearing, all this loose talk, what are they talking about? Are you talking about to be more credible? What, what more can the president do? Stand before the United Nations, tell the whole world, directly communicate to the Ayatollah, we will not let them acquire a nuclear weapon, period, unless he's talking about going to war. Martha, let's just let's look at this from the view of the Ayatollahs. What do they see? They see this administration trying to water down sanctions in Congress for over two years. They're moving faster toward a nuclear weapon. They're spinning the centrifuges faster. They see us saying when we come into the administration, when they're sworn in, we need more space with our ally Israel. They see President Obama in New York City the same day Bibi Netanyahu is, and he's, instead of meeting with him, goes on a, on a daily talk show. They see when we say that these options are on the table, the Secretary of Defense walk them back. They are not changing their mind. That's what we have to do is change their mind so they stop pursuing how, nuclear how weapons and they're going so faster. Quickly. Look, you, you both saw Benjamin Netanyahu hold up that picture mm -hmm. of a bomb with a red line and talking about the red line being in spring. So can you solve this? If, if the Romney-Ryan ticket is elected, can you solve this in two months before spring and avoid nuclear... Nuclear. We, we can debate the timeline. We can debate the timeline whether there's, it's that short a time or longer. I, I agree that it's probably longer. Number two, it's all you about. You don't credibility. agree with that bomb and what no. the Israelis oh, might look, do. We, we oh, both. Vice we, I don't Biden. want to go into classified oh. stuff, but we both it's, agree that to do this peacefully, you got to get them to change their minds. They're not changing their minds. And look at what this what, administration what do does. Do Let me tell you what the Ayatollah sees. You have to have the credibility. The Ayatollah sees his economy being crippled. The Ayatollah sees that there are 50% fewer exports of oil. He sees the currency going into the tank. He sees the economy going into freefall. And he sees the world for the first time totally united in opposition to him getting a nuclear weapon. Now, with regard to Bibi, who's been my friend for 39 years, the president has met with Bibi a dozen times. He's spoken to Bibi Netanyahu as much as he's spoken to anybody. The idea that we're not in, I was in a, just before he went to the UN, I was in a conference call with the, with the president, uh, with him talking to Bibi for well over an hour in, 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 in stark relief and detail about what was going on. This is a bunch of stuff. Look, here's the deal. What does that mean, a bunch of stuff? Well, it means it's simply inaccurate. It's Irish. <laughs> it's Irish. It is. <laughs> we Irish call it malarkey. Thanks for the translation. Yeah, yeah. No, okay. We Irish call it malarkey. 
that. But last thing, the Secretary of Defense has made it absolutely clear to walk anything back. We will not allow the Iranians to get a nuclear weapon. What Bibi held up there was, when they get to the point where they can enrich uranium enough to put into a weapon, they don't have a weapon to put it into. Let's all calm down a little bit here. Iran is more isolated today than when we took office. It was on the ascendancy when we took office. It is totally isolated. Thanks. I don't Thank know what world Thanks. these guys are in. Thank heavens we have these sanctions in place. It's in spite of their opposition. Oh, God. They've given 20 waivers to this sanction. And all I have to point to are the results. They're four years closer toward a nuclear weapon. I and think that case speaks for can, can you tell the American By the people, way, what's no, no, worse, they another not war in the Middle East? To a nuclear they weapon. They're, they're closer to being able to get enough fissile material to put in a weapon if they had a weapon. You're acting but, a little bit like they don't want one, though. Oh, I didn't say, no, I'm not saying that. Let's, facts matter, Martha. You're a foreign policy expert. Facts matter. All this loose talk about them, all they have to do is get to enrich uranium in a certain amount, and they have a weapon. Not true. Not true. They are more, and if we ever have to take action, unlike when we took office, we will have the world behind us. And that matters. That matters. What about Bob Gates' statement? Let me read that again. Could prove catastrophic, haunting us for generations. He is right. It could it, prove catastrophic if we didn't do it with precision. Well, and what it does is it undermines our credibility by backing up the point when we make it that all options are on the table. That's the point. The Ayatollahs see these kinds of statements and they think, I'm going to get a nuclear weapon. When, when we see the kind of equivocation that took place because this administration wanted a precondition policy, so when the Green Revolution started up, they were silent for nine days. When they see us putting des desperate, when they see us putting daylight between ourselves and our allies in Israel, that gives them encouragement. When they see Russia watering down any further sanctions, the only reason we got a UN sanction is because Russia watered it down and prevented these central bank sanctions in the first place. So when they see this kind of activity, they are encouraged to continue. And that's Martha, the let problem. me tell you what what's, Let did. me ask you what's worse. War in the Middle East, another war in the Middle East, I'll tell you or a nuclear-armed Iran. I'll tell you what's Quickly. worse. A nuclear-armed Iran, which triggers a nuclear arms race in the Middle East. This is the world's largest sponsor of, of terrorism. That's They've the dedicated themselves to wiping an entire country off the map. They call us the great Satan. And if they get nuclear weapons, other people in the neighborhood will pursue their nuclear weapons as well. Vice President We Biden. can't live with that. War should always be the absolute last resort. That's why these crippling sanctions with Bibi Netanyahu says we should continue, which, if I'm not mistaken, Governor Romney says we, we should continue. If I, I may be mistaken. He changed his mind so often. I could be wrong. But the fact of the matter is he says they're working. And the fact is that they are being crippled by them. And we've made it clear. Big nations can't bluff. This president doesn't bluff. Gentlemen, I want to bring the conversation to a different kind of national security issue, the state of our economy. The number one issue here at home is jobs. The percentage of unemployed just fell below 8% for the first time in 43 months. The Obama administration had projected that it would fall below 6% now after the addition of close to a trillion dollars in stimulus money. So will both of you level with the American people? Can you get unemployment to under 6% and how long will it take? I don't Vice know how long it will take. We can and we will get it under 6%. Let's look at, the, let's take a look at the facts. Let's look at the, where we were when we came to office. The economy was in free fall. We had the Great Recession hit. Nine million people lost their job. 17 $1.6 trillion in wealth lost in equity in your homes and retirement accounts for the middle class. We knew we had to act for the middle class. We immediately went out and rescued General Motors. We went ahead and made sure that we cut taxes for the middle class. And in addition to that, when that, ha and when that occurred, what did Romney do? Romney said, no, let Detroit go bankrupt. We moved in and helped people refinance their homes. Governor Romney said, no, let foreclosures hit the bottom. 
But it shouldn't be surprising for a guy who says 47% of the American people are unwilling to take responsibility for their own lives. My friend recently in a speech in Washington said 30% of the American people are takers. These people are my mom and dad, the people I grew up with, my neighbors. They pay more effective tax than Governor Romney pays in his federal income tax. They are elderly people who, in fact, are living off of Social Security. They are veterans and people fighting in Afghanistan right now who are, quote, not paying any taxes. I've had it up to here with this notion that 47 percent, it's about time they take some responsibility here. And instead of signing pledges to Grover Norquist not to ask the wealthiest among us to contribute to bring back the middle class, they should be signing a pledge saying to the middle class, we're going to level the playing field. We're going to give you a fair shot again. We are going to not repeat the mistakes we made in the past by having a different set of rules for Wall Street and Main Street, making sure that we continue to hemorrhage these tax cuts for the super wealthy. They're pushing the continuation of a tax cut that will give an additional $500 billion in tax cuts to 120,000 families. And they're holding hostage the middle class tax cut because they say we won't pass, we won't continue the middle class tax cut unless you t give the tax cut for the super wealthy. It's about time they take some responsibility. Mr. Ryan. Joe and I are from similar towns. He's from Scranton, Pennsylvania. I'm from Janesville, Wisconsin. You know what the unemployment rate in Scranton is today? I sure do. It's 10%. Yeah. You know what it was the day you guys came in? 8.5%. Yeah. That's how it's going all around America. Look, you don't read the statistics. That's not how it's going. It's going this down. This is his two-minute answer, Look. please. <laughs> Did they come in and inherit a tough situation? Absolutely. <laughs> but we're going in the wrong direction. Look at where we are. The economy is barely limping along. It's growing at 1.3%. That's slower than it grew last year, and last year was slower than the year before. Job growth in September was slower than it was in August, and August was slower than it was in July. We're heading in the wrong direction. 23 million Americans are struggling for work today. 15% of Americans are living in poverty today. This is not what a real recovery looks like. We need real reforms for a real recovery, and that's exactly what Mitt Romney and I are proposing. It's a five-point plan. Get America energy independent in North America by the end of the decade. Help people who are hurting get the skills they need to get the jobs they want. Get this deficit and debt under control to prevent a debt crisis. Make trade work for America so we can make more things in America and sell them overseas and champion small businesses. Don't raise taxes on small businesses because there are job creators. He talks about Detroit. Mitt Romney's a car guy. They keep misquoting him, but he, let me tell you about the Mitt Romney I know. This is a guy who I was talking to, a family in Northboro, Massachusetts the other day, Cheryl and Mark Nixon. Their kids were hit in a car crash Four of them, two of them, Rob and Reed, were paralyzed. The Romneys didn't know them. They went to the same church they never met before. Mitt asked if he could come over on Christmas. He brought his boys, his wife, and gifts. Later on, he said, I know you're struggling, Mark. Don't worry about their college. I'll pay for it. When Mark told me this story, because you know what? Mitt Romney doesn't tell these stories. The Nixons told this story. When he told me this story, he said it wasn't the help, the cash help. It's that he gave his time and he has consistently. This is a man who gave 30% of his income to charity, more than the two of us combined. Mitt Romney's a good man. He cares about 100% of Americans in this country. And with respect to that quote, I think the vice president very well knows that sometimes the words don't come out of your mouth the right way. <laughs> <laughs> but I always say what I mean. <laughs> and we so does Romney. We want everybody to succeed we want to get people out of poverty, in the middle class, onto a life of self-sufficiency. We believe in opportunity and upward mobility. That's what we're going to push for in a Romney administration. Vice President, Look. I have a feeling you have a few things to say here. <laughs> uh, the idea, if you heard that, that uh, little soliloquy on 47%, you think he just made a mistake, then I think you're... I, 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 I think I got a bridge to, to sell you. Um, mm -hmm. Look, uh, I, I don't doubt his personal generosity, and I understand what it's like. Uh, um, when I was a little younger than the congressman, uh, my wife uh, was in an accident, killed my daughter and, uh, and my wife, and my two sons survived. I have sat in the homes of many people who have gone through what I get through because the one thing you can give people solace is to know if they know you've been through it, that they can make it. 
So I, I don't doubt his personal uh, commitment to individuals. But you know what? I know he had no commitment to the autom automobile industry. He just let, he said, let it go bankrupt, period. Let it drop out. All this talk, we saved a million jobs. 200,000 people are working today. And I've never met two guys who are more down on America across the board. We're told everything's going bad. There are 5.2 million new jobs, private sector jobs. We need more, but 5.2 million. If they'd get out of the way, if they get out of the way and let us pass the tax cut for the middle class, make it permanent. If they get out of the way and pass the, pass the jobs, well, if they get out of the way and let us allow 14 million people who are struggling to stay in their homes because their mortgages are upside down but they never missed a mortgage payment, just get out of the way. Stop talking about how you care about people. Show me something. Show me a policy. Show me a policy where you take responsibility. And by the way, they talk about this great recession if it fell out of the sky, like, oh my goodness, where did it come from? It came from this man voting to put two wars in a credit card, to at the same time put a prescription drug benefit in the credit card, a, a trillion dollar tax cut for very wealthy. I was there, I voted against them. I said, no, we can't afford that. And now all of a sudden these guys are so seized with the concern about the debt that they created. Congressman Ryan. <clears throat> Let's not forget that they came in with one party control. When Barack Obama was elected, his party controlled everything. They had the ability to do everything of their choosing and look at where we are right now. They passed the stimulus. The idea that we could borrow $831 billion, spend it on all these special interest groups and that it would work out just fine. That unemployment would never get to 8%. It went up above 8% for 43 months. They said that right now, if we just passed this stimulus, the economy would grow at 4%. It's growing at 1.3. When could you get it below 6%? That's what our entire premise of our pro-growth plan for a stronger middle class is all about. Getting the economy growing at 4%, creating 12 million jobs over the next four years. Look at just the $90 billion in stimulus. And the vice president was in charge of overseeing this. $90 billion in green pork, to campaign contributors and special interest groups. There are, just at the Department of Energy, over 100 criminal investigations that have been launched into just how stimulus go ahead, spends go are being ahead, spent. Martha, look, his colleague runs an investigative welfare. committee, spent months and this months the, and months going into this. This is the this. Inspector General. May, months and months. They found no evidence of cronyism. And I love my friend here. I ha I'm not allowed to show letters, but go on our website. He sent me two letters saying, by the way, can you send me some stimulus money for companies here in the state of Wisconsin? We sent millions of dollars. You know why he said he did? He did ask for stimulus money, Sure he correct? did. By the way, On he, two he occasions, we, had, we, we advocated for constituents who are applying for grants. That's what we do. We do that for all constituents who are applying for well, I love for that. I love that. This is such a bad program. And he writes me a letter saying, writes the Department of Energy a letter saying, the reason we need this stimulus, it will create growth and jobs. He, his words. And now he's sitting here looking at me. And by the way, that program, again, investigated. What the Congress said was it was a model. Less than four tenths of 1% waste or fraud in the program. And all this talk about cronyism. They investigated and investigated, did not find one single piece of evidence. I wish he would just tell, be a little more candid. Was it a good idea to spend taxpayer dollars on electric cars in Finland or on windmills in China? Look, was it a good idea to borrow all this money from countries like China <laughs> and spend it on all these various different interest groups? Let me tell you, it was a good idea. It was a good idea. Moody's and others said that this was exactly what we needed to stop us from going off the cliff. It set the conditions to be able to grow again. We have, in fact, 4% of those green jobs didn't go under. When went, went under, it didn't work. It's a better batting average than investment bankers have. They have about a 40%. Right, where are the five million green jobs that were being? I, I want to move on here to to Medicare and entitlements. I think we've gone over this quite enough. And Both by the way, any letter you send me, I'll entertain. I appreciate that, Joe. <laughs> Let's talk about Medicare and entitlements. Both Medicare and Social Security are going broke and taking a larger share of the budget in the process. Will benefits for Americans under these programs have to change for the programs to survive, Mr. Ryan? Absolutely. Medicare and Social Security going bankrupt. These are indisputable facts. Look, when I look at these programs, we've all had tragedies in our lives. I think about what they've done for my own family. 
My mom and I had my grandmother move in with us who was facing Alzheimer's. Medicare was there for her, just like it's there for my mom right now, who's a Florida senior. After my dad died, my mom and I got Social Security survivor's benefits. Helped me pay for college. It helped her go back to college in her 50s, where she started a small business because of the new skills she got. She paid all of her taxes on the promise that these programs would be there for her. We will honor this promise. And the best way to do it is reform it for my generation. You see, if you reform these programs for my generation, people 54 and below, you can guarantee they don't change for people in or near retirement, which is precisely what Mitt Romney and I are proposing. Look what, look what Obamacare does. Obamacare takes $716 billion from Medicare to spend on Obamacare. Even their own chief actuary at Medicare backs this up. He says, you can't spend the same dollar twice. You can't claim that this money goes to Medicare and Obamacare. And then they put this new Obamacare board in charge of cutting Medicare each and every year in ways that will lead to denied care for current seniors. This board, by the way, it's 15 people. The president's supposed to appoint them next year. And not one of them even has to have medical training. And Social Security, if we don't shore up Social Security, when we run out of the IOUs, when the program goes bankrupt, a 25% across the board benefit cut kicks in on current seniors in the middle of their retirement. We're gonna stop that from happening. They haven't put a credible solution on the table. He'll tell you about vouchers. He'll say all these things to try and scare people. Here's what we're saying. Give younger people, when they become Medicare eligible, guaranteed coverage options that you can't be denied, including traditional Medicare. Choose your plan and then Medicare subsidizes your premiums. Not as much for the wealthy people, more coverage for middle income people and total out of pocket coverage for the poor and the sick. Choice and competition. We would rather have 50 million future seniors determine how their Medicare is delivered to them instead of 15 bureaucrats deciding what, if, where, when they get it. Vice President Biden to You know, I heard that death panel argument from Sarah Palin. It seems every vice presidential debate I hear this kind of stuff about panels. Um, but let's talk about Medicare. Um, what we did is we saved $716 billion and put it back, applied it to Medicare. We cut the cost of Medicare. We stopped overpaying insurance companies, when doctors and hospitals. The AMA supported what we did. AARP endorsed what we did. And it extended the life of Medicare to 2024. They want to wipe this all out. It also gave more benefits. Any senior out there, ask yourself. Do you have more benefits today? You do. If you're near the donut hole, you have $800, $600 more to help your prescription drug costs. You get wellness visits without copays. They wipe all of this out, and Medicare goes, becomes insolvent in 2016, no, no, number one. Number two, guaranteed benefit. It's a voucher. When they first proposed, when the congressman had his first voucher program, the CBO said it would cost six thousand four hundred dollars a year Martha more for every senior 55 and below when they got there he knew that yet he got it all the guys in Congress and the women in the Republican Party to vote for it Governor Romney knowing that said I, I, I would sign it were I there who you believe the AMA me a guy who's fought his whole life for this, or somebody who had actually put in motion a plan that knowingly cut six, uh, added $6,400 a year more to the cost of Medicare. Now they got a new plan. Trust me, it's not going to cost you any more. Folks, follow your instincts on this one. And with regard to Social Security, we will not we will not privatize it. If we had listened to Romney, Governor Romney, and the congressman during the Bush years, imagine where all those seniors would be now if their money had been in the market. Their ideas are old and their ideas are bad, and they eliminate the guarantee of Medicare. Here's the problem. They got caught with their hands in the cookie jar, turning Medicare into a piggy bank for Obamacare. Their own actuary from the administration came to Congress and said, one out of six hospitals and nursing homes are going to go out of business as a result of this. That's not what they said. 7.4 million seniors are projected to lose the current Medicare Advantage coverage they have. That's a $3,200 benefit cut. That didn't what we're happen. saying, more people signed these are up. from your own more, actuaries. More, 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 more people signed up for Medicare Advantage after what, the change. What they're no, saying, nobody is Mr. Vice President, down. I no, know, no, this Mr. Is Mr. Vice President, this is I little... know you're under a lot of duress to make up for lost ground. <laughs> But I think people will be better served if we don't keep interrupting each other. Well, let me don't just, take let me all the this. four minutes then. We're, not, we're saying don't change benefits for people 55 and above. They already, 
organize the retirement around these they problems. Are, you are. Let, let me ask you this. What, what but, is your specific plan for seniors who really can't afford to make up the difference in the value of what you call a premium support plan and others call a voucher? 100% coverage and for what, them. What, huh. what That's it what we're cost. saying. So we're saying income adjust these up? premium support payments by taking down the subsidies for wealthy people. Look, this is a plan. By the way, that $6,400 number, it was misleading then. It's totally inaccurate now. This is a plan that's bipartisan. It's a plan I put together with a prominent Democrat senator from Oregon. There's not one Democrat it's who endorses plan. it. Not one Democrat who's Our partner plan. is a Democrat from Oregon. And he said he does we, no longer support we put you it, for that. We put it together with the former Clinton budget director. Who this idea, it. <laughs> this idea came from the Clinton Commission to Save Medicare, chaired by Senator John Bro. Here's the point, Martha. Which was if we, don't, if we don't fix this problem pretty soon, then current seniors get cut. Here's the problem. 10,000 people are retiring every single day in America today, and they will for 20 years. That's not a political thing. Martha, That's if a we math just thing. did one thing, if, we just, if they just allow Medicare to bargain for the cost of drugs like Medicaid can, that would save $156 billion right off the bat. And it would deny all, seniors' all, choices. All, it, it, seniors it has a restricted are not formula. denied. So Absolutely. They are not denied. Look, folks, I, I, all, all you seniors out there, have you been denied choices? Have you lost Medicare Advantage? Because it's working or well right now. Signed up? Because Vice President Biden, let, let, let me ask you. If it, if it could help solve the problem, why not very slowly raise the Medicare eligibility age by two years, as Congressman Ryan suggests? Look, I was there when we did that with Social Security in 1983. I was one of eight people sitting in the room that included Tip O'Neill negotiating with uh, President Reagan. We all got together, and everybody said, as long as everybody's in the deal, Everybody's in the deal, and everybody is making some sacrifice. We can find a way. We made the system solvent to 2033. We will not, though, be part of any voucher plan eliminating it. The voucher says, Mom, when you're, 50, when you're 65, go out there, shop for the best insurance you can get. You're out of Medicare. You can buy back in if you want with this voucher, which will not keep pace will not keep pace with health care costs. Because if it did keep pace with health care costs, there would be no savings. That's why they go the voucher. They, we will be no part of a voucher program or the privatization of Social Security. A voucher is you go to your mailbox, get a check, and buy something. Nobody's proposing that. Hey, Barack Obama, four years ago, running for president, said, if you don't have any fresh ideas, use stale tactics to scare voters. If you don't have a good record to run on, paint your opponent as someone people should run from. I make a big you, you were one of the few ideas. lawmakers to stand with President Bush when he was seeking to partially privatize Social Security. For younger people. What we said then, That's okay. and what I've always agreed, is let younger Americans have a voluntary choice of making their money work faster for them within the Social Security system. That's not well what that Mitt Romney's worked. proposing. What we're saying is no changes for anybody 55 and what above. Mitt Romney is proposing. And then the kinds of changes we're talking about for younger people like myself is don't increase the benefits for wealthy people as fast as everybody else. Slowly Martha. raise the retirement age over time. It wouldn't get to Martha. the age of 70 until the one, year 2103, according to the actuaries. Now here's the, quickly, here's the quickly, Vice President. Quickly, the bottom line here is that all the studies show that if we went with Social Security proposal made by Mitt Romney, if you're 40, in your 40s now, you will pay $2,600 a year more. You get $2,600 a year less in Social Security. If you're in your 20s now, you get $4,700 a year less. The idea of changing, and change being in this case, to cut the benefits for people without taking other action you could do to make it work is absolutely the wrong way. These, look, these guys haven't been big on Medicare from the beginning. Their party's not been big on Medicare from the beginning. And they've always been about Social Security as little as you can do. Look, folks, use your common sense. Who do you trust on this? A man who introduced a bill that would raise it $6,400 a year, knowing it and passing it and Romney saying he signed it, or me and the president. That statistic was completely misleading, but more importantly... That's what they were the facts, this, right? This is what politicians do when they don't have a record to run on. Try to scare people from voting for you. If you don't get ahead of this problem, it's going to attack Medicare us. beneficiaries have more benefits. We're not going to run gonna, away. We're going to move on to a very simple question. To Medicare problem. and Social Security did so much for my own family. We are not going to jeopardize this program, but we have to save it 
You the are jeopardizing so the program. You're changing the program from a guaranteed benefit to a premium support, whatever you call it. The bottom line is people are going to have to pay more money out of their pocket. And the families the I know and the families world. I come from, they don't have the money to pay more. That's out why of we're money. saying Gentlemen. more for lower income people and less for higher income people. I would like to move on to a very simple question for both of you. And something tells me <laughs> I won't get a very simple answer. But let me ask you this. I gave you a simple answer. He's raising the cost of Medicare. <laughs> OK, on to taxes. If your ticket is elected, who will pay more in taxes? Who will pay less? And we're starting with Vice President Biden for two minutes. The middle class will pay less and people making a million dollars or more will begin to contribute slightly more. Let me give you one concrete example. The continuation of the Bush tax cuts. We are arguing that the Bush tax cuts for the wealthy should be allowed to expire. Of the Bush tax cuts for the wealthy, $800 million billion of that goes to people making a minimum of a million dollars. We see no justification in these economic times for those, and they're patriotic Americans. They're, they're not asking for this continued tax cut. They're not suggesting it, but my friends are insisting on it. 120,000 families, by continuing that tax cut, will get an additional $500 billion in tax relief in the next 10 years, and their income is an average of $8 million. We want to extend permanently the middle class tax cut for permanently from the Bush middle class tax cut. These guys won't allow us to. You know what they're saying? We say, let's have a vote. Let's have a vote on the middle class tax cut and let's have a vote on the upper tax cut. Let's go ahead and vote on it. They're saying no. They're holding hostage the middle class tax cut to the super wealthy. And on top of that, they got another tax cut coming. That's $5 trillion that all the studies point out will, in fact, give another $250 million, uh, uh, $250,000 a year to those 120,000 families and raise taxes for people who are middle income with a child by $2,000 a year. This is unconscionable. There is no need for this. The middle class got knocked on their heels. The Great Recession crushed them. They need some help now. The last people who need help are 120,000 families for another, another $500 billion tax cut over the next 10 years. Congressman. Our entire premise of these tax reform plans is to grow the economy and create jobs. It's a plan that's estimated to create 7 million jobs. Now, we think that government taking 28% of a family and business's income is enough. President Obama thinks that the government ought to be able to take as much as 44.8% of a small business's income. Look, if you taxed every person in successful small business making over $250,000 at 100%, it'd only run the government for 98 days. If everybody who paid income taxes last year, including successful small businesses, doubled their income taxes this year, we'd still have a $300 billion deficit. You see, there aren't enough rich people and small businesses to tax to pay for all their spending. And so the next time you hear them say, don't worry about it, we'll get a few wealthy people to pay their fair share, watch out, middle class, the tax bill is coming to you. That's why we're saying we need fundamental tax reform. Let's take a look at it this way. Eight out of 10 businesses, they file their taxes as individuals, not as corporations. And where I come from overseas, which is Lake Superior, <laughs> the Canadians, they drop their tax rates to 15%. The average tax rate on businesses in the industrialized world is 25%, and the president wants the top effective tax rate on successful small businesses to go above 40%. Two thirds of our jobs come from small businesses. This one tax would actually tax about 53% of small business income. It's expected to cost us 710,000 jobs. And you know what? It doesn't even pay for 10% of their proposed deficit spending increases. What we are saying is lower tax rates across the board and close loopholes primarily to the higher income people. We have three bottom lines. Don't raise the deficit, don't raise taxes on the middle class, and don't lower the share of income that is borne by the high income earners. He'll keep saying this $5 trillion plan, I suppose. It's been discredited by six <laughs> other studies, and even their own deputy campaign manager acknowledged that it wasn't correct. Well, well let's, let's uh, talk about this 20%. <laughs> you have refused, and again, to offer specifics on how you pay for that 20% across the board tax cut. 
do you actually have the specifics or are you still working on it and that's why you won't tell voters? Different than this administration, we actually want to have big bipartisan agreements. You see, I understand that. Do you that have the specifics? Do you have the maps? Do you know exactly what you're doing? Look, <laughs> look, at what Mitt look at what Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill did. They worked together out of a framework to lower tax rates and broaden the base, and they worked together to fix that. What we're saying is, here's our framework. Lower tax rates 20%. We raise about $1.2 trillion through income taxes. We forego about $1.1 trillion in loopholes and deductions. And so what we're saying is, deny those loopholes and deductions to higher income taxpayers so that more of their income is taxed, which has a broader base of taxation, so we can lower tax rates across the board. Now, here's why I'm saying this. What we're saying is here's the framework. I hope framework. I'm going to get time to respond we to this. Want to work I, I, with you'll Congress. get time. We want to work with Congress on how best to achieve this. That means successful. Look, No specific. Mitt, yeah. What we're saying is lower tax rates 20%, start with the wealthy, Work with Congress and to do it. you guarantee this math will add up? Absolutely. Six studies have guaranteed. Six studies have verified that this math adds up. But Vice here's President Biden. Let me, Look, let me, Vice President Biden. Let me translate. Let, let me have a chance to translate. I'll come back in a second then, right? First of all, I was there when Ronald Reagan tax breaks. When he gave specifics of what he was going to cut. No, number one, in terms of tax expenditures. Mm -hmm. Number two, 97 percent of the small businesses in America pay less, make less than two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Let me tell you who some of those other small businesses are. Hedge funds that make six, eight hundred million dollars a year. That, that's what they count as small businesses because they're passed through. Let's look at how sincere they are. Ronald, I mean, excuse me, uh, Governor Romney on 60 min Minutes, I guess it was about 10 days ago, was asked, Governor, you pay 14% on $20 million. Someone making $50,000 pays more than that. Do you think that's fair? He said, oh, yes, that's fair. That's fair. This is, and they're going to talk about, you think these guys are going to go out there and cut those loopholes? The loophole, the biggest loophole they take advantage of is the carried interest loophole and, and capital gains loophole. They exempt that. Now, there's not enough. The reason why the AEI study, the American Enterprise Institute study, the Tax Policy Center study, the reason they all say it's going to, taxes are going to go up in the middle class, the only way you can find $5 trillion in loopholes is cut the mortgage deduction for middle class people, cut the health care deduction for middle class people, take away their ability to get a tax break to send their kids to college. That's why they is arrive. Is he wrong about that? He is wrong about that. There, you, can, that? you can cut tax rates by 20% and still preserve these important preferences for middle class taxpayers. Not mathematically it, possible. It is mathematically possible. It's been done before. It's precisely <laughs> what we're proposing. It has never been done before. It's been done a couple of times. Actually. It has never Jack been Jack Kennedy done lowered tax rates, increased growth. Ronald oh, Reagan. Oh, now you're Jack Kennedy. Ronald Reagan. <laughs> Republicans and Democrats. Republicans and Democrats have worked together on this. You know, I understand right. you guys aren't used but to doing bipartisan deals. But we told each other deals. what we're going to do. When we did it with Republicans Reagan, Democrats, he said, here, here are the we things said, we're going to cut. Framework. Here's Let's the framework. Let's work together said. to fill in the details. That's exactly the details. That's how you get things done. You work with There's, Congress. Look, let me say it this way. Mitt that's Romney coming from the Republican Congress working Mitt, bipartisanly. Mitt Romney. 7% rating. Mitt Romney oh. was governor of Massachusetts, where 87% of the legislators he served with were Democrats. He didn't demonize them. He didn't demagogue them. He met with those party leaders every week. He reached across the aisle. He didn't compromise principles. And you he saw found common happened. ground, and he balanced the budget. You saw it. If he, he did such a great job, if he did such a great job in four times without raising taxes. Why isn't he even contesting Massachusetts? Vice President, oh, I mean, what, what would you curious, suggest? What would you suggest beyond raising taxes on the wealthy that would substantially reduce Not the Just let the taxes expire like they're supposed to on those millionaires. We don't, we can't afford $800 billion going to people making a minimum of a million dollars. They do not need it, Martha. Those 120,000 families make $8 million a year. Middle class people need the help. Why does my friend cut out the tuition tax credit for them? Why does he go after can the child care? Can you declare anything off limits? Why do they do Can you that? declare anything off limits? Yeah, we're saying home close loopholes on high interest people. Home mortgage deduction. For higher income people. Here. Can you guarantee this, that no one taxes, making less than $100,000 will have a mortgage, this, mortgage deduction impacted? This taxes guarantee? a million small businesses. He keeps trying to make you think that it's just some movie star or hedge fund guy. 97% of the small businesses make less than $250,000 a year would not be you affected. You know it hits a million people. This taxes a million people. 
a million small Does businesses. Does it tax 97 percent of the American it, it businesses? It taxes a million small, small businesses. businesses who are our greatest job creators. I wish I could get it. The greatest job creators. And you're going, going to increase the Think about defense this budget. Way. And you're going to increase the defense no, We're just budget. not going to cut the defense budget like they're, they're proposing. You're going to $2 billion. That's $2 not trillion. accurate. More we're than talking that. about no, So no massive No, we're saying defense don't, increase. Okay, you want to get into defense now? Let, yes, I All do. Right. I do. So, because that's another math question. Right. Okay. How do you do that? So they proposed a $478 billion cut to defense to begin with. Now we have another $500 billion cut to defense that's lurking on the horizon. They insisted upon that cut being involved in the debt negotiations. Let, let, and so now we let's have a one Let's put the automatic cut. defense cuts right. aside, okay? okay? Let's so put those like aside. No that. one wants okay. that. But I want to know how you do the math and have this increase in Two defense trillion spending. trillion dollars. You, you don't cut defense by a trillion dollars. That's what we're talking about. And the, what, what national trillion. security issues Who's justify an increase? We're going to cut 80,000 soldiers, 20,000 Marines, 120 cargo planes. We're going to push the Joint Strike Fighter down out. We're cutting one missile more, defense. And one more. If these cuts go through, our Navy will be the smallest, it has, it's the smallest it has been since before World War I. This invites weakness. Look, do we believe in peace through strength? You bet we do. And that means you don't impose these devastating cuts on our military. So we're saying don't cut the military by a trillion dollars. Not increase it by a trillion, don't cut it by a trillion dollars. Quickly, Vice President Biden, on this, Look, and I want to move on. We don't cut it. And I might add, this so-called, I know we don't want to use the fancy word sequester this automatic cut, that was part of a debt deal that they asked for. And let me tell you what my friend said at a press conference announcing his support of the deal. He said, and I'm paraphrasing, we've been looking for this moment for a long time. Can, Can I, I tell you what that meant? We've been looking for bipartisanship for a long time. And so the bipartisanship is what he voted for, the automatic cuts in defense if they didn't act. And beyond that, they asked for another. Look, the military says we need a smaller, leaner army. We need more special forces. We need we don't need more M1 tanks. What we need is more. UAVs. Some of the military. I know that's not some support. of the military. That was the decision of the Joint Chiefs of Staff recommended to us and agreed to by the president. Who answered the facts. civilian leader? They made the recommendation first. Okay, let's move on to Afghanistan. Uh, can I get into that I'd like to move on to Afghanistan, okay. please. And that's one of the biggest expenditures this country has made in dollars and, more importantly, in lives. We just passed the sad milestone of losing 2,000 U.S. troops there in this war. More than 50 of them were killed this year by the very Afghan forces we are trying to help. Now, we've reached the recruiting goal for Afghan forces. We've degraded al-Qaeda. So tell me, why not leave now? What more can we really accomplish? Is it worth more American lives? We don't want to lose the gains we've gotten. We want to make sure that the Taliban does not come back in and give al-Qaeda a safe haven. We agree with the administration on their 2014 transition. Look, when I think about Afghanistan, I think about the incredible job that our troops have done. You've been there more than the two of us combined. First time I was there in 2002, it was amazing to me what they were facing. When I went to the Argandab Valley in Kandahar before the surge, I sat down with a young private in the 82nd from the Menominee Indian Reservation who would tell me what he did every day, and I was in awe. And to see what they had in front of them, and then to go back there in December, to go throughout Hellman with the Marines to see what they had accomplished, it's nothing short of amazing. What we don't want to do is lose the gains we've gotten. Now, we've disagreed from time to time on a few issues. We would have more likely taken into account the recommendations from our commanders, General Petraeus, Admiral Mullen, on troop levels throughout this year's fighting season. We've been skeptical about negotiations with the Taliban, especially while they're shooting at us. But we want to see the 2014 transition be successful. And that means we want to make sure our commanders have what they need to make sure that it is successful so that this does not once again become a launching pad for terrorists. Vice Martha, President Biden. let's keep our eye on the ball. The reason I've been in and out of Afghanistan and Iraq 20 times. I've been up in the Konar Valley. I've been throughout that whole country, mostly in a helicopter and sometimes in a vehicle. Um, the fact is we went there for one reason, to get those people who killed Americans, Al-Qaeda, We've decimated Al-Qaeda Central. We have eliminated Osama bin Laden. That was our purpose. 
And in fact, in the meantime, what we said we would do, we would help train the Afghan military. It's their responsibility to take over their own security. That's why with 50, 49 of our allies in Afghanistan, we've agreed on a gradual drawdown, so we're out of there by the year 20, in the year 2014. My friend and the governor say it's based on conditions, which means it depends. It does not depend for us. It is the responsibility of the Afghans to take care of their own security. We have trained over 315,000, mostly without incident. There have been more than two dozen cases of green on blue where Americans have been killed. If we do not, if the, if the measures the military has taken do not take hold, we will not go on joint patrols. We will not train in the field. We'll only train in the, uh, in the army bases that exist there. But we are leaving. We are leaving in 2014. Period. And in the process, we're going to be saving over the next 10 years another $800 billion. We've been in this war for over a decade. The obje primary objective is almost completed. Now all we're doing is putting the Kabul government in a position to be able to maintain their own security. It's their responsibility, not America's. What, what conditions could justify staying, Congressman Ryan? We don't want to stay. We want to, look, one of my best friends in Janesville, a reservist, is at a forward operating base in eastern Afghanistan right now. Our wives are best friends. Our daughters are best friends. I want, I want him and all of our troops to come home as soon and safely as possible. We want to make sure that 2014 is successful. That's why we want to make sure that we give our commanders what they say they need to make it successful. We don't want to extend beyond 2014. That's the point we're making. You know, if it was just this, I feel like we would, we would be able to call this a success, but it's not. What we are witnessing as we turn on our television screens these days is the absolute unraveling of the Obama foreign policy. Problems are growing at home, but, job, but problems are growing abroad, but jobs aren't growing here at home. Let me go back to this. He says we're absolutely leaving in 2014. You're saying that's not an absolute, but you won't talk you about why what conditions would justify. Do you know why we say that? Like because we why. don't want to broadcast to our enemies, put a date on your calendar, wait us out, and then come back. But you we agree want to with the sure. timeline. We do, agree. we do agree with the timeline and the transition, but what, we, what, what any administration will do in 2013 is assess the situation to see how best to complete this timeline. We what we will do not want to do in 20. What we do not want to do is give our allies reason to trust us less and our enemies more, in, we don't want to embolden our enemies to hold and wait out for us and then take over the Martha, country. Martha, that's a bizarre That's why we want to make sure. No, that's, that's a bizarre why we want to make sure that this 49 of our allies, hear me, 49 of our allies signed on to this position. And we're reading that they want to 49, 49 of our allies said out in 2014. It's the responsibility of the Afghans. Do we you, have other responsibilities. Do you think this timeline, which is, which is, but we have, we, we have soldiers and Marines, we have Afghan forces murdering our forces over there. The Taliban is, do you think, taking advantage of this timeline? No, look, the Taliban, what we found out, and we, you, you saw it in Iraq, Martha, unless you set a timeline, Baghdad, in the case of Iraq, and and uh, uh, Kabul, in the case of Afghanistan, will not step up. They're happy to let us continue to do the job. International security forces do the job. The only way they step up is say, fellas, we're leaving. We've trained you. Step up. Step up. Let, let, me, let me go That's back. That's the only way it works. Let me go back to the, the surge troops that we put in there. And, and you brought this up, Congressman Ryan. I have talked to a lot of troops. I've talked to senior officers who were concerned that the surge troops were pulled out during the fighting season, and some of them saw that as a political, as a political move. So can you tell me, Vice President Biden, what was the military reason for bringing those surge troops home before the, the fighting season ended? The military reason for bringing those, by the way, when the president announced the surge, you'll remember, Martha, he said the surge will be out by the end of the summer. 
The military said the surge will be out. Nothing political about this. Before the surge occurred, so you be a little straight with me here too. Before the surge occurred, we said they'll be out by the end of the summer. That's what the military said. The reason for that is the military you, follows orders. They, I mean, there. Trust me, there are people sure who are concerned about pulling out. But, there are the people that are system. concerned, but not the Joint Chiefs. That was their recommendation in the Oval Office to the President of the United States of America. I sat there. I'm sure you'll find someone who disagrees with the Pentagon. I'm positive you'll find that within the military. But that's not the case here. And secondly, the reason why the military said that is you cannot wait and have a cliff it takes, you know, months and months and months to draw down forces. Let me, bring some, let me try and illustrate the, the issue here, uh, because I think this can get a little confusing. Um, we've all met with General Allen and General Scaparotti in Afghanistan to talk about fighting seasons. Here's the way it works. The mountain pass is filling with snow. The Taliban and the terrorists and the Akani and the Kedashura come over from Pakistan to fight our men and women. When it fills in with snow, they can't do it. That's what we call fighting seasons. In the warm months, fighting gets really high. In the winter, it goes down. And so when Admiral Mullen and General Petraeus came to Congress and said, if you pull these people out before the fighting season is end, it puts people more at risk. That's the problem. Yes, we drew 22,000 troops down last month, but the remaining troops that are there who still have the same mission to prosecute, counterinsurgency, are doing it with fewer people. That makes them less Why safe. We're sending fewer people out in all these hotspots to do the same job that they were supposed to do a month ago. Because we but turned we took 22,000 people we out turned for them to do it. over to the Afghan troops we trained. No one got pulled out that didn't get filled in by trained Afghan personnel. And he's confl He's, uh, he's conflating two issues. The fighting season that Petraeus was talking about and former a and Admiral Mullen was the fighting season this spring. That's what he was talking about. We did not, we did not pull them out. The calendar works the same every year. <laughs> it does work the same every year. <laughs> and we're spring, not summer, there. fall. <laughs> it's warm or it's not. They're still fighting us. They're still coming over the passes. They're, they're still coming in to Zabul, to Kunar, to all of these areas, but we are sending fewer people to the front to fight them, and that that's makes right, us safe. because Let's, that's the Afghan responsibility. We've <clears throat> trained them. Not in the east. Let's move. Let's move to another war. Not in the east. Well, RC East. RC East. RC East, most dangerous place that's in the why, world. That's why we don't want to send fewer people. That's, to do the that's job. why we should send Americans in to do the job instead of the. You'd rather Americans be going in no, doing the job instead of the we are already train. sending Americans to do the job, no. but fewer of them. That's, that, the that's whole right. We're sending in more Afghans to do the job. Afghans to do the job. Let's move to another war, the civil war in Syria, where there are estimates that more, estimates that more than 25,000, 30,000 people have now been killed. In March of last year, President Obama explained the military action taken in Libya by saying it was in the national interest to go in and prevent further massacres from occurring there. So why doesn't the same logic apply in Syria? It's Vice a different President country. Biden. It's a different country. It is five times as large geographically. It has one-fifth the population, that is Libya, one-fifth the population, five times as large geographically. It's in a part of the world where you're not going to see whatever would come from that war it seep into a regional war. You are in a country that is heavily populated in the midst of the most dangerous area in the world. And in fact, if in fact it blows up and the wrong people gain control, it's going to have impact on the entire region causing potentially regional wars. We are working hand and glove with the Turks, with the Jordanians, with the Saudis, and with all the people in the region attempting to identify the people who deserve the help so that when Assad goes, and he will go, there will be a legitimate government that follows on, not an Al-Qaeda-sponsored government that follows on. And all this loose talk of my friend Governor Romney and the congressman about how we're going to do, we could do so much more in there. What more would they do other than put American boots in the ground? The last thing America needs is to get in another ground 
armed war in the Middle East, requiring tens of thousands, if not well over 100,000 American forces. That, they are the facts. They are the facts. Now, every time the governor is asked about this, he doesn't say anything. He, uh, 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 he goes up with a whole lot of uh, um, verbiage. But when he gets pressed, he says, no, he would not do anything different than we are doing now. Are they proposing putting American troops in the ground, putting American aircraft in the airspace? Is that what they're proposing? If they do, they should speak up and say so. But that's not what they're saying. We are doing it exactly like we need to do to identify those forces who, in fact, will provide for a stable government and not cause a regional Sunni-Shia war when, Basad, when Bashir Assad falls. Congressman Ryan. Nobody is proposing to send troops to Syria, American troops. Now, let me say it this way. How would we do things differently? We wouldn't refer to Bashar Assad as a reformer when he's killing his own civilians with his Russian-provided weapons. We wouldn't be outsourcing our foreign policy to the United Nations, giving Vladimir Putin veto power over our efforts to try and deal with this issue. He's vetoed three of them. Hillary Clinton went to Russia to try and convince them not to do so. They thwarted her efforts. She said they were on the wrong side of history. She was right about that. This is just one more example of how the Russia reset's not working. And so where are we? After international pressure mounted, then President Obama said Bashar Assad should go. It's been over a year. The man has slaughtered tens of thousands of his own people, and more foreign fighters are spilling into this country. So the longer this has gone on, the more people, groups like al-Qaeda are going in. We could have more easily identified the Free Syrian Army, the Freedom Fighters, working with our allies, the Turks, the Qataris, the Saudis, had we had a better plan in place to begin with working through our allies. But no, we waited for Kofi Annan to try and come up with an agreement through the UN. That bought Bashar Assad time. We gave Russia veto power over our efforts through the UN. And meanwhile, about 30,000 Syrians are dead. What would my friend do Differently. If you notice, he never answers the question. No, I would, I, never, we would not be going that, through the UN on all of these things. Think, you don't go through the UN. We are in the process now and have been for months in making sure that help, humanitarian aid, as well as other aid and training is getting to those forces that we believe, the Turks believe, the Jordanians believe, the Saudis believe, are the free forces inside of Syria. That is underway. Our allies were all on the same page, NATO as well as our Arab allies, in terms of trying to get a settlement. That was their idea. We're the ones that said enough. With regard to the reset not working, the fact of the matter is that Russia has a different interest in Syria than we do, and that's not in our interest. What happens if Assad does not fall? Congressman Ryan. What happens to the region? What happens if he hangs on? What happens if he does? Then Iran keeps their greatest ally in the region. He's a sponsor of terrorism. He'll probably continue slaughtering his people. We and the world community will lose our credibility on this. Look, he mentioned the reset. So what would Romney Ryan do about that credibility? Well, we agree with the same red line, actually, they do on chemical weapons, but not putting American troops in other than to secure those chemical weapons. They're right about that. But what we should have done earlier is work with those freedom fighters, those dissidents in Syria. We should not have called Bashar Assad a reformer. And we should, not have, we, we should not have waited for Russia to give us the green light. We should not have waited for Russia to give us the green light at the UN Russia to do something about it. They're, they're still arming the man. Iran and is flying flights over Iraq. And the opposition to help, is being to help, armed. To help Bashar Assad. And by the way, if we had the status of forces agreement that the vice president said he would bet his vice presidency on in Iraq, we probably would have been able to prevent that. But he failed to achieve that as well. Wait, Again, let, let, let me ask you quickly, what's your criteria for intervention? Yeah. In Syria? Worldwide. What is in the national interest of the American people? How about humanitarian What is in the national interest? security of the American people? It's got to be in the strategic national interest of our country. No humanitarian. Each situation will, will, will come up with its own set of circumstances, but putting American troops on the ground, 
that's got to be within the national security interest of the American people. I, I want to so, read. We're, we're that almost means out things of time like here. Embargoes and sanctions and overflights, those are things that don't put American troops on the ground. But if you're talking about putting American troops on the ground, only in our national security interests. I, I want to move on and I want to return home for these last few questions. This debate is indeed historic. We have two Catholic candidates, first time on a stage such as this. And I would like to ask you both to tell me what role your religion has played in your own personal views on abortion. Please talk about how you came to that decision. Talk about how your religion played a part in that. And please, this is such an emotional issue for so many people sure. in this country. Please talk personally about this, if you could. Congressman Ryan. <clears throat> I don't see how a person can separate their public life from their private life or from their faith. Our faith informs us in everything we do. My faith informs me about how to take care of the vulnerable, about how to make sure that people have a chance in life. Now, you want to ask basically why I'm pro-life? It's not simply because of my Catholic faith. That's a factor, of course. But it's also because of reason and science. You know, I think about 10 and a half years ago, my wife Jana and I went to Mercy Hospital in Janesville, where I was born, for our seven-week ultrasound for our firstborn child. And we saw that heartbeat. Our little baby was in the shape of a bean. And to this day, we have nicknamed our firstborn child, Liza, Bean. Now, I believe that life begins at conception. That's why, those are the reasons why I'm pro-life. Now, I understand this is a difficult issue, and I respect people who don't agree with me on this, but the policy of a Romney administration will be to oppose abortion with the exceptions for rape, incest, and life of the mother. What troubles me more is how this administration has handled all of these issues. Look at what they're doing through Obamacare with respect to assaulting the religious liberties of this country. They're infringing upon our first freedom, the freedom of religion, by infringing on Catholic charities, Catholic churches, Catholic hospitals. Our church should not have to sue our federal government to maintain their religious liberties. And with respect to abortion, the Democratic Party used to say they wanted to be safe, legal, and rare. Now, they support it without restriction and with taxpayer funding. Taxpayer funding in Obamacare, taxpayer funding with foreign aid. The vice president himself went to China and said that he sympathized or wouldn't second guess their one-child policy of forced abortions and sterilizations. That, to me, is pretty extreme. Vice President Biden. My religion uh, defines who I am. And uh, I've been a practicing Catholic my whole life. Um, and uh, it has particularly informed my social doctrine. Catholic social doctrine talks about taking care of those who, uh, who uh, can't take care of themselves, uh, people who need help. Um, with, regard to, um, with regard to abortion, I accept my church's position on abortion as a, what we call, de fide doctrine. Life begins at conception. That's the church's judgment. I accept it in my personal life but I refuse to impose it on equally devout Christians and Muslims and Jews. And uh, I just refuse to impose that on others, unlike my friend here, the, the Congressman. Uh, I, uh, I do not believe that, um, uh, that we have a right to tell other people that women, they, they can't control their body. It's a decision between them and their doctor. In my view, in the Supreme Court, I'm not gonna interfere with that. Um, with regard to the assault on the Catholic Church, let me make it absolutely clear. No religious institution, Catholic or otherwise, including Catholic social services, Georgetown Hospital, Mercy Hospital, any hospital, none has to either refer for contraception, none has to pay for contraception, none has to be a vehicle to get contraception in any insurance policy they provide. That is a fact. That is a fact. Now, with regard to the way in which the, we differ, uh, uh, my friend says uh, that um, 
he, uh, um, well, I guess he accepts Governor Romney's position now because in the past uh, he has argued that um, uh, there was, uh, there's rape, enforceable rape. He's argued that in the case of rape or incest, uh, it was still, it would be a crime to engage in having an abortion. I just fundamentally disagree with my friend. Congressman Ryan. All I'm saying is if you believe that life begins at conception, that therefore doesn't change the definition of life. That's a principle. The policy of a Romney administration is to oppose abortion with exceptions for rape, incest, and life of the mother. Now, I've got to take issue with the Catholic Church and religious liberty. You have. If they, the if they agree Catholic with you, then why would, they keep, why would they keep suing you? It's a distinction without a difference. I, I, I want to go back to the abortion question here. If the Romney Ryan ticket is elected, should those who believe that abortion should remain legal be worried? We don't think that unelected judges should make this decision that people through their elected representatives in reaching a consensus in society through the democratic process should make this determination. The court, the next president will get one or two Supreme Court nominees. That's how close Roe v. Wade is. Just ask yourself, with Robert Bork being the chief advisor on the court for, for Mr. Romney, who do you think he's likely to appoint? Do you think he's likely to appoint someone like Scalia or someone else on the court far right that would outlaw, Planned Parenthood, excuse me, outlaw abortion? I suspect that would happen. I guarantee you that will not happen. We pick two people. We pick people who are open-minded. They've been good justices. So keep an eye on the Supreme Court. Was there a litmus test on them? There was no litmus test. We picked people who had an open mind, did not come with an agenda. I'm, I'm going to move on to this closing question because we are running out of time. Certainly know, and you've said it here tonight, that the two of you respect our troops enormously. Your son has served, and perhaps someday your children will serve as well. I recently spoke to a highly decorated soldier who said that this presidential campaign has left him dismayed. He told me, quote, the ads are so negative and they are all tearing down each other rather than building up the country. What would you say to that American hero about this campaign? And at the end of the day, are you ever embarrassed by the tone? Vice President Biden. Uh I would say to him the same thing I say to my son who did serve a year in Iraq, that uh, we only have one truly sacred obligation as a government. That's to equip those we send into harm's way and care for those who come home. That's the only sacred obligation we have. Everything else falls behind that. I would also tell him that uh, the fact that uh, um, he, this decorated soldier you talked about, uh, fought for his country, that that should be honored. He should not be thrown into a category of the 47% who don't pay their taxes while he was out there fighting and not having to pay taxes and somehow not taking responsibility. I would also tell him that there are things that have occurred in this campaign and occur in every campaign that I'm sure both of us regret anyone having said, particularly in these these, these special new groups that can go out there, raise all the money they want, not have to identify themselves and say the most scurrilous things about the other candidate. It's, it's, it's an abomination. But the bottom line here is I'd ask uh, that hero you reference to take a look at whether or not Governor Romney or President Obama has the conviction to help lift up the middle class restore them to where they were before this great recession hit and they got wiped out, or whether or not he's going to continue to focus on taking care of only the very wealthy, not asking them to make pay any part of the deal to bring, the, bring back the middle class, the economy of this country. I would ask him to take a look at whether the president of the United States has acted wisely in the use of force and whether or not the slipshod comments being made by my my friend, or by Governor Romney, uh, serve, uh, serve our interests very well. Um, but uh, there are things that have been said in campaigns that I, uh, I find uh, not very appealing. Congressman Ryan. First of all, I'd thank him to his service to our country. 
Second of all, I'd say we are not going to impose these devastating cuts on our military, which compromises their mission and their safety. And then I would say you have a president who ran for president four years ago promising hope and change, who has now turned his campaign into attack, blame, and defame. You see, if you don't have a good record to run on, then you paint your opponent as someone to run from. That was what President Obama said in 2008. It's what he's doing right now. Look at all the string of broken promises. If you like your health care plan, you can keep it. Try telling that to the 20 million people who are projected to lose their health insurance if Obamacare goes through, or the 7.4 million, 7 million seniors who are going to lose it. Or remember when he said this, I guarantee if you make less than $250,000, your taxes won't go up. Of the 21 tax increases in Obamacare, 12 of them hit the middle class. Or remember when he said health insurance premiums will go down $2,500 per family per year, they've gone up $3,000 and they're expected to go up another $2,400. Or remember when he said, I promise by the end of my first term, I'll cut the deficit in half in four years. We've had four budgets, $4 trillion deficits. A debt crisis is coming. We can't keep spending and borrowing like this. We can't keep spending money we don't have. Leaders run to problems to fix problems. President Obama has not even put a credible plan on the table in any of his four years to deal with this debt crisis. I passed two budgets to deal with this. Mitt Romney's put ideas on the table. We've got to tackle this debt crisis before it tackles us. The president likes to say he has a plan. He gave a speech. We asked his budget office, can we see the plan? They sent us to the press secretary. He gave us a copy of the speech. We asked the congressional budget office, tell us what President Obama's plan is to prevent a debt crisis. They said, it's a speech. We can't estimate speeches. You see, that's what we get in this administration, speeches. But we're not getting leadership. Mitt Romney is uniquely qualified to fix these problems. His lifetime of experience, his proven track record of bipartisanship. And what do we have from the president? He broke his big promise to bring people together to solve the country's biggest problems. And what I would tell him is we don't president, have to settle for this. I, I, we can I, do better than this. I hope I'll get equal time. I, I, you, you will get just a few minutes here, a few seconds, really. The two budgets the Congress has introduced have eviscerated all the things that the middle class cares about. It has knocked 19, will knock 19 million people off of Medicare. It will kick 200,000 children off of early education. It will eliminate the tax credit people have to be able to send their children to college. It cuts education by $450 billion. It, 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 does, uh, it does virtually nothing except continue to increase the tax cuts for the very wealthy. And, you know, we've had enough of this. My, the idea that he's so concerned about these deficits, as I pointed out, he voted to put two wars in a credit card. He did. We're, we're, going, to the, we're going to the closing but, statements but, but, in a minute. A second. I, I, you're going to have your not closing statements. Not raising taxes is not cutting taxes. And by the way, our budget, we, we have not spending raised spending by three 3% a year instead of 4.5% like they propose. Let, so not spending let, let me, more let money as much as they say is not a spending cut. here just for a minute. And I want to talk to you very briefly before we go to closing statements about your own personal character. If you were elected, what could you both give to this country as a man, as a human being, that no one else could? Honesty? Well, no one else could. There are plenty of fine people who could lead this country. But what you need are people who, when they say they're going to do something, they go do it. What you need are when people see problems, they offer solutions to fix those problems. We're not getting that. Look. We can grow this economy faster. That's what our five-point plan for a stronger middle class is all about. It's about getting 12 million jobs, higher take-home pay, getting people out of poverty into the middle class. That means going with proven pro-growth policies that we know work to get people back to work, putting ideas on the table, working with Democrats. That Vice, actually works sometimes. Vice President, and then could we get to that, to that issue of what you could bring as a man, a human being? And I... Really, I'm going to keep you to about 15 seconds here. Well, uh, he gets 40, I get 15. He didn't That's have okay. 40. That's he didn't right. have 40. Then let me tell you, uh, I, uh, my, uh, my record stands for itself. I never say anything I don't mean. Everybody knows whatever I say, I do. And uh, my whole life has been devoted to leveling the playing field for middle class people, giving them an even break, treating Main Street and Wall Street the same, holding them the same responsibility. Look at my record. It's been all about the middle class. They're the people who grow this country. We think you grow this country from the middle out, 
not from the top down. Okay, we now turn to the candidates for their closing statements. Thank you, gentlemen. And that coin toss again has Vice President Biden starting with the closing well, statement. Well, let me, let me say at the outset that uh, I want to thank you, Martha, for doing this uh, and uh, Senator College. Uh, uh, the fact is that um, we're in a situation where uh, we inherited a god awful circumstance. Uh, um, people are in real trouble. We acted to move to uh, bring relief to the people who need the most help now. And, uh, and in the process, uh, we, uh, in case you haven't noticed, we have strong disagreements, but I've, you probably detected my uh, frustration with their attitude about the, the American people. My friend says that 30% of the American people are takers. Uh, they, Romney points out 47% of the people uh, uh, won't take responsibility. He's talking about my mother and father. He's talking about the places I grew up in, my neighbors in Scranton and Claymont. He's talking about, uh, he's talking about the people that uh, built this country. All they're looking for, Martha, all they're looking for is an even shot. Whenever you give them the shot, they've done it. They've done it. Whenever you've leveled the playing field, they've been able to move. And they want a little bit of peace of mind. And the president and I are not going to rest until that playing field is leveled, they in fact have a clear shot and they have peace of mind until they can turn to their kid and say with a degree of confidence, honey, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. That's what this is all about. Congressman Ryan. I want to thank you as well, Martha. Danville, Kentucky, Center College. And I want to thank you, Joe. It's been an honor to engage in this critical debate. We face a very big choice. What kind of country are we going to be? What kind of country are we going to give our kids? President Obama, he had his chance. He made his choices. His economic agenda, more spending, more borrowing, higher taxes, a government takeover of health care. It's not working. It's failed to create the jobs we need. 23 million Americans are struggling for work today. 15% of Americans are in poverty. This is not what a real recovery looks like. You deserve better. Mitt Romney and I want to earn your support. We're offering real reforms for a real recovery for every American. Mitt Romney, his experience, his ideas, his solutions, is uniquely qualified to get this job done. At a time when we have a jobs crisis in America, wouldn't it be nice to have a job creator in the White House? The choice is clear. A stagnant economy that promotes more government dependency, or a dynamic growing economy that promotes opportunity and jobs. Mitt Romney and I will not duck the tough issues. And we will not blame others for the next four years. We will take responsibility. And we will not try to replace our founding principles. We will reapply our founding principles. The choice is clear. And the choice rests with you. And we ask you for your vote. Thank you. And thank you both again. Thank you thank very you. much. This concludes the vice presidential debate. Please tune in next Tuesday for the second presidential debate at Hofstra University in New York. I'm Martha Raddatz of ABC News. I do hope all of you go to the polls. Have a good evening. Good evening from Hofstra University in Hempstead, New York. I'm Candy Crowley from CNN State of the Union. We are here for the second presidential debate at Town Hall, sponsored by the Commission on Presidential Debates. The Gallup organization chose 82 uncommitted voters from the New York area. Their questions will drive the night. My goal is to give the conversation direction and to ensure questions get answered. The questions are known to me and my team only. Neither the commission nor the candidates have seen them. I hope to get to as many questions as possible, and because I am the optimistic sort, I'm sure the candidates will oblige by keeping their answers concise and on point. Each candidate has as much as two minutes to respond to a common question, and there will be a two-minute follow-up. The audience here in the hall has agreed to be polite and attentive, no cheering or booing or outbursts of any sort. We will set aside that agreement just this once to welcome President Barack Obama and Governor Mitt Romney.
Gentlemen, thank you both for joining us here tonight. We have a lot of folks who have been waiting all day to talk to you, so I want to get right to it. Uh, Governor Romney, as you know, you won the coin toss, so the first question will go to you. And I want to turn to a first-time voter, uh, Jeremy Epstein, who has a question for you. Mr. President, Governor Romney, as a 20-year-old college student, all I hear from professors, neighbors, and others is that when I graduate, I will have little chance to get employment. Can, what can you say to reassure me, but more importantly, my parents, that I will be able to sufficiently support myself after I graduate? Thank you, Jeremy. I appreciate your, your question, and, and thank you for being here this evening, and to all of those from Nassau County here that have come, thank you for your time. Thank you to Hofstra University and to Candy Crowley for organizing and leading this, uh, this event. Thank you, Mr. President, also for being part of this, uh, this debate. Your question, your question is one that's being asked by college kids all over this country. I was in Pennsylvania with someone who just graduated. This was in Philadelphia, and she said, I've, I've got my degree, I can't find a job. I've got three part-time jobs. They're just barely enough to pay for my food and pay for an apartment. I can't begin to pay back my student loans. So what we have to do is two things. We have to make sure that we make it easier for kids to afford college, and also make sure that when they get out of college, there's a job. When I was governor of Massachusetts to get a high school degree, you had to pass an exam. If you graduated in the top quarter of your class, we gave you a John and Abigail Adams scholarship, four years tuition free to the college of your choice in Massachusetts. It's a public institution. I want to make sure we keep our Pell Grant program growing. We're also going to have our loan program so that people are able to afford school. But the key thing is to make sure you can get a job when you get out of school. And what's happened over the last four years has been very, very hard for America's young people. I want you to be able to get a job. I know what it takes to get this economy going. With half of college kids graduating this year without a college, excuse me, without a job, and without a college level job, that's just unacceptable. And likewise, you've got more and more debt on your back. So more debt and less jobs. I'm going to change that. I know what it takes to create good jobs again. I know what it takes to make sure that you have the kind of opportunity you deserve. And kids across this country are going to recognize we're bringing back an economy. It's not going to be like the last four years. The middle class has been crushed over the last four years. And jobs have been too scarce. I know what it takes to bring them back. And I'm going to do that and make sure when you graduate. When do you graduate? 2014. When you come out in 2014, I presume I'm going to be president. I'm going to make sure you get a job. <laughs> Thanks, Jeremy. Yeah, you bet. <laughs> Mr. President. Jeremy, first of all, your future is bright. And the fact that you're making an investment in higher education is critical, not just to you, but to the entire nation. Now, the most important thing we can do is to make sure that we are creating jobs in this country, but not just jobs, good paying jobs, ones that can support a family. And what I want to do is build on the five million jobs that we've created over the last 30 months in the private sector alone. And there are a bunch of things that we can do to make sure your future is bright. Number one. I want to build manufacturing jobs in this country again. You know, when Governor Romney said we should let Detroit go bankrupt, I said we're going to bet on American workers and the American auto industry, and it's come surging back. I want to do that in industries, not just in Detroit, but all across the country. And that means we change our tax code, so we're giving incentives to companies that are investing here in the United States and creating jobs here. It also means we're helping them and small businesses to export all around the world in new markets. Number two, we've got to make sure that we have the best education system in the world. And the fact that you're going to college is great, but I want everybody to get a great education. And we've worked hard to make sure that student loans are available for folks like you. But I also want to make sure that community colleges are offering slots for workers to get retrained for the jobs that are out there right now and the jobs of the future. Number three, we've got to control our own energy. You know, not only oil and natural gas, which we've been investing in, but also we've got to make sure we're building the energy source of the future. Not just thinking about next year, but 10 years from now, 20 years from now. That's why we invest in solar and wind and biofuels, energy efficient cars. We've got to reduce our deficit, but we've got to do it in a balanced way. Asking the wealthy to pay a little bit more along with cuts so that we can invest in education like yours. And let's take the money that we've been spending on war over the last decade to rebuild America roads, bridges, schools. We do those things. Not only is your future going to be bright, but America's future is going to be bright as well. Let me ask you for a more uh, immediate answer, uh, beginning with Mr. Romley. Just quickly, what, what 
can you do? We're looking at a situation where 40% of the unemployed have been unemployed for six months or more. They don't have the two years that Jeremy has. What about those long-term unemployed who need a job right now? Well, what you're seeing in this country is 23 million people struggling to find a job. And a lot of them, as you say, Candy, have been out of work for a long, long, long time. The president's policies have been uh, exercised over the last four years, and they haven't put Americans back to work. We have fewer people working today than we had when the president took office. If the, un the unemployment rate was 7.8% when he took office, it's 7.8% now. But if you calculated that unemployment rate, taking back the people who dropped out of the workforce, it would be 10.7%. We have not made the progress we need to make to put people back to work. That's why I put out a five-point plan that gets America 12 million new jobs in four years and rising take-home pay. It's going to help Jeremy get a job when he comes out of school. It's going to help people across the country that are unemployed right now. And one thing that the, the president said, which I want to make sure that we understand, he, he said that I said we should take Detroit bankrupt. And, and that's right. My plan was to have the company go through bankruptcy like 7-Eleven did at Macy's and, and uh, at, at Continental Airlines and come out stronger. And, and I know he keeps saying, you wanted to take Detroit bankrupt. Well, the president took Detroit bankrupt. You took General Motors bankrupt. You took Chrysler bankrupt. So when you say that I wanted to take the auto industry bankrupt, you actually did. And, and I think it's important to know that, that that was a process that was necessary to get those companies back on their feet so they could start hiring more people. That was precisely what I recommended and ultimately what happened. Let me, let me give the president a chance to go ahead. Candy, what Governor Romney said just isn't true. He wanted to take them into bankruptcy without providing them any way to stay open. And we would have lost a million jobs. And that, don't take my word for it, take the executives at GM and Chrysler, some of whom were Republicans, may even support Governor Romney. But they'll tell you his prescription wasn't going to work. And Governor Romney says he's got a five-point plan. Governor Romney doesn't have a five-point plan. He has a one-point plan. And that plan is to make sure that folks at the top play by a different set of rules. That's been his philosophy in the private sector. That's been his philosophy as governor. That's been his philosophy as a presidential candidate. You can make a lot of money and pay lower tax rates than somebody who makes a lot less. You can ship jobs overseas and get tax breaks for it. You can invest in a company, bankrupt it, lay off the workers, strip away their pensions, and you still make money. That's exactly the philosophy that we've seen in place for the last decade. That's what's been squeezing middle class families. And we have fought back for four years to get out of that mess. And the last thing we need to do is to go back to the very same policies that got us there. Mr. President, the next question is going to be for you here. And Mr. Romney, uh, Governor Romney, there'll be plenty of chances here to go on, but that, I want to, we Detroit, have all these folks, Detroit I will answer, let you absolutely. That Detroit answer and the rest I, of the answer, I, way I, off the mark. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll, you certainly will have lots of time here coming up. I, uh, because I want to move you on to something that sort of connected to cars here and, and go over, and we want to get a question from Philip Tercola. Your energy secretary, Stephen Chu, has now been on record three times stating it's not policy of his department to help lower gas prices. Do you agree with Secretary Chu that this is not the job of the energy department? The most important thing we can do is to make sure we control our own energy. So here's what I've done since I've been president. We have increased oil production to the highest levels in 16 years. Natural gas production is the highest it's been in decades. We have seen increases in coal production and coal employment. But what I've also said is we can't just produce traditional sources of energy. We've also got to look to the future. That's why we doubled fuel efficiency standards on cars. That means that in the middle of the next decade, any car you buy, you're going to end up going twice as far on a gallon of gas. That's why we've doubled clean energy production, like wind and solar and biofuels. And all these things have contributed to us lowering our oil imports to the lowest levels in 16 years. Now, I want to build on that. And that means, yes, we still continue to open up new areas for drilling. We continue to make it a priority for us to go after natural gas. We've got potentially 
600,000 jobs and 100 years worth of energy right beneath our feet with natural gas. And we can do it in an environmentally sound way. But we've also got to continue to figure out how we have efficient energy because ultimately that's how we're going to reduce demand and that's what's going to keep gas prices lower. Now, Governor Romney will say he's got an all the above plan, but basically his plan is to let the oil companies write the energy policies. So he's got the oil and gas part, but he doesn't have the clean energy part. And if we are only thinking about tomorrow or the next day and not thinking about 10 years from now, we're not going to control our own economic future. Because China, Germany, they're making these investments. And I'm not going to cede those jobs of the future to those countries, I expect those new energy sources to be built right here in the United States. That's going to help Jeremy get a job. It's also going to make sure uh, that you're not paying as much for gas. Governor, on the subject of gas prices. Well, let's look at the president's policies, all right, as opposed to the rhetoric, because we've had four years of policies being played out. And the president's right in terms of the additional oil production, but none of it came on federal land. As a matter of fact, oil production is down 14 percent this year on federal land, and gas production is down 9 percent. Why? Because the president cut in half the number of licenses and permits for drilling on federal lands and in federal waters. So where did the increase come from? Well, a lot of it came from the Bakken Range in North Dakota. What was his participation there? The administration brought a criminal action against the people drilling up there for oil, this massive new resource we have. And what was the cause? 20 or 25 birds were killed, and they brought out a Migratory Bird Act to go after them on a criminal basis. Look, I want to make sure we use our oil, our coal, our gas, our nuclear, our renewables. I believe very much in our renewable capabilities. Ethanol, wind, solar will be an important part of our energy mix. But what we don't need is to have the president keeping us from taking advantage of oil, coal, and gas. This has not been Mr. Oil or Mr. Gas or Mr. Coal. Talk to the people that are working in those industries. I was in coal country. People grab my arms and say, please, save my job. The head of the EPA said, you can't build a coal plant. You'll virtually, it's virtually impossible given our regulations. When the president ran for office, he said, if you build a coal plant, you can go ahead, but you'll go bankrupt. That's not the right course for America. Let's take advantage of the energy resources we have, as well as the energy sources for the future. And if we do that, if we do what I'm planning on doing, which is getting us energy independent, North America energy independence within eight years, you're going to see manufacturing jobs come back because our energy is low cost. They're already beginning to come back because of our abundant energy. I'll get America and North America energy independent. I'll do it by more drilling, more permits and licenses. We're going to bring that pipeline in from Canada. How in the world the president said no to that pipeline, I will never know. This is about bringing good jobs back for the middle class of America, and that's what I'm going to do. Mr. President, let me just see if I can move you to the, the gist of this question, which is, are we looking at the new normal? I can tell you that tomorrow morning, a lot of people in Hampton will wake up and fill up, and they will find that the price of gas is over $4 a gallon. Is it with the, within the purview of the government to bring those prices down, or are we looking at the new normal? Candy, there's no doubt that world demand's gone up, but our production is going up, and we're using oil more efficiently. And very little of what Governor Romney just said is true. We've opened up public lands. We're actually drilling more on public lands than in the previous administration. And my, the previous president was an oil man. And natural gas isn't just appearing magically, we're encouraging it and working with the industry. And when I hear Governor Romney say he's a big coal guy, I mean, keep in mind when, Governor, when you were Ma Governor of Massachusetts, you stood in front of a coal plant and pointed at it and said, this plant kills, and took great pride in shutting it down. And now suddenly you're a big champion of coal. So what I've tried to do is be consistent. With respect to something like coal, we made the largest investment in clean coal technology to make sure that even as we're producing more coal, we're producing it cleaner and smarter. Same thing with oil, same thing with natural gas. And the proof is our oil imports are down to the lowest levels in 20 years. Oil production is up, natural gas production is up, 
and most importantly, we're also starting to build cars that are more efficient. And that's creating jobs. That means those cars can be exported because that's the demand around the world. And it also means that it'll save money in your pocketbook. That's the strategy you need on all of the above strategy, and that's what we're going to do in the next four years. But that's not what you've done in the last four years. That's the problem. Sure. In the last four years, you cut permits and licenses on federal land and federal waters in half. Not true, Governor Romney. So how much did you cut it's them not by? Not true. By how much did you cut them by then? Uh, Governor, we have actually produced more oil. No, no. How much did you cut licenses and permits on federal Governor, land and federal waters? Governor Romney, here's what we did. There were a whole bunch of oil companies. I had a question, and the question you, was, how much want, did you cut them you by? You want me to answer How much question? did you cut them I'm by? Ha I'm happy to answer the question. All right, and it is? Here's what happened. You had a whole bunch of oil companies who had leases on public lands that they weren't using. So what we said was, you can't just sit on this for 10, 20, 30 years, decide when you want to drill, when you want to produce, when it's most profitable for you. These are public lands. So if you want to drill on public lands, you use it or you lose it. Okay, now and so what we did was take away those leases, and we are now reletting them so that we can and, actually make and a profit. And production on, private, on government and lands production is, is down. No, it is Production on government land of oil is down 14 percent. And production on well, gas is, is down 9 percent. It's just I, not true. It's absolutely true. Look, there's no question but that the people recognize that we have not produced more oil time, and gas on federal lands and in federal waters. And coal... Coal production is not up. Coal jobs are not up. I was just at a coal facility where some 1,200 people lost their jobs. The right course for America is to have a true all-of-the-above policy. I don't think anyone really believes that you're a person who's going to be pushing for oil and gas and coal. You'll get your chance in a moment. I'm still speaking. Well, My, and the Governor, answer is I don't believe people think that's the case question, because I'm I'm, I'm, that wasn't a question. Okay. That was Go a ahead. statement. I don't think the American people believe that. I will fight for oil, coal, and natural gas. And the proof... The proof of whether a strategy is working or not is what the price is that you're paying at the pump. If you're paying less than you paid a year or two ago, why then the strategy is working. But you're paying more. When the president took office, the price of gasoline here in Nassau County was about a buck eighty-six a gallon. Now it's four bucks a gallon. Price of electricity is up. If the president's energy policies are working, you're going to see the cost of energy come down. I will fight to create more energy in this country to get America energy secure. And part of that is bringing in a pipeline of oil from Canada, taking advantage of the oil and coal we have here, drilling offshore in Alaska, drilling offshore in Virginia where the Let people want it. Those things will get us the energy we need. Mr. President, could you address, because we did finally get to gas prices here, could you address um, what the governor said, which is if your energy policy was working, the price of gasoline would not be four dollars a gallon. Well, here. Think, about what the governor, think about what the governor just said. He said, when I took office, the price of gasoline was 180, 186. Why is that? Because the economy was on the verge of collapse. Because we were about to go through the worst recession since the Great Depression. As a consequence of some of the same policies the governor Romney is now promoting. So, it's conceivable that Governor Romney could bring down gas prices because with his policies, we might be back in that same mess. What I want to do is to create an economy that is strong and at the same time produce energy. And with respect to this pipeline that Governor Romney keeps on talking about, we've, create, we've built enough pipeline to wrap around the entire earth once. So I'm all for pipelines. I'm all for oil production. What I'm not for is us ignoring the other half of the equation. So, for example, on wind energy, when Governor Romney says these are imaginary jobs, when you've got thousands of people right now in Iowa, right now in Colorado, who are working, creating wind power with good-paying manufacturing jobs, and the Republican senator in, that, in Iowa is all for it, providing tax credits to help this uh, work, and Governor Romney says, I'm opposed. I'd get rid of it. That's not an energy strategy for the future. And we need to win that future. And Mr. I intend president, to win it as President of the United States. I got to, I got to move you no, along. He, he and the, the next first, question he is actually for got, you. He actually got the first question, so I get the last question, it, uh, last answer on actually that Actually, in the follow-up, it doesn't quite work uh, like that. Actually, but I'm going to give you a, a chance here. I promise you I'm going to. And the next question is for you. So if you want to 
you know, continue on. I, but I don't want to leave all these Candy, guys sitting here. Candy, I don't have a policy of of stopping wind jobs in Iowa, and that they're not uh, phantom jobs, they're real jobs. Okay. I appreciate wind jobs in Iowa and across our country. I appreciate the jobs in coal and oil and gas. I'm gonna make You're sure okay. that taking Thank advantage you, of Governor. our energy resources will bring back manufacturing to America. We're gonna get through a, a very aggressive energy policy, three and a half million more jobs in this country. It's critical to our future. Candy, it's we're okay. gonna move I'm, you I'm along used, to I'm used taxes. To being interrupted. All right, we're you know, gonna move you both along yeah. to taxes over here and all these folks that have been waiting. Uh, Governor, this question is for you. It comes from Mary Polano. Polano, sorry. Um, Governor Romney, um, you have stated that if you're elected president, uh, you would plan to reduce the tax rates for all the tax brackets and that you would work with the Congress to eliminate some deductions in order to make up for the loss in revenue. Um, concerning the, these various deductions, the mortgage deduction, the uh, charitable deductions, the child tax credit, and also the, um, oh, what's that other credit? <laughs> You're doing great. <laughs> oh, I remember. The education credits, which are important to me because I have children in college. <laughs> uh, what would be your position on those things, which are important to the middle class? Thank you very much. And, and let me tell you, you, you're absolutely right about part of that, which is I want to bring the rates down, I want to simplify the tax code, and I want to get middle income taxpayers to have lower taxes. And, and the reason I want middle-income taxpayers to have lower taxes is because middle-income taxpayers have been buried over the past four years. You've seen, as middle-income people in this country, incomes go down $4,300 a family, even as gasoline prices have gone up $2,000. Health insurance premiums up $2,500. Food prices up. Utility prices up. The middle-income families in America have been crushed over the last four years. So I want to get some relief to middle-income families. That's part, that's part one. Now, how about deductions? Because I'm going to bring rates down across the board for everybody, but I'm going to limit deductions and exemptions and credits, particularly for people at the high end, because I am not going to have people at the high end pay less than they're paying now. The top 5% of taxpayers will continue to pay 60% of the income tax the nation collects. So that'll stay the same. Middle income people are gonna get a tax break. And so in terms of bringing down deductions, one way of doing that would be to say everybody gets, I'll pick a number, $25,000 of deductions and credits. And you can decide which ones to use. Your home mortgage interest deduction, charity, child tax credit and so forth, you can use those as part of filling that bucket, if you will, of deductions. But your rate comes down and the burden also comes down on you for one more reason, and that is every middle-income taxpayer no longer will pay any tax on interest, dividends, or capital gains. No tax on your savings. That makes life a lot easier. If you're getting interest from a bank, if you're getting uh, a statement from a, a mutual fund, or any other kind of investments you have, you don't have to worry about filing taxes on that because there'll be no taxes for anybody making $200,000 a year and less on your interest, dividends, and capital gains. Why am I lowering taxes on the middle class? Because under the last four years, they've been buried. And I want to help people in the middle class. And I will not, I will not, under any circumstances, reduce the share that's being paid by the highest income taxpayers. And I will not, under any circumstances, increase taxes on the middle class. The president's spending, the president's borrowing, will cause this nation to have to raise taxes on the American people, not just at the high end. A recent study has shown the people in the middle class will see $4,000 a year higher taxes as a result of the spending and borrowing of this administration. I will not let that happen. I'll get us on track to a balanced budget, and I'm going to reduce the tax burden on middle-income families. And what's that going to do? It's going to help those families, and it's going to create incentives to start growing jobs again in this country. Thanks, Governor. My philosophy on taxes has been simple, and that is I want to give middle class families and folks who are striving to get in the middle class some relief because they have been hit hard over the last decade, over the last 15, over the last 20 years. So four years ago, I stood on a stage just like this one. Actually, it was at the town hall, and I said I would cut taxes for middle class families, and that's what I've done by $3,600. I said I would cut taxes for small businesses who are the drivers and engines 
of growth. And we've cut them 18 times. And I want to continue those tax cuts for middle class families and for small businesses. But what I've also said is if we're serious about reducing the deficit, if this is genuinely a moral obligation to the next generation, then in addition to some tough spending cuts, we've also got to make sure that the wealthy do a little bit more. So what I've said is your first $250,000 worth of income, no change. And that means 98% of American families, 97% of small businesses, they will not see a tax increase. I'm ready to sign that bill right now. The only reason it's not happening is because Governor Romney's allies in Congress have held the 98% hostage because they want tax breaks for the top 2%. But what I've also said is for above 250000 we can go back to the tax rates we had when Bill Clinton was president. We created 23 million new jobs. That's part of what took us from deficits to surplus. It will be good for our economy, and it will be good for job creation. Now, Governor Romney has a different philosophy. He was on 60 Minutes just two weeks ago, and he was asked, is it fair for somebody like you making $20 million a year to pay a lower tax rate than a nurse or a bus driver, somebody making $50,000 a year? And he said, yes, I think that's fair. Not only that, he said, I think that's what grows the economy. Well, I fundamentally disagree with that. I think what grows the economy is when you get that tax credit that we put in place for your kids going to college. I think that grows the economy. I think what grows the economy is when we make sure small businesses are getting a tax credit for hiring veterans who fought for our country. That grows our economy. So we just have a different theory. And when Governor Romney stands here after a year of campaigning, when during a Republican primary he stood on stage and said, I'm going to give tax cuts. He didn't say tax rate cuts. He said tax cuts to everybody, including the top 1%. You should believe him because that's been his history. And that's exactly the kind of top-down economics that is not going to work if we want a strong middle class and an economy that's thriving for everybody. Governor Romney, I'm sure you've got a reply there. <laughs> You're absolutely right. You heard what I said about my tax plan. The top 5% will continue to pay 60% as they do today. I'm not looking to cut taxes for wealthy people. I am looking to cut taxes for middle-income people. And why do I want to bring rates down? and at the same time lower exemptions and deductions, particularly for people at the high end? Because if you bring rates down, it makes it easier for small business to keep more of their capital and hire people. And for me, this is about jobs. I want to get America's economy going again. 54% of America's workers work in businesses that are taxed as individuals. So when you bring those rates down, those small businesses are able to keep more money and hire more people. For me, I look at what's happened in the last four years and say, this has been a disappointment. We can do better than this. We don't have to settle for how many months? 43 months with unemployment above 8%. 23 million Americans struggling to find a good job right now. There are 3.5 million more women living in poverty today than when the president took office. We don't have to live like this. We can get this economy going again. My five-point plan does it. Energy independence for North America in five years, opening up more trade, particularly in Latin America, cracking down on China when they cheat, getting us to a balanced budget, fixing our training programs for our workers, and finally, championing small business. I want to help small businesses grow and thrive. I know how to make that happen. I spent my life in the private sector. I know why jobs come and why they go. And they're going now because of the policies of this administration. Governor, let me ask the president something about what you just said. Uh, the, the governor says that he is not going to allow uh, the top 5%, I believe is what he said, to have a tax cut, that it will all even out, that what he wants to do is give that tax cut to the middle class. Settled? No, it's not settled. <laughs> Look, uh, the cost of lowering rates for everybody across the board, 20 percent, along with what he also wants to do in terms of eliminating the estate tax, along what he wants to do in terms of corporate uh, changes in the tax code, it costs about $5 trillion. Governor Romney then also wants to spend $2 trillion on additional military programs, even though the military is not asking for them. 
That's $7 trillion. He also wants to continue the Bush tax cuts for the wealthiest Americans. That's another trillion dollars. That's $8 trillion. Now, what he says is he's going to make sure that this doesn't add to the deficit, and he's going to cut middle class taxes. But when he's asked, how are you going to do it? Which deductions? Which loopholes are you going to close? He can't tell you. The, the fact that he only has to pay 14% on his taxes when a lot of you are paying much higher, you know, he's already taken that off the board. Capital gains are going to continue to be at a low rate, so we, we're not going to get money that way. We haven't heard from the governor any specifics beyond Big Bird and eliminating funding for Planned Parenthood in terms of how he pays for that. Now, Governor Romney was a very successful investor. If somebody came to you, Governor, with a plan that said, here, I want to spend seven or eight trillion dollars, and it, we're going to pay for it, but we can't tell you until maybe after the election how we're going to do it, you wouldn't have taken such a sketchy deal, and neither should you, the American people, because the math doesn't add up. And, and what's at stake here is one of two things, either candy, this blows up the deficit, because keep in mind, this is just to pay for the additional spending that he's talking about. Seven, eight trillion dollars, that's before we even get to the deficit we already have. Or alternatively, it's got to be paid for not only by closing deductions for wealthy individuals, that, that'll pay for about 4% reduction in tax rates, you're going to be paying for it. You'll lose some deductions. And you can't buy this sales pitch. Nobody who's looked at it that's serious actually believes it adds up. Mr. President, let me get, let me get the governor in on this. And governor, let's, before we get into no, I, a, a I, vast array no. of uh, who says what, what study says what, if it shouldn't add up, if somehow when you get in there, there isn't enough tax revenue coming in, if somehow the numbers don't add up, well, would you be willing to look again at a 20%? Well, of, of, of course they add up. I, 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 was, I was someone who ran businesses for 25 years and balanced the budget. I ran the Olympics and balanced the budget. I ran the, the uh, state of Massachusetts as a governor, to the extent any governor does, and balanced the budget all four years. When we're talking about math that doesn't add up, how about $4 trillion of deficits over the last four years? $5 trillion. That's math that doesn't add up. We have, we, we have a president talking about someone's plan uh, in, in a way that's completely foreign to what my real plan is. And then we have his own record, which is we have four consecutive years where he said when he was running for office he would cut the deficit in half. Instead, he's doubled it. We've gone from $10 trillion of national debt to $16 trillion of national debt. If the president were reelected, we go to almost $20 trillion of national debt. This puts us on a road to Greece. I know what it takes to balance budgets. I've done it my entire life. So, for instance, when he says, yours is a $5 trillion cut, well, no, it's not, because I'm offsetting some of the reductions, withholding down some of the deductions. And, and Governor, and, I got to I gotta actually, I'm, I'm I need sorry. to have you both hang up. I understand you, yeah. the stakes here. I understand both of you. But I, I will get run out of and I just town if and I, I don't And I just described you, Mr. President, I just described to you precisely get, how I do it, I, okay. with, this, with a, a single Good. number that people can put, and they can put their, their, their uh, okay. deductions and credits into that Mr. President, we're keeping track, I promise you. And, Mr. President, the next question is for you, so stay standing. Um, and it's Catherine Fenton uh, who has a question for you. In what new ways do you intend to rectify the inequalities in the workplace, specifically regarding females making only 72% of what their male counterparts earn? Well, Catherine, th this is a great question. And, you know, I was raised by a single mom who had to put herself through school while looking after two kids. And she worked hard every day and made a lot of sacrifices to make sure we got everything we needed. My grandmother, she started off uh, as a secretary in a bank. She never got a uh, college education, even though she was smart as a whip. And she worked her way up to become a vice president of a local bank. But she hit the glass ceiling. She trained people who would end up becoming her bosses during the course of her career. She didn't complain. That's not what you did 
in that generation. And this is one of the reasons why one of the first, the first bill I signed was something called the Lilly Ledbetter Bill. And this is named after this amazing woman who had been doing the same job as a man for years, found out that she was getting paid less, and the Supreme Court said that she couldn't bring suit because she should have found out about it earlier. She had no way of finding out about it. So we fixed that. And that's an example of the kind of advocacy that we need because women are increasingly the breadwinners in the family. This is not just a women's issue. This is a family issue. There's a middle class issue. And that's why we've got to fight for it. It also means that we've got to make sure that young people like yourself are able to afford a college education. Earlier, Governor Romney talked about he wants to make Pell Grants and uh, other education uh, accessible for young people. Well, the truth of the matter is, is that that's exactly what we've done. We've expanded Pell Grants for millions of people, including millions of young women all across the country. We did it by taking $60 billion that was going to banks and lenders as middlemen for the student loan program, and we said, let's just cut out the middlemen. Let's give the money directly to students. And as a consequence, we've seen millions of young people be able to afford college, and that's going to make sure that young women are going to be able to compete in that marketplace. But we've got to enforce the laws, which is what we are doing, and we've also got to make sure that in every walk of life, we do not tolerate discrimination. That's been one of the hallmarks of my administration. I'm going to continue to push on this issue for the next four years. Governor Romney, pay equity for women. Thank you, and uh, important topic, and one which I learned a great deal about, uh, particularly as I was serving as governor of my state, because I had the, the chance to pull together a cabinet, and uh, all the applicants seemed to be men. And I, and I went to my staff and I said, how come all the people for these jobs are, are all men? They said, well, these are the people that have the qualifications. And I said, well, gosh, can't we, can't we find some, some women that are also qualified? And, uh, and so we, we took a concerted effort to go out and find women who had backgrounds that could be qualified to become members of our cabinet. I went to a number of women's groups and said, can you help us find folks? And they brought us whole binders full of, uh, of women. I was proud of the fact that after I staffed my cabinet and my senior staff, that the University of New York uh, in Albany did a survey of all 50 states and concluded that mine had more women in senior leadership positions than any other state in America. Now, one of the reasons I was able to get so many good women to be part of that team was because of our recruiting effort, but number two, because I recognized that if you're gonna have women in the workforce, that sometimes they need to be more flexible. My chief of staff, for instance, uh, had two kids that were still in school. She said, I can't be here until seven or eight o'clock at night. I need to be able to get home at 5 o'clock so I can be there for making dinner for my kids and being with them when they get home from school. So he said, fine, let's have a flexible schedule so you can have hours that work for you. We're going to have to have employers in the new economy, in the economy I'm going to bring to play, that are going to be so anxious to get good workers, they're going to be anxious to hire women. In the, in the last uh, four years, women have lost 580,000 jobs. That's the net of what's happened in the last four years. We're still down 580,000 jobs. I mentioned three and a half million women more now in poverty than four years ago. What we can do to help young women and women of all ages is to have a strong economy, so strong that employers are looking to find good employees and bringing them into their workforce and adapting to a, fleg a flexible work schedule that gives women the opportunities that, that they would otherwise not be able to, to afford. This is what I've done, it's what I look forward to doing, and I know what it takes to make an economy work. And I know what a working economy looks like. And an economy with 7.8 percent unemployment is not a real strong economy. An economy that, uh, that, that has 23 million people looking for work is not a strong economy. An economy with, with 50 percent of kids graduating from college that can't find a job or a college-level job, that's not what we have to have. I'm going to help women in America get, work, get good work by getting a stronger economy and by supporting women in the workforce. Mr. President, why don't you get in on this uh, quickly, please? Catherine, I just want to point out that when Governor Romney's campaign was asked about the Lilly Ledbetter bill, whether he supported it, he said, I'll get back to you. And that's not the kind of advocacy that women need in any economy. Now, there's some other issues that have a bearing on how women succeed in the workplace. 
For example, their health care. Now, a major difference in this campaign is that Governor Romney feels comfortable having politicians in Washington decide the health care choices that women are making. I think that's a mistake. In my health care bill, I said insurance companies need to provide contraceptive coverage to everybody who's insured. Because this is not just a health issue, it's an economic issue for women. It makes a difference. This is money out of that family's pocket. Governor Romney not only opposed it, he suggested that, in fact, employers should be able to make the decision as to whether or not a woman gets uh, contraception through her insurance coverage. That's not the kind of advocacy that women need. When Governor Romney says that we should eliminate funding for Planned Parenthood, there are millions of women all across the country who rely on Planned Parenthood for not just contraceptive care, they rely on it for mammograms, for cervical cancer screenings. That's a pocketbook issue for women and families all across the country. And it makes a difference in terms of how well and effectively women are able to work. When we talk about child care and the credits that we're providing, that makes a difference in terms of whether they can go out there and earn a living for their family. These are not just women's issues. These are family issues. These are economic issues. And one of the things that makes us grow as an economy is when everybody participates and women are getting the same fair deal as men are. And Mr. I've got President. two daughters and I want to make sure that they have the same opportunities that anybody's sons have. And that's part of what I'm fighting for as President of the United States. I want to move us along here to Susan Katz, uh, who has a question. And Governor, it's for you. Governor Romney, I am an undecided voter because I'm disappointed with the lack of progress I've seen in the last four years. However, I do attribute much of America's economic and international problems to the failings and missteps of the Bush administration. Since both you and President Bush are Republicans, I fear a return to the policies of those years should you win this election. What is the biggest difference between you and George W. Bush? And how do you differentiate yourself from George W. Bush? Great. Thank you. And I appreciate that question. I, I, I just want to make sure that I think I was supposed to get that last answer, but I want to point out that I, I don't believe. I don't think so, Candy. I, I well, don't I believe. I want to make sure our, our, our timekeepers are okay. working The, the, the timekeepers time are all working. And all let right. me tell you that the last part, there's, it's, it's the, for the two of you to talk to one another, and it isn't quite as ordered as you think. But go ahead and use this two minutes any way you'd like to. The, the question is on the floor. I, I just note that uh, I don't believe that bureaucrats in Washington should tell someone whether they can use contraceptives or not. And I don't believe employers should tell someone whether they could have contraceptive care or not. Every woman in America should have access to contraceptives. And, and, the, and the president's uh, statement of my policy is completely and totally wrong. Governor, Let me come true. back and, and, and answer your question. The, president Bush and I are, are different people. And these are different times. And that's why my five-point plan is so different than what he would have done. I mean, for instance, we can now, by virtue of new technology, actually get all the energy we need in North America without having to go to the, the Arabs or the Venezuelans or anyone else. That wasn't true in his time. That's why my policy starts with a very robust policy to get all that energy in North America and become energy secure. Number two, trade. I'll crack down on China. President Bush didn't. I'm also going to dramatically expand trade in Latin America. It's been growing about 12 percent per year over a long period of time. I want to add more free trade agreements so we have more trade. Number three, I'm going to get us to a balanced budget. President Bush didn't. President Obama was right. He said that that was outrageous to have deficits as high as half a trillion dollars under the Bush years. He was right. But then he put in place deficits twice that size for every one of his four years. And his forecast for the next four years is more deficits, almost that large. So that's the next area I'm different than President Bush. And then let's take the last one, championing small business. Our party has been focused on big business too long. I came through small business. I understand how hard it is to start a small business. That's why everything I'll do is designed to help small businesses grow and add jobs. I want to keep their taxes down on small business. 
I want regulators to see their job as encouraging small enterprise, not crushing it. And the thing I find most troubling about Obamacare, well, it's a long list, but one of the things I find most troubling is that when you go out and talk to small businesses and ask them what they think about it, they tell you it keeps them from hiring more people. My priority is jobs. I know how to make that happen. And President Bush had a very different path for a very different time. My path is designed in getting small businesses to grow and hire people. Thanks, Governor. Mr. President. Well, first of all, I think it's important to tell you that we did come in during some tough times. We were losing 800,000 jobs a month when I started. But we had been digging our way out of policies that were misplaced and focused on the top doing very well and middle class folks not doing well. Now we've seen 30 consecutive, 31 consecutive months of job growth, 5.2 million new jobs created. And the plans that I talked about will create even more. But when Governor Romney says that he has a very different economic plan, the centerpiece of his economic plan are tax cuts. That's what took us from surplus to deficit. When he talks about getting tough on China, yeah, keep in mind that Governor Romney invested in companies that were pioneers of outsourcing to China and is currently investing in countries, uh, in, in companies that are building surveillance equipment for China to spy on its own folks. That's, uh, Governor, you're the last person who's going to get tough on China. And what we've done when it comes to trade is not only sign three trade deals to open up new markets, but we've also set up a task force for trade that goes after anybody who is taking advantage of American workers or businesses and not creating a level playing field. We've brought twice as many cases against unfair trade practices than the previous administration, and we've won every single one that's been decided. When I said that we had to make sure that China was not flooding our domestic market with cheap tires. Governor Romney said I was being protectionist, that it wouldn't be helpful to American workers. Well, in fact, we saved a thousand jobs. And that's the kind of tough trade actions that are required. But the last point I want to make is this. You know, there are some things where Governor Romney is different from George Bush. You know, George Bush didn't propose turning Medicare into a voucher. George Bush embraced comprehensive immigration reform. He didn't call for self-deportation. George Bush never suggested that we eliminate funding for Planned Parenthood. So there are differences between Governor Romney and George Bush, but they're not on economic policy. In some ways, he's gone to a more extreme place when it comes to social policy. And I think that's a mistake. That's not how we're going to move our economy forward. I want to move you both along to the next question because it's in the same wheelhouse, so you, you will uh, be able to respond, but uh, the president does get this question. I want to call on Michael Jones. Mr. President, I voted for you in 2008. What have you done or accomplished to earn my vote in 2012? I'm not that optimistic as I was in 2012. Most things I need for everyday living are very expensive. Well, we've gone through a tough four years. There's no doubt about it. But four years ago, I told the American people, and I told you, I would cut taxes for middle-class families, and I did. I told you I'd cut taxes for small businesses, and I have. I said that I'd end the war in Iraq, and I did. I said we'd refocus attention on those who actually attacked us on 9-11. And we have gone after al-Qaeda's leadership like never before, and Osama bin Laden is dead. I said that we would put in place health care reform to make sure that insurance companies can't jerk you around, and if you don't have health insurance, that you'd have a chance to get affordable insurance. And I have. I committed that I would rein in the excesses of Wall Street, and we passed the toughest Wall Street reforms since the 1930s. We've created 5 million jobs, gone from 800,000 jobs a month being lost, and we are making progress. We saved an auto industry that was on the brink of collapse. Now, does that mean you're not struggling? Absolutely not. A lot of us are. And that's why the plan that I put forward for manufacturing and education and reducing our deficit in a sensible way, using the savings from ending wars 
to rebuild America and putting people back to work, making sure that we are controlling our own energy, but not just the energy of today, but also the energy of the future. All those things will make a difference. So the point is, the commitments I've made, I've kept. And those that I haven't been able to keep, it's not for lack of trying, and we're going to get it done in a second term. But you should pay attention to this campaign because Governor Romney's made some commitments as well. And I suspect he'll keep those too. You know, when members of the Republican Congress say, we're going to sign a no tax pledge so that we don't ask a dime from millionaires and billionaires to reduce our deficit so we can still invest in education and helping kids go to college, he said, me too. When they said, we're going to cut Planned Parenthood funding. He said, me too. When he said, we're going to repeal Obamacare, first thing I'm going to do, despite the fact that it's the same health care plan that he passed in Massachusetts and is working well, he said, me too. That is not the kind of leadership that you need, but you should expect that those are promises he's going to keep. Mr. And President, the choice in this let... election is going to be whose promises are going to be more likely to help you in your life, make sure your kids can go to college, Make sure that you are getting a good paying job, making sure that Mr. Medicare President, and Social Security will be there for thank you. Thank you. Governor. I think you know better. I, I think you know that these last four years haven't been so good as the President just described, and that you don't feel like you're confident that the next four years are going to be much better either. I, I can tell you that if you were to elect President Obama, you know what you're going to get. You're going to get a repeat of the last four years. We just can't afford four more years like the last four years. He said that by now we'd have unemployment at 5.4 percent. The difference between where it is and 5.4 percent is 9 million Americans without work. I wasn't the one that said 5.4 percent. This was the president's plan. Didn't get there. He said he would have by now put forward a plan to reform Medicare and Social Security because he pointed out they're on the road to bankruptcy. He would reform them. He'd get that done. He hasn't even made a proposal on either one. He said in his first year he'd put out an immigration plan that would deal with our immigration challenges. Didn't even file it. This is a president who has not been able to do what he said he'd do. He said that he'd cut in half the deficit. He hasn't done that either. In fact, he doubled it. He said that by now, middle-income families would have a reduction in their health insurance premiums by $2,500 a year. It's gone up by $2,500 a year. And if Obamacare is passed or implemented, it's already been passed, if it's implemented fully, it'll be another $2,500 on top. The middle class is getting crushed under the policies of a president who has not understood what it takes to get the economy working again. He keeps saying, look, I've created 5 million jobs. That's after lo losing 5 million jobs. The entire record is such that the unemployment has not been reduced in this country. The unemployment, the number of people who are still looking for work, is still 23 million Americans. There are more people in poverty, one out of six people in poverty. How about food stamps? When he took office, 32 million people were on food stamps. Today, 47 million people are on food stamps. How about the growth of the economy? It's growing more slowly this year than last year, and more slowly last year than the year before. The, the president wants to do well, I understand. But the policies he's put in place, from Obamacare to Dodd-Frank to his tax policies to his regulatory policies, these policies combined have not led this economy take off and grow like it could have. You might say, well, you got an example of when it worked better? Yeah. In the Reagan recession, where unemployment hit 10.8 percent, between that period, the end of that recession, and the equivalent period of time to today, Ronald Reagan's re recovery created twice as many jobs is this president's recovery. Five million jobs doesn't even keep up with our population growth. And the only reason the unemployment rate seems a little lower today is because of all the people that have dropped out of the workforce. The president has tried, but his policies haven't worked. He's great as a, as a, 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 as a speaker and, and describing his plans and his vision. That's wonderful, except we have a record to look at. And that record shows he just hasn't been able to cut the deficit to put in place reforms for Medicare and Social Security to preserve them, to get us the rising incomes we need. Median incomes down $4,300 a family and 23 million Americans out of work. That's what this election is about. 
It's about who can get the middle class in this country a bright and prosperous future and assure our kids the kind of hope and optimism they deserve. Governor, I want to move you along. Don't, don't go away, and we'll, we'll have plenty of time to respond. We are quite aware of the clock for both of you. But I want to bring in a, a different subject here. Mr. President, I'll be right back with you. Um, at Lorraine Osorio has a question for you about a topic we have this not for heard. Governor yes, it's for Governor Romney, and we'll be right with you, Mr. President. Thanks. Is it Lorraine? Lorraine. Lorraine? Lorraine. Yeah. How you doing? Good, thanks. President. Um, Rodney, what do you plan on doing with immigrants without their green card that are currently living here as productive members of society? Thank you. Gillarane, did I get that right? Good. Thank you for your question. And um, let me step back and tell you what I'd like to do with our immigration policy broadly and include an answer to your, your question. First of all, this is a nation of immigrants. We welcome people coming to this country as immigrants. My dad was born in Mexico of American parents. Anne's dad was born in Wales and is a first generation American. We welcome legal immigrants into this country. I want our legal system to work better. I want it to be streamlined. I want it to be clearer. I don't think you have to, shouldn't have to hire a lawyer to figure out how to get into this country legally. I also think that we should give visas to people, green cards rather, to people who graduate with skills that we need. People around the world with accredited degrees in, in science and math get a green card stapled to their diploma. Come to the U.S. of A. We should make sure that our legal system works. Number two, we're going to have to stop illegal immigration. There are four million people who are waiting in line to get here legally. Those who've come here illegally take their place. So I will not grant amnesty to those who've come here illegally. What I will do is I'll put in place an employment verification system and make sure that employers that hire people who have come here illegally are sanctioned for doing so. I won't put in place um, magnets for people coming here illegally. So, for instance, I would not give driver's licenses to those that have come here illegally, as the, as the president would. Uh, the kids of, of those that came here illegally, those kids, I think, should have a pathway to become a, a permanent resident of the United States. And military service, for instance, is one way they would have that kind of pathway to become a permanent resident. Now, when the president ran for office, he said that he'd put in place in his first year a piece of legislation. He'd file a, a bill in his first year that would reform our, our immigration system, protect legal immigration, stop illegal immigration. He didn't do it. He had a Democrat House and Democrat Senate, supermajority in both houses. Why did he fail to even promote legislation that would have provided an answer for those that want to come here legally and for those that are here illegally today? That's a question I think the, the president will have a chance to answer right now. Good. I look forward to it. Was, uh, Lorena? Lorraine. Uh, we are a nation of immigrants. I mean, we're just a few miles away from Ellis Island. We all understand what this country has become because talent from all around the world wants to come here. People who are willing to take risks people who want to build on their dreams and make sure their kids have an even bigger dreams than they have. But we're also a nation of laws. So what I've said is we need to fix a broken immigration system, and I've done everything that I can on my own and sought cooperation from Congress to make sure that we fix this system. First thing we did was to streamline the legal immigration system, to reduce the backlog, make it easier, simpler, and cheaper for people who are waiting in line, obeying the law to make sure that they can come here and contribute to our country. And that's good for our economic growth. They'll start new businesses. They'll make things happen that create jobs here in the United States. Number two, we do have to deal with our border. So we put more border patrol on than any time in history, and the flow of undocumented workers across the border is actually lower than it's been in 40 years. What I've also said is, if we're going to go after folks who are here illegally, we should do it smartly and go after folks who are criminals, gangbangers, people who are hurting the community, not after students, not after folks who are here just because they're trying to figure out how to feed their families. And that's what we've done. And what I've also said is, for young people who come here, brought here oftentimes by their parents, have gone to school here, pledged allegiance to the flag, Think of this as their country. Understand themselves as Americans in every way except having papers. Then we should make sure that we give them a pathway to citizenship. 
And that's what I've done administratively. Now, Governor Romney just said that you know, he wants to help those young people too, but during the Republican primary, he said, I will veto the DREAM Act that would allow these young people to have access. His main strategy during the Republican primary was to say, we're going to encourage self-deportation, making life so miserable on folks that they'll leave. He called the Arizona law a model for the nation. Part of the Arizona law said that law enforcement officers could stop folks because they suspected maybe they looked like they might be undocumented workers and check their papers. And you know what? If my daughter or yours looks to somebody like they're not a citizen, I don't want, I don't want to empower somebody like that. So we can fix this system in a comprehensive way. And when Governor Romney says the challenge is, well, Obama didn't try, that's not true. I sat down with Democrats and Republicans at the beginning of my term, and I said, let's fix this system, including senators previously who had supported it on the Republican side. But it's very hard for Republicans in Congress to support comprehensive immigration reform if their standard bearer has said that this is not something I'm interested in supporting. Let me get the governor in here, Mr. President. Um, let, let's speak to, if you let's, could, Governor, uh, the idea of self-deportation. No, let, let, let me go back and speak to the points that the president made, and, and, uh, and let's get them correct. I did not say that the Arizona law was a model for the nation in that aspect. I said that the E-Verify portion of the Arizona law, which is which is the portion of the law which says that employers could be able to determine whether someone is here illegally or not illegally, that that was a model for the nation. That's number one. Number two, I asked the president a question. I think Hispanics and immigrants all over the nation have asked. He was asked this on Univision the other day. Why, when you said you'd file legislation in your first year, didn't you do it? And he didn't answer. He, don't, he doesn't answer that question. He said the standard bearer wasn't for it. I, I'm glad you thought I was a standard bearer four years ago, but I wasn't. Uh, uh, four years ago, you said in your first year Sorry. you would file legislation. In his first year, I, I was just getting, I was licking my wounds from having been beaten by John McCain. All right, I was not the standard bearer. My, my view is that this president should have honored his promise to, to do as he said. Now, let me mention one other thing, and that is self-deportation says let, it, let people make their own choice. What I was saying is we're not going to round up 12 million people, undocumented, illegals, and take them out of the nation. Instead, let ma people make their own choice. And if they, if they find that, that they can't get the benefits here that they want, and they can't, fi and they can't find the job they want, then they'll make a decision to go a place where, where they have better opportunities. But I'm not in favor of rounding up people and in, 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 in taking them out of this country. I am in favor, as the president has said, and I agree with him, which is that if people have committed crimes, we've got to get them out of this country. Let me mention something else the president said. It was a moment ago, and I didn't get a chance to, uh, when he was describing uh, Chinese investments and so forth. Candy, hold Let on me, a second. Mr. President, I'm still speaking. I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Uh, 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 president, uh, 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 why don't you let me finish? I'm, 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 I'm going to continue. Oh, I'm going to continue. Uh, Governor the Romney, if you can make it short, see all these people, they've been waiting for you. Could you make it short? Just going to make a point. Any investments I have over the last eight years have been managed by a blind trust. And I understand they do include investments outside the United States, including in Chinese companies. Mr. President, Kenny, have you looked at your pension? Kenny, have you looked at your pension? I've got to say. Hey, Mr. Pen the, President, have you looked at your pension? You know, I, I don't look at my pension. It's not as big as yours, so it doesn't well, take let, as let long. Well, let, <laughs> let, uh, let me give you some advice. I don't check it that often. Let me give you some advice. <laughs> look at your pension. You also have investments in Chinese companies. Yeah. You also have investments outside the United States. Yeah. You also have investments through a Cayman's right. Trust. And we're Come, way, okay. we're right. sort of way so, off so, topic so, Mr. Here, President, Governor Romney. We're, we're, we're low so, off topic here. Completely yeah. off yeah. the immigration. I thought we were talking about immigration. And we, we yeah. were. I, 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 I came back to what you spoke about. I do want to make sure If I could have you sit down, Governor Romney, thank you. I do want to make sure that we just understand something. Governor Romney says he wasn't referring to Arizona as a model for the nation. His top advisor on immigration is the guy who designed the Arizona law, the entirety of it, not e verify the whole thing. That's his policy, and it's a bad policy, and it won't help us grow. Look, when we think about immigration, we have to understand there are folks all around the world who still see America as the land of promise. And they provide us energy, and they provide us innovation, and they start companies like Intel and Google, and we want to encourage that. 
Now, we've got to make sure that we do it in a smart way, in a comprehensive way, and we make the legal system better. But when we make this into a divisive political issue, and when we don't have bipartisan support, I can deliver, Governor, a whole bunch of Democrats to get comprehensive immigration reform done, and I'll we can't. I'll we get can't, it done. First year. We, can't, we okay. have not seen Mr. Republicans let me move you serious on here, about please. this issue at all. Mr. And President. it's time for them to get serious on it. This Don't used to be a bipartisan away, issue. Right. Don't go away because I'm, I, I'm here. I, I want you to talk to Kerry Latka, who has a, wants to switch a topic for us. Okay. Hi, Karen. Good evening, Mr. President. I'm sorry, what's your name? It's Kerry, Kerry yeah. Latka. Great to see you. This question actually comes from a, um, a brain trust of my friends at Global Telecom Supply in Mineola yesterday. Uh -huh. We were sitting around talking about Libya. And we were reading and became aware of reports that the State Department refused extra security for our embassy in Benghazi, Libya, prior to the attacks that killed four Americans. Who was it that denied enhanced security and why? Well, let me first of all talk about our diplomats, because they serve all around the world and do an incredible job in a very dangerous situation. And these aren't just representatives of the United States. They're my representatives. I send them there, oftentimes in a harm's way. I know these folks, and I know their families. So nobody's more concerned about their safety and security than I am. So as soon as we found out that the Benghazi consulate was being overrun, I was on the phone with my national security team, and I gave them three instructions. Number one, beef up our security and, uh, and, and procedures not just in Libya, but in every embassy and consulate in the region. Number two, investigate exactly what happened, regardless of where the facts lead us, to make sure that folks are held accountable and it doesn't happen again. And number three, we are going to find out who did this and we are going to hunt them down. Because one of the things that I've said throughout my presidency is when folks mess with Americans, we go after them. Now, Governor Romney had a very different response. While we were still dealing with our diplomats being threatened, Governor Romney put out a press release trying to make political points. And that's not how a commander-in-chief operates. You don't turn national security into a political issue, certainly not right when it's happening. And people, not everybody agrees with some of the decisions I've made. But when it comes to our national security, I mean what I say. I said I'd end the war in, Libya, uh, in, in Iraq, and I did. I said that we'd go after al-Qaeda and bin Laden. We have. I said we'd transition out of Afghanistan and start making sure that Afghans are responsible for their own security. That's what I'm doing. And when it comes to this issue, when I say that we are going to find out exactly what happened, everybody will be held accountable, and I am ultimately responsible for what's taking place there, because these are my folks, and I'm the one who has to greet those coffins when they come home, you know that I mean what I say. Mr. President, I've got to move us along. Governor? Thank you, Kerry, for your question. It's an important one. And, uh, and I, I think the President just said correctly that, that the buck does stop at his desk, and, and he takes responsibility for, for that, uh, for the, the failure in, in providing those security resources. And, and those terrible things may, may well happen from time to time. I, I'm, I feel very deeply sympathetic for the families of those who lost, lost loved ones. And today there's a memorial service for one of those that was lost in this tragedy. We, we think of their families and care for them deeply. Uh, there were other issues associated with this, uh, with this tragedy. Um, there were many days that passed before we knew whether this was a spontaneous demonstration or actually whether it was a terrorist attack. And there was no demonstration involved. It was a terrorist attack. Um, and it took a long time for that to be told to the American people. Um, whether there was some misleading or instead whether we just didn't know what happened, I think you have to ask yourself, why didn't we know five days later uh, when the ambassador to the United Nations went on TV to say that this was a demonstration? How could we have not known? But I, but I find more troubling than this that on, on the day following the assassination of the United States ambassador, the first time that's happened since 1979, when, uh, when we have four Americans killed there, when apparently we didn't know what happened, that the President 
the day after that happened, flies to Las Vegas for political fundraiser, then the next day to Colorado for another event, another political event. I, I think these, these actions taken by a president and a leader have symbolic significance and perhaps even uh, material significance in that you'd hope that during that time we could call in the people who were actually eyewitnesses. We've read their accounts now about what happened. It was very clear this was not a demonstration. This was an attack by terrorists. And, and this calls into question the president's whole policy in the Middle East. Look what's happening in Syria, in Egypt, now in, in Libya. Consider the distance between ourselves and, and Israel. The president said that, that he was going to put daylight between us and Israel. We have Iran four years closer to a nuclear bomb. Syria, Syria is not just the tragedy of 30,000 civilians being killed by a military, but also a strategic, uh, strategically significant player for America. The, the president's policies throughout the Middle East began with an apology tour and, 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 and pursue a strategy of leading from behind. And this strategy is unraveling before our very eyes. Because we're, we're closing in, I want to still get a lot of people in. I want to ask you something, Mr. President, and then have the governor just quickly. Uh, your Secretary of State, as I'm sure you know, has said uh, that she takes full responsibility for the attack on the diplomatic mission in Benghazi. Does the buck stop with your Secretary of State as far as what went on here? No. Secretary Clinton has done an extraordinary job, but she works for me. I'm the President, and I'm always responsible. And that's why nobody's more interested in finding out exactly what happened than I did. The day after the attack, Governor, I stood in the Rose Garden and I told the American people in the world that we were going to find out exactly what happened, that this was an act of terror, and I also said that we're going to hunt down those who committed this crime. And then a few days later, I was there greeting the caskets coming into Andrews Air Force Base and grieving with the families. And the suggestion that anybody in my team, whether the Secretary of State, our UN Ambassador, anybody on my team would play politics or mislead when we've lost four of our own governor is offensive. That's not what we do. That's not what I do as President. That's not what I do as Commander in Chief. Governor, if you want to reply yeah, I, just I quickly I to do, this, please. I, do. I, I, I think it's interesting. The President just said something, which, which is that on the day after the attack, he went to the Rose Garden and said that this was an act of terror. That's what I said. You said in the Rose Garden, the day after the attack, it was an act of terror. It was not a please spontaneous proceed. demonstration. Is that what you're saying? Please proceed, Governor. I, I, I want to make sure we get that for the record, because it took the president 14 days before he called the attack in Benghazi an act of terror. Get the transcript. It, 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 he did, in, in fact, sir. So let me, let me call it an act of Can terror. Can you say that a little louder, he Candy? He, he did call it an act of terror. It did as well take, it did as well, uh, take uh, two weeks or so uh, for the whole idea of there being a riot out there about this tape to come out. You're correct this, about that. The administration, the administration indicated that this was a, a reaction to a, to a video and was a spontaneous reaction. They did. It took them a long time to say this was a terrorist act by a terrorist group. And, and to suggest, am I incorrect in that regard? On, on Sunday, the, uh, your, your secretary, your, excuse me, the uh, ambassador of the United Nations, one of the Sunday t television shows, and, and spoke about how Kenny, this was a spontaneous I'm, I'm happy, to, I'm happy me, to have a longer conversation about foreign absolutely, policy. Absolutely, but I want, I want to move you on. And okay, also, people can to go too. to the transcripts. I just and, want to make sure that uh, you know, all these wonderful and folks when. are going to have a chance to get some of their questions answered. Because what I, what I want to do, Mr. President, is stand there for a second, because I want to introduce you to Nina Gonzalez, who uh, brought up a question that we hear a lot, uh, both over the Internet and from this crowd. President Obama, during the Democratic National Convention in 2008, you stated you wanted to keep AK-47s out of the hands of criminals. What has your administration done or plan to do to limit the availability of assault weapons? You know, we're a nation that believes in the Second Amendment, and I believe in the Second Amendment. You know, we've got a long tradition of hunting and sportsmen, 
uh, and people who want to make sure they can protect themselves. But there have been too many instances during the course of my presidency where I've had to comfort families who've lost somebody, most recently out in Aurora. You know, just uh, a couple of uh, weeks ago, actually probably about a month, uh, I saw a mother who I had met at the bedside of her son who had been shot in that theater. And her son had been shot through the head. And we spent some time and we said a prayer. And remarkably, about two months later, this young man and his mom showed up and he looked unbelievable, good as new. But there were a lot of families who didn't have that good fortune and whose sons or daughters or husbands didn't survive. So my belief is that, A, we have to enforce the laws we've already got, make sure that we're keeping guns out of the hands of criminals, those who are mentally ill. We've done a much better job in terms of background checks, but we've got more to do when it comes to enforcement. But I also share your belief that weapons that were designed for soldiers in war theaters don't belong on our streets. And so what I'm trying to do is to get a broader conversation about how do we reduce the violence generally. Part of it is seeing if we can get an assault weapons ban reintroduced, but part of it is also looking at other sources of the violence. Because frankly, in my hometown of Chicago, there's an awful lot of violence, and they're not using AK-47s, they're using cheap handguns. And so what can we do to intervene to make sure that young people have opportunity, that our schools are working, that if there's violence on the streets, that working with faith groups and law enforcement, we can catch it before it gets out of control. And so what I want is a, is a comprehensive strategy. Part of it is seeing if we can get automatic weapons that kill folks in amazing numbers out of the hands of criminals and the mentally ill. But part of it is also going deeper and seeing if we can get into these communities and making sure we catch violent impulses before they occur. Governor Romney, the question is about assault weapons, AK-47s. Yeah, I, I'm not in favor of new pieces of legislation on, on guns and, and taking guns away or, or making certain guns illegal. We, of course, don't want to have automatic weapons, and that's already illegal in this country to have automatic weapons. What I believe is we have to do, as the President mentioned uh, towards the end of his remarks there, which is to make enormous efforts to enforce the gun laws that we have and to change the culture of violence we have. And you ask, how are we going to do that? And there are a number of things. He mentioned good schools. I totally agree. We were able to drive our schools to be number one in the nation in my state. And I believe if we do a better job in education, we'll, we'll give people the, the hope and opportunity they deserve and perhaps less violence from that. But let me mention another thing. And that is parents. We need moms and dads helping raise kids wherever possible. The, the benefit of having two parents in the home, and that's not always possible. A lot of great single moms, single dads. But gosh, to tell our kids that before they have babies, they ought to think about getting married to someone, that's a great idea. Because if there's a two-parent family, the prospect of living in poverty goes down dramatically. The opportunities that the child will, will be able to achieve increase dramatically. So we can make changes in the way our culture works to help bring people away from violence and give them opportunity and bring them in the American system. The, the, the greatest failure we've had with regards to, to gun violence in some respects is what, what is known as Fast and Furious, which was a program uh, under this administration and how it worked exactly, I think we don't know precisely, but where thousands of automatic and, and AK-47 type weapons were were given to people that ultimately gave them to, to drug lords. They used those weapons against, uh, against their own citizens and killed Americans with them. And this was, a, this was a program of the government. For what purpose it was put in place, I can't imagine. But it's one of the great tragedies related to violence in our society, which has occurred during this administration, which I think the American people would like to understand fully. It's been investigated to a degree but, but the administration has, uh, has, uh, has carried out executive privilege to, to prevent all the information from coming out. I'd like to understand who it was that did this, what the idea was behind it, why it led to the violence. Thousands of guns going to Mexican Danny. drug Governor, lords. 
Governor, if I could, the, the question was about these assault weapons that once were banned and are no longer banned. Uh, I, I know that you signed a, a, an assault weapons ban when you were in Massachusetts. Obviously, with this question, you, you no longer do support that. Why is that, given the kind of violence that we see sometimes with these mass killings? Uh, why is that that you've changed your mind? Well, Candy, actually, in, in my state, the pro-gun folks and the anti-gun folks came together and put together a piece of legislation. And, and it's referred to as, a, as the, an assault weapon ban, but it had, at the signing of the bill, both the pro-gun and the anti-gun people came together because it provided opportunities for both that both wanted. There were hunting opportunities, for instance, that hadn't previously been available and so forth. So it was a mutually agreed upon piece of legislation. That's what we need more of, Candy. What we have right now in Washington is a place that's, uh, that's gridlocked. So if, I could, if you had, could get people to agree to it, you'd we be haven't for had, it. We haven't, had the, we haven't had the leadership in Washington to work on a bipartisan basis. I was able to do that in my state and bring these two together. Quickly, Kennedy. Mr. President. The, uh, uh, first of all, I think Governor Romney was for an assault weapons ban before he was against it. And he said that the reason he changed his mind was in part because he was seeking the endorsement of the National Rifle Association. So that's on the record. But I think that one area we agree on is the importance of parents and the importance of schools. Because I do believe that if our young people have opportunity, then they're less likely to engage in these kinds of violent acts. We're not going to eliminate everybody who is mentally disturbed, and we've got to make sure that they don't get weapons, but we can make a difference in terms of ensuring that every young person in America, regardless of where they come from, what they look like, have a chance to succeed. And Candy, we haven't had a chance to talk about education much, but I think it is very important to understand that the reforms we've put in place, working with 46 governors around the country, are seeing schools that are some of the ones that are the toughest for kids starting to succeed. We're starting to see gains in math and science. When it comes to community colleges, we are setting up yeah, right. uh, programs, including with Nassau Community College, to retrain workers, including young people who may have dropped out of school but now are getting another chance, training them for the jobs that exist right now. And in fact, employers are looking for skilled workers. And so we're matching them up, giving them access to higher education. As I said, we have made sure that millions of young people are able to get an education that they weren't able to get before. Now, Mr. President, uh, I, have to, I have to move you along here. But, you but, said you wanted to hear these it, questions, it'll, it'll, and we need to do just, it here. Just one second, one because, because this is important. This is part of the choice in this election. And when Governor Romney was asked whether teachers, hiring more teachers, was important to growing our economy, Governor Romney said that doesn't grow our economy. The, qu the when, question, when he was of asked, course, Mr. Is, President, was, was guns here, so I, I need to move us along. You know, the question was guns, so let me let but me. This will make a difference in, another... in terms of whether or not we can move this economy forward for these young people. I understand. And reduce our violence. Okay, thank you so much. I, I want to ask Carol Goldberg to stand up because she gets to a question that both these men have been passionate about. It's for Governor Romney. The outsourcing of American jobs overseas has taken a toll on our economy. What plans do you have to put back and keep jobs here in the United States? Boy, great question, an important question, because you're absolutely right. And the place where we've seen manufacturing go has been China. China is now the largest manufacturer in the world. It used to be the United States of America. A lot of good people have lost jobs. A half a million manufacturing jobs have been lost in the last four years. That's total over the last four years. One of the reasons for that is that people think it's more attractive in some cases to go offshore than to, than to stay here. We have made it less attractive for enterprises to stay here than to go offshore from time to time. What I will do as president is make sure it's more attractive to come to America again. This is the way we're going to create jobs in this country. It's not by trickle-down government saying we're going to take more money from people and hire more government workers, raise more taxes, put in place more regulations, Trickle-down government has never worked here, has never worked anywhere. I want to make America the most attractive place in the world for entrepreneurs, for small business, for big business, to invest and grow in America. Now, we're going to have to make sure that as we trade with other nations, that they play by the rules, and China hasn't. One of the reasons, or one of the ways they don't play by the rules is artificially holding down the value of their currency. 
Because if they put their currency down low, that means their prices on their goods are low. And that makes them advantageous in the marketplace. We lose sales. And manufacturers here in the U.S. making the same products can't compete. China has been a currency manipulator for years and years and years. And the president has a regular opportunity to, uh, to label them as a, as a currency manipulator, but refuses to do so. On day one, I will label China a currency manipulator, which will allow me as president to be able to put in place, if necessary, tariffs where I believe that they are taking unfair advantage of our manufacturers. So we're going to make sure that people we trade with around the world play by the rules. But let me, let me not just stop there. Don't forget what's key to bringing back jobs here is not just finding someone else to punish. And, and I'm going to be strict with people who we trade with to make sure they, they follow the law and play by the rules. But it's also to make America a mo the most attractive place in the world for businesses of all kinds. That's why I want to bring down the tax rates on small employers, big employers. So they want to be here. Canada's tax rate on companies is now 15 percent. Ours is 35 percent. So if you're starting a business, where would you rather start it? We have to be competitive if we're going to create more jobs here. Regulations have quadrupled. The rate of regulations quadrupled under this president. I talk to small businesses across the country. They say, we feel like we're under attack from our own government. I, I want to make sure that regulators see their job as encouraging small business, not crushing it. And there's no question but that Obamacare has been an extraordinary deterrent to enterprises of all kinds hiring people. My priority is making sure that we get more people hired. If we have more people hired, if we get back manufacturing jobs, if we get back all kinds of jobs into this country, then you're going to see rising incomes again. The reason incomes are down is because unemployment is so high. I know what it takes to get this to happen, and my plan will do that. And one part of it is to make sure that we keep China playing by the rules. Mr. Thanks. President, uh, two minutes here because we are then going to go to our last question. Okay. We need to create jobs here. And both Governor Romney and I agree, actually, that we should lower our corporate tax rate. It's too high. But there's a difference in terms of how we would do it. I want to close loopholes that allow companies to deduct expenses when they move to China, that allow them to profit offshore and not have to get taxed so they have tax advantages offshore. All those changes in our tax code would make a difference. Now, Governor Romney actually wants to expand those tax breaks. One of his big ideas when it comes to corporate tax reform would be to say, if you invest overseas, you make profits overseas, you don't have to pay U.S. taxes. But of course, if you're a small business or a mom and pop business or a big business starting up here, you've got to pay even the reduced rate that Governor Romney's talking about. And it's estimated that that will create 800,000 new jobs, problem is they'll be in China or India or Germany. That's not the way we're going to create jobs here. The way we're going to create jobs here is not just to change our tax code, but also to double our exports. And we are on pace to double our exports, one of the commitments I made when I was president. That's creating tens of thousands of jobs all across the country. That's why we've kept on pushing trade deals, but trade deals that make sure that American workers and American businesses are getting a good deal. Now, Governor Romney talked about China, as I already indicated. In the private sector, Governor Romney's company invested in what were called pioneers of outsourcing. That's not my phrase. That's what reporters called it. And as far as currency manipulation, the currency has actually gone up 11 percent since I've been president because we have pushed them hard. And we've put unprecedented trade pressure on China. That's why exports have significantly increased under my presidency. That's going to help to create jobs here. Mr. President, we have a really short time for a quick discussion here. Uh, iPad, uh, the Macs, the iPhones, they are all manufactured in China. One of the major reasons is labor is so much cheaper here. How do you convince a great American company to bring that manufacturing back here? The answer is very straightforward. We can compete with anyone in the world as long as the playing field is level. China's been cheating over the years. One, by holding down the value of their currency. 
Number two, by stealing our intellectual property, our designs, our patents, our technology. There's even an Apple store in China that's a counterfeit Apple store selling counterfeit goods. They hack into our computers. We will have to have people play on a fair basis. That's number one. Number two, we have to make America the most attractive place for entrepreneurs, for people who want to expand a business. That's what brings jobs in. The president's characterization of How my tax plan is, comple is completely, is Let completely the, false. Let me tell you. Let me go to the president here because we really are running out of time. And the question is, can we ever get, we can't get wages like that. It can't be sustained here. Candy, there's some jobs that are not going to come back because they're low-wage, low-skilled jobs. I want high-wage, high-skilled jobs. That's why we have to emphasize manufacturing. That's why we have to invest in advanced manufacturing. That's why we've got to make sure that we've got the best science and research in the world. And when we talk about deficits, if we're adding to our deficit for tax cuts for folks who don't need them, and we're cutting investments in research and science that will create the next app, create the next new innovation that will sell products around the world, we will lose that race. If we're not training engineers to make sure that they are equipped here in this country, then companies won't come here. Those investments are what's going to help to make sure that we continue to lead this world economy, not just next year, but 10 years from now, 50 years from now, 100 Thanks, years Mr. from now. Thanks, Mr. President. Government uh, Governor does not Romney. create jobs. Government does uh, not Governor create Romney, jobs. I want to introduce you to Barry Green because he's going to have the last question to you first. Barry? Oh, there's Barry. Hi, Barry. Hi, Governor. I think this is a tough question. Uh, each of you, what do you believe is the biggest misperception that the American people have about you as a man and a candidate? Using specific examples, can you take this opportunity to debunk that misperception and set us straight? Uh, thank you. And that's an opportunity for me, and I appreciate it. Um, in the nature of a campaign, uh, it seems that some campaigns are focused on attacking a person rather than prescribing their own future and the things they'd like to do. In the course of that, I think the president's campaign has tried to characterize me as, uh, as someone who, who's very different than who I am. I care about 100 percent of the American people. I want 100 percent of the American people to have a bright and prosperous future. I care about our kids. I understand what it takes to, to make a bright and prosperous future for America again. I, I spent my life in the private sector, not in government. I, I'm a guy who wants to help with the experience I have, the American people. My, my, uh, my passion probably flows from the fact that I believe in God, and I believe we're all children of the same God. I believe we have a responsibility to care for one another. I, uh, I served as a missionary for my church. I served as a pastor in my congregation for about 10 years. I've sat across the table from people who were, were out of work and worked with them to try and find new work or to help them through tough times. I went to the Olympics when they were in trouble to try and get them on track. And as governor of my state, I was able to get 100 percent of my people insured, all my kids, about 98 percent of the adults, was able also to get our schools ranked number one in the nation so 100 percent of our kids would have a bright opportunity for a future. I understand that I can get this country on track again. We don't have to settle for what we're going through. We don't have to settle for gasoline at four bucks. We don't have to settle for unemployment at, at a chronically high level. We don't have to settle for 47 million people on food stamps. We don't have to settle for 50 percent of kids coming out of college not able to get work. We don't, don't have to settle for 23 million people struggling to find a good job. If I become president, I'll get America working again. I will get us on track to a balanced budget. The president hasn't. I will. I'll make sure we can reform Medicare and Social Security to preserve them for coming, coming generations. The president said he would. He didn't. Governor. I'll get our incomes up. And by the way, I've done these things. I served as governor and showed I could get them done. Mr. President, last two minutes belong to you. Barry, I think a lot uh, of this campaign, maybe over the last four years, has been devoted to this notion that I think government creates jobs, that that somehow is the answer. That's not what I believe. I believe that the free enterprise system is the greatest engine of prosperity the world's ever known. I believe in self-reliance and individual initiative and risk takers being rewarded. But I also believe that everybody should have a fair shot and everybody should do their fair share and everybody should play by the same rules. 
because that's how our economy has grown. That's how we built the world's greatest middle class. And, and that is part of what's at stake in this election. There's a fundamentally different vision about how we move our country forward. I believe Governor Romney is a good man, loves his family, cares about his faith. But I also believe that when he said behind closed doors that 47 percent of the country considered themselves victims who refused personal responsibility, think about who he was talking about. Folks on Social Security who've worked all their lives, veterans who've sacrificed for this country, students who are out there trying to hopefully advance their own dreams, but also this country's dreams. Soldiers who are overseas fighting for us right now. People who are working hard every day, paying payroll tax, gas taxes, but don't make enough income. And I want to fight for them. That's what I've been doing for the last four years, because if they succeed, I believe the country succeeds. And when my grandfather fought in World War II and he came back and he got a GI Bill and that allowed him to go to college, that wasn't a handout. That was something that advanced the entire country. And I want to make sure that the next generation has those same opportunities. That's why I'm asking for your vote, and that's why I'm asking for another four years. President Obama, Governor Romney, thank you for being here tonight. On that note, we have come to an end of this town hall debate. Our thanks to the participants for their time and to the people of Foster University for their hospitality. The next and final debate takes place Monday night at Lynn University in Boca Raton, Florida. Don't forget to watch. Election Day is three weeks from today. Don't forget to vote. Good night. Good evening from the campus of Lynn University here in Boca Raton, Florida. This is the fourth and last debate of the 2012 campaign brought to you by the Commission on Presidential Debates. This one's on foreign policy. I'm Bob Schieffer of CBS News. The questions are mine, and I have not shared them with the candidates or their aides. The audience has taken a vow of silence, no applause, no reaction of any kind except right now when we welcome President Barack Obama and Governor Mitt Romney. Gentlemen, your uh, campaigns have agreed to certain rules, and they are simple. They've asked me to divide the evening into segments. I'll pose a question at the beginning of each segment. You will each have two minutes to respond, and then we will have a general discussion until we move to the next segment. Tonight's debate, as both of you know, comes on the 50th anniversary of the night that President Kennedy told the world that the Soviet Union had installed nuclear missiles in Cuba, perhaps the closest we've ever come to nuclear war. And it is a sobering reminder that every president faces at some point an unexpected threat to our national security from abroad. So let's begin. The first segment is the uh, challenge of a uh, changing Middle East and the new face of terrorism. I'm going to put this into two segments, so you'll have two topic questions within this one segment on that subject. The first uh, question, and it concerns Libya, the uh, controversy over what happened there continues. Four Americans are dead, including an American ambassador. Questions remain. Uh, what happened? What caused it? Was it spontaneous? Was it an intelligence failure? Was it a policy failure? Uh, was there an attempt to mislead people about what really happened? Governor Romney, you said this was an example of an American policy in the Middle East that is unraveling before our very eyes. I'd like to hear each of you give your thoughts on that. Governor Romney, you won the uh, toss. You go first. Thank you, Bob, and uh, thank you for agreeing to moderate this debate this evening. 
Thank you to Lynn University for welcoming us here. And Mr. President, it's good to be with you again. We were together at a humorous event a little earlier, and uh, it's nice to uh, maybe be funny this time, not on purpose. We'll see what happens. Um, uh, this is obviously an area of great concern to the entire world, and to America in particular, which is to see uh, a, a complete change in the, the, the structure and the, um, the environment in the Middle East. With the Arab Spring came a great deal of hope that there would be a change towards more moderation, an opportunity for greater participation on the part of women in, in public life and in uh, economic life in the Middle East. But instead, we've seen in nation after nation uh, a number of disturbing events. Of course, we see in Syria 30,000 civilians having been killed by the military there. Uh, we see in, in, uh, uh, in Libya uh, an attack uh, apparently by, well, I think we know now, by terrorists of some kind against, uh, against our people there. Four people dead. Our hearts and, and minds go to them. Uh, Mali has been taken over, the northern part of Mali, by al-Qaeda-type uh, individuals. Uh, uh, we have in, in Egypt a Muslim Brotherhood president. And so what we're seeing is a, a, a pretty dramatic reversal in the kind of hopes we had for that region. And of course, the greatest threat of all is Iran four years closer to a nuclear weapon. And, and we're going to have to recognize that we have to do as the president's done. I, I congratulate him on, on taking out Osama bin Laden and going after the leadership in al-Qaeda. But we can't kill our way out of this mess. We're, we're going to have to put in place a very comprehensive and robust strategy to help the, the, the world of Islam and, and other parts of the world reject this radical, violent extremism, which is it's certainly not on the run. It's certainly not uh, hiding. This is a group that is now involved in 10 or, or 12 countries, and it presents an enormous threat to our friends, to the world, uh, to America long term, and we must have a comprehensive strategy to help reject this kind of extremism. Mr. President. Well, my first job as Commander-in-Chief, Bob, is to keep the American people safe, and that's what we've done over the last four years. We ended the war in Iraq refocused our attention on those who actually killed us on 9-11. And as a consequence, al-Qaeda's core leadership has been decimated. In addition, we're now able to transition out of Afghanistan in a responsible way, making sure that Afghans take responsibility for their own security. And that allows us also to rebuild alliances and make friends around the world to combat future threats. Now, with respect to Libya, uh, as I indicated in the last debate, when we received that phone call, I immediately made sure that, number one, we did everything we could to secure those Americans who were still in harm's way. Number two, that we would investigate exactly what happened. And number three, most importantly, that we would go after those who killed Americans and we would bring them to justice. And that's exactly what we're going to do. But I think it's important to step back and think about what happened in Libya. And keep in mind that I and Americans took leadership in organizing an international coalition that made sure that we were able to, without putting troops on the ground, at the cost of less than what we spent in two weeks in Iraq, liberate a country that had been under the yoke of dictatorship for 40 years, got rid of a despot who had killed Americans. And as a consequence, despite this tragedy, you had tens of thousands of Libyans after the events in Benghazi marching and saying, America is our friend. We stand with them. Now, that represents the opportunity we have to take advantage of. And you know, Governor Romney, I'm glad that uh, you agree that we have been successful in going after Al Qaeda. But I have to tell you that you know, your strategy previously has been one that has been all over the map and is not designed to keep Americans safe or to build on the opportunities that exist in the Middle East. Well, my strategy is pretty straightforward, which is uh, to go after the bad guys, uh, to make sure we do our very best to interrupt them, to, to uh, kill them, to uh, uh, take them out of the picture. But my strategy is broader than, than that. That's, that's important, of course. But the key that we're going to have to pursue is a, is a pathway to, to get the Muslim world to be able to reject extremism on its own. We don't want another Iraq. We don't want another Afghanistan. That's not the right course for us. The right course for us is to make sure that we go after the, the people who are leaders of these various anti-American uh, groups and these, these jihadists, but also help the Muslim world. And how do we do that? The group of Arab scholars came together, organized by the UN, to look at 
how we can help the, the world reject these, uh, these terrorists. And the answer they came up with was this, one more economic development. We should key our foreign aid, our direct foreign investment, and that of our friends. We should coordinate it to make sure that we, we push back and give them more economic development. Number two, better education. Number three, gender equality. Number four, the rule of law. We have to help these nations create civil societies. But what's been happening over the last couple of years is as we've watched this tumult in the Middle East, this rising tide of chaos occur, you see Al-Qaeda rushing in, you see other jihadist groups rushing in, and, and they're throughout many nations in the Middle East. It's wonderful that Libya seems to be making some progress, despite this terrible tragedy. But next door, of course, we have Egypt, Libya, 6 million population, Egypt, 80 million population. We, we, want, we want to make sure that we're seeing progress throughout the Middle East, with Mali now having North Mali taken over by al-Qaeda, with Syria having uh, Assad continuing to assassinate, or to kill, to murder his own people. Uh, th this is a region in well, tumult, and of course, Iran, let's say on, on the path to a n nuclear weapon. We've got real we'll problems in the them, region. But let's uh, give uh, the president uh, uh, a chance. Governor Romney, I'm glad that you recognize that al-Qaeda is a threat, because a few months ago, when you were asked what's the biggest geopolitical threat facing America, you said Russia. Not al-Qaeda, you said Russia. In the 1980s, are now calling to ask for their foreign policy back, because you know, the Cold War has been over for 20 years. But, Governor, you know, when it comes to our foreign policy, you seem to want to import the foreign policies of the 1980s, just like the social policies of the 1950s and the economic policies of the 1920s. You say that you're not interested in duplicating what happened in Iraq, but just a few weeks ago you said you think we should have more troops in Iraq right now. And the, the, the challenge we have, I know you haven't been in a position to... to actually execute foreign policy. But every time you've offered an opinion, you've been wrong. You said we should have gone into Iraq, despite the fact that there were no weapons of mass destruction. You said that we should still have troops in Iraq to this day. You indicated that uh, we shouldn't be passing uh, nuclear uh, treaties with Russia, despite the fact that 71 senators, Democrats and Republicans, voted for it. You've said that, first, we should not have a timeline in Afghanistan. Then you said, we should. Now you say, maybe, or it depends. Uh, which means not only were you wrong, but you were also confusing and sending mixed messages both to our troops and our allies. So what, what we need to do with respect to the Middle East is strong, steady leadership, not wrong and reckless leadership that is all over the map. And unfortunately, that's the kind of opinions that you've offered throughout this campaign, and it is not a recipe for American strength or keeping America safe over the I'm long I'm going to add a couple of sec minutes here to give you a chance to respond. Well, of course, uh, I don't uh, concur with what the president said about my own record and the things that I've said. Uh, they don't happen to be accurate. But, uh, but I can say this, that we're talking about the Middle East and how to help the Middle East reject the kind of terrorism we're seeing and the rising tide of tumult and, and confusion. And, and attacking me is not an agenda. Attacking me is not talking about how we're going to deal with the challenges that exist in the Middle East and take advantage of the opportunity there and stem the tide of this violence. But I'll respond to a couple of things you mentioned. First of all, Russia, I indicated, is a geopolitical foe. Not a, Number one excuse me, it's a geopolitical foe. And I said in the, same, in the same paragraph, I said, and Iran is the greatest national security threat we face. Russia does continue to battle us in the UN time and time again. I have clear eyes on this. I'm not going to wear rose-colored glasses when it comes to Russia or Mr. Putin. And I'm certainly not going to say to him, I'll give you more flexibility after the election. After the election, he'll get more backbone. Number two, with regards to Iraq. You and I agreed, I believe, that there should have been a status of forces agreement. That's Did you? True. Oh, you didn't, you didn't want a status of forces no, agreement? No, what I, what I would not have done is left 10,000 troops in Iraq that would tie us down. That certainly would not help us in the Middle East. I'm sorry, Look, you actually, there was, a, there was an here, effort on the part of the president to have a status is, of forces agreement, is, and I concurred in that and said that we should have some number of troops that stayed on. That okay. was something I concurred with. Go that Governor, was your posture. That was my posture as well. You that, thought it should have been 5,000 troops. Governor, I thought it should have been more troops. But you know the, what? The answer was we got no troops ago. through whatsoever. Th this is just this a is, few weeks ago that you indicated that we should still have troops in Iraq. No, I didn't. Now, I'm sorry. That's just, that, you, I, you made I a major speech. I indicated that you 
failed to put in place a status Governor. of forces agreement at the end of the conflict that existed. Governor, right. here, here's, 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 here's one thing, I've, here's let, one let thing, I've, here's, here's one thing I've learned as Commander-in-Chief. You've got to be clear, both to our allies and our enemies, about where you stand and what you mean. Now, you just gave a speech a few weeks ago in which you said we should still have troops in Iraq. That is not a recipe for making sure that we are taking advantage of the opportunities and meeting the challenges of the Middle East. Now, it is absolutely true that we cannot just meet these challenges militarily. And so what I've done throughout my presidency and will continue to do is, number one, make sure that these countries are supporting our counterterrorism efforts. Number two, make sure that they are standing by uh, our interests in Israel's security, because it is a true friend and our greatest ally in the region. Number three, we do have to make sure that we're protecting religious minorities and women because these countries can't develop unless all the population, not just half of it, is developing. Number four, we do have to develop their economic, uh, their economic capabilities. But number five, the other thing that we have to do is recognize that we can't continue to do nation building in these regions. Part of American leadership is making sure that we're doing nation right. building here at home. That will help us uh, maintain the kind of American leadership that we need. Let me uh, interject the second topic question in this segment about the Middle East and so on. And that is, uh, you both mentioned, uh, alluded to this, and that is Syria. War in Syria is now spilled over into Lebanon. We have, what, uh, more than 100 people that were killed there in a bomb. There were demonstrations there, eight people dead. Uh, Mr. President, it's been more than a year since you, saw, uh, you told Assad uh, he had to go since then 30,000 Syrians have died. Uh, we've had 300,000 refugees. The war goes on. He's still there. Should we reassess our policy and see if we can find a better way to influence events there, or is that even possible? And it's you, you go first, sir. What we've done is organize the international community saying Assad has to go. We've mobilized sanctions against that government. We have made sure that they are isolated. We have provided humanitarian assistance, and we are helping the opposition organize, and we're particularly interested in making sure that we're mobilizing the moderate forces inside of Syria. But ultimately, Syrians are going to have to determine their own future. And so everything we're doing, we're doing in consultation with our partners in the region, including Israel which obviously has a huge interest in seeing what happens in Syria, coordinating with Turkey and other countries in the region that have a great interest in this. Now, this, what we're seeing taking place in Syria is heartbreaking, and that's why we are going to do everything we can to make sure that we are helping the opposition. But we also have to recognize that you know, for us to get more entangled militarily in Syria is a serious step, and we have to do so making absolutely certain that we know who we are helping, that we're not putting arms in the hands of folks who eventually could turn them against us or our allies in the region. And I am confident that Assad's days are numbered. But what we can't do uh, is to simply suggest that, as Governor Romney at times has suggested, that uh, giving heavy weapons, for example, to the Syrian opposition uh, is a simple proposition that would lead us to be safer over the long term. Governor? Well, let's step back and talk about what's happening in Syria and how important it is. Uh, first of all, 30,000 people being killed by their government is a humanitarian disaster. Secondly, Syria is an opportunity for us because Syria plays an important role in the Middle East, particularly right now. Syria is Iran's only ally in the Arab world. It's their route to the sea. It's the route for them to arm Hezbollah in Lebanon, which threatens, of course, our ally Israel. And so seeing Syria remove Assad is a very high priority for us. Number two, seeing a, a, the replacement government being responsible people is critical for us. And finally, we don't want to have military involvement there. We don't want to get drawn into a military conflict. And so the right course for us is working through our partners and with our own resources to identify responsible parties within Syria organize them, bring them together in a, in a form of, of not, if not government, a form of, of, of council that can take the lead in Syria and then make sure they have the arms necessary to defend themselves. We do need to make sure that they don't have arms that get into the, the wrong hands, that those arms could be used to hurt us down the road. 
We need to make sure as well that we coordinate this effort with our allies and particularly with, with, with Israel. But the Saudis and the Qatari and, and, and the Turks are all very concerned about this. They're willing to work with us. We need to have a very effective leadership effort in Syria, making sure that the, the, the insurgents there are armed and that the insurgents that become armed are people who will be the responsible parties. Recognize, I believe that Assad must go. I believe he will go. But I believe we want to make sure that we have the relationships of friendship with the people that take his place, such that in the years to come, we see Syria as a, as a friend and Syria as a responsible party in the Middle East. This, this is a critical opportunity for America. And what I'm afraid of is that we've watched over the past year or so, first the president saying, well, we'll let the UN deal with it. And Assad, uh, excuse me, uh, Kofi Annan came in and, and said, we're going to try to have a ceasefire. That didn't work. Then it looked to the Russians and said, uh, let's see if you can do something. We should be playing the leadership role there, not on the ground with military. All right. But Bob, Play the leadership are, role. We are playing the leadership role. We organized the Friends of Syria. We are mobilizing humanitarian support and support for the opposition. And we are making sure that those we help are those who will be friends of ours in the long term and friends of our allies in the region over the long term. But you know, going back to Libya, because this is an example of, of how we make choices. You know, when we went into Libya and we were able to immediately stop the massacre there because of the unique circumstances and the coalition that we had helped to organize, we also had to make sure that Muammar Gaddafi didn't stay there. And to the governor's credit, you supported us going into Libya and the coalition that we organized. But when it came time to making sure that Gaddafi did not stay in power, that he was captured, Governor, your suggestion was that uh, this was mission creep, that this was mission muddle. Imagine if we had pulled out at that point. You know, Muammar Gaddafi had more American blood on his hands than any individual other than Osama bin Laden. And so we were going to make sure that we finished the job. That's part of the reason why the Libyans stand with us. But we did so in a careful, thoughtful way, making certain that we knew who we were dealing with, that th those forces of moderation on the ground were ones that we could work with, and we have to take the same kind of steady, thoughtful leadership when it comes to Syria. That's exactly what we're doing. Uh, Governor, can I just ask you, would you go beyond what the administration would do? Like, for example, would you put in no-fly zones over Syria? I don't, I don't want to have our military involved in, in Syria. Uh, I don't think there's a necessity to put our military uh, in Syria at, at this stage, and I don't anticipate that in the future. As I indicated, our objectives are to replace Assad and to have in place a new government which is friendly to us, a responsible government if, if possible, and I want to make sure they get armed and they have the arms necessary to defend themselves but also to, to, remove, uh, to remove Assad. But I do not want to see a military involvement on the part of, of, our, of our troops. What? Uh, and this, this, isn't, this isn't going to be necessary. We, we have, with our partners in the region, we have uh, sufficient resources to support those groups. But look, this has been going on for a year. This is a time, this should have been a time for American leadership. We should have taken a leading role, not militarily, but a leading role organizationally, governmentally, to bring together the parties there to find responsible parties. As you hear from intelligence sources even today, the, 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 the insurgents are highly disparate. They haven't come together. They haven't formed a unity group, a, co a council of some kind. That needs to happen. American can help that happen. And we need to make sure they have the arms they need to carry out the, the very important role, which is getting rid of Assad. Can we get a quick response, Mr. Well, President, because I want to ask I'll, about I'll, Egypt. I'll be, I'll be very quick. Uh, what you just heard Governor Romney said is uh, he doesn't have different ideas, uh, and that's because we're doing exactly what we should be doing to try to promote uh, a moderate Syrian leadership and a, an effective transition so that we get Assad out. That's the kind of leadership we've shown. That's the kind of leadership we'll continue to show. May I ask you, um, you know, during the Egyptian turmoil, uh, there came a point when you said it was time for President Mubarak to go. Right. Uh, some in your administration thought perhaps we should have waited a while on that. Uh, do you have any regrets about that? No, I don't, because I think that America has to stand with democracy. The notion that we would have uh, tanks run over those young people who were in Tahrir Square, that is not the kind of American leadership that John F. Kennedy talked about 50 years ago. But what I've also said is that 
now that you have a democratically elected government in Egypt, that they have to make sure that they take responsibility for protecting religious minorities. And we have put significant pressure on them to make sure they're doing that. To recognize the rights of women, which is critical throughout the region. These countries can't develop if young women are not given the kind of education that they need. They have to abide by their treaty with Israel. That is a red line for us, because not only is Israel's security at stake, but our security is at stake if that unravels. They have to make sure that they're cooperating with us when it comes to counterterrorism. And we will help them with respect to uh, developing their own economy, because ultimately, uh, what's going to make the Egyptian revolution successful for the people of Egypt, but also for the world, is if those young people who gathered there are seeing opportunities. Their aspirations are similar to young people's here. They want jobs. They want uh, to be able to make sure their kids are going to a good school. They want to make sure that uh, they have a roof over their heads and that they have uh, uh, the prospects of a better life in the future. And so one of the things that we've been doing is, is for example, organizing entrepreneurship conferences with these Egyptians to, to give them a sense of how they can start rebuilding their economy in a way that's non-corrupt, that's transparent. Uh, but what is also important for us to understand is, is that for America to be successful in this region, uh, there are some things that we're going to have to do here at home as well. Uh, the, you know, one of the challenges over the last decade is we've done uh, uh, experiments in nation building in places like Iraq and Afghanistan. And we've neglected, for example, developing uh, our own economy, our own energy sectors, our own education system. And it's very hard for us to project leadership around the world when we're not doing what we need to do. Governor there. Romney, uh, uh, I want to hear your response to that, but I would just ask you, would you have stuck with Mubarak? Uh, no, I, I believe, as the president uh, indicated and, and said at the time, that I supported his, his action there. I felt that uh, I, I wish we'd have had a better vision of the future. I, I wish that looking back at the beginning of the president's term and even further back than that, that we'd have recognized that there was a growing uh, energy and passion for freedom in that part of the world and that we would have worked more aggressively with our, our friend and with other friends in the region to have them make the transition towards a more representative form of government such that it didn't explode in the way it did. But, but once it exploded, uh, I felt the same as the president did, which is these, these freedom voices and the, the, the streets of, of, of Egypt were the people who were, were speaking of our principles and the, the uh, President Mubarak had done things which were unimaginable. Uh, and, the, and the idea of him crushing his people was not something that we could possibly uh, support. Let me, let me step back and talk about wh what I think our mission has to be in the Middle East and even more broadly. Because our purpose is to make sure the world is, more, is peaceful. We, we want a peaceful planet. We want people to be able to enjoy their lives and know they're going to have a bright and prosperous future and not be at war. That's our purpose. And the mantle of, of leadership for the, promoting the principles of peace has fallen to America. We didn't ask for it, but it's an honor that we have it. But for us to be able to promote those principles of peace requires us to be strong. And that begins with a strong economy here at home. And unfortunately, the economy is not stronger. When the, when the, uh, the president of, of, of Iraq, excuse me, of Iran, Ahmadinejad, says that our debt makes us not a great country, uh, that's a frightening thing. The, the former chief of, uh, chief of the uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff said that, uh, Admiral Mullen, said that our debt is the biggest national security threat we face. This, we have weakened our economy. We need a strong economy. We need to have as well a strong military. Our military is second to none in the world. We're blessed with terrific soldiers and extraordinary technology and intelligence. But the idea of a trillion dollars in cuts through sequestration and budget cuts to the military would change that. We need to have strong allies. Our association and, and connection with our allies is essential to America's strength. We're the, the great nation that has allies, 42 allies and friends around the world. And finally, we have to stand by our principles. And if we're strong in each of those things, American influence will grow. But unfortunately, in nowhere in the world is America's influence greater today than it was four years ago. All right. And that's because we become right, weaker but, uh, on each uh, of those four dimensions. Perfect. You're going to get a chance to respond to that because that's a perfect segue into our next segment. And that is, what is... America's role in the world. And that is the question. What do each of you see as our role in the world? And uh, I believe, Governor Romney, it's your turn to go first. Well, I, I absolutely believe that America has a, a responsibility and the privilege of helping defend freedom and promote the principles uh, that, that make the world more peaceful. And those principles include human rights, human dignity, free enterprise, freedom of expression, 
elections because when there are elections, people tend to vote for peace. They don't vote for war. So we want to promote those principles around the world. We recognize that there are places of conflict in the world. We want to end those conflicts to the extent humanly possible. But in order to be able to fulfill our role in the world, America must be strong. America must lead. And for that to happen, we have to strengthen our economy here at home. You can't have 23 million people struggling to get a job. You, you can't have an economy that over the last three years keeps slowing down its growth rate. You can't have kids coming out of college, half of whom can't find a job today or a job that's commensurate with their college degree. We have to get our economy going. And our military. We've got to strengthen our military long term. We don't know what the world is going to throw at us down the road. We, we make decisions today in a military that, that will confront challenges we can't imagine. In the 2000 debates, uh, there was no mention of terrorism, for instance. And a year later, 9-11 happened. So we have to make decisions based upon uncertainty. And that means a strong military. I will not cut our military budget. We have to also stand by our allies. I, I think the tension that existed between Israel and the United States was very unfortunate. I think also that pulling our missile defense uh, program out of Poland in the way we did was also unfortunate in terms of, uh, if you will, disrupting the, the, the relationship in some ways that existed between us. And then, of course, with regards to standing for our principles, when, when the students took to the streets in Tehran and the people there protested, the Green Revolution occurred. For the president to be silent, I thought, was an enormous mistake. We have to stand for our principles, stand for our allies, stand for a strong military, and stand for a stronger economy. Mr. President. America remains the one indispensable nation, and the world needs a strong America, and it is stronger now than when I came into office. Because we ended the war in Iraq, we were able to refocus our attention on not only the terrorist threat, but also beginning a transition process in Afghanistan. It also allowed us to refocus on alliances and relationships that had been neglected for a decade. And Governor Romney, our alliances have never been stronger. In Asia, in Europe, in Africa, with Israel, where we have unprecedented military uh, and intelligence cooperation, including dealing with the Iranian threat. But what we also have been able to do is position ourselves so we can start rebuilding America. And that's what my plan does. Making sure that we're bringing manufacturing back to our shores so that we're creating jobs here, as we've done with the auto industry, not rewarding companies that are shipping jobs overseas, making sure that we've got the best education system in the world, including retraining our workers for the jobs of tomorrow, doing everything we can to control our own energy. We've cut our oil imports to the lowest level in two decades because we've developed oil and natural gas, but we also have to develop clean energy uh, technologies that will allow us to cut our exports in half by 2020. That's the kind of leadership that we need to show. And we've got to make sure that we reduce our deficit. Unfortunately, Governor Romney's plan doesn't do it. We've got to do it in a responsible way, by cutting out spending we don't need, but also by asking the wealthiest to pay a little bit more. That way we can invest in the research and technology that's always kept us at the cutting edge. Now, Governor Romney has taken a different approach throughout this campaign. You know, both at home and abroad, he has proposed wrong and reckless policies. You know, he's praised George Bush as a good economic steward and Dick Cheney as somebody who shows great wisdom and judgment. And taking us back to those kinds of strategies that got us into this mess are not the way that we are going to maintain leadership in the 21st century. Governor Romney, wrong and reckless policies? <laughs> uh, I've got a policy for the future and an agenda for the future. And when it comes to our economy here at home, I know what it takes to create 12 million new jobs and rising take-home pay. And what we've seen over the last four years is something I don't want to see over the next four years. The, the president said by now we'd be at 5.4 percent unemployment. We're nine million jobs short of that. I will get America working again and see rising take-home pay again, and I'll do it with five simple steps. Number one, we are going to have North American energy independence. We're going to do it by taking full advantage of oil, coal, gas, nuclear, and our renewables. Number two, 
We're going to increase our trade. Trade grows about 12% per year. It doubles about every, every five or, or so years. We can do better than that, particularly in Latin America. The opportunities for us in Latin America, we have just not taken advantage of fully. As a matter of fact, Latin America's economy is almost as big as the economy of China. We're all focused on China. Latin America is a huge opportunity for us. Time zone, language opportunities. Number three, we're going to have to have training programs that work for our workers and schools that finally put the parents and the teachers and the kids first and the teachers union is going to have to go behind. And then we're going to have to get to a balanced budget. We can't expect entrepreneurs and businesses large and small to take their life savings or their company's money and invest in America if they think we're headed to the road to Greece. And that's where we're going right now unless we finally get off this spending and borrowing binge. And I'll get us on track to a balanced budget. And finally, number five, we've got to champion small business. Small businesses where, sm where jobs come from, two-thirds of our jobs come from small businesses. New business formation is down at the lowest level in 30 years under this administration. I want to bring it back and get back good jobs and rising take-home pay. Well, let's talk about what we need to compete. Uh, first of all, Governor Romney talks about small businesses, but Governor, when you were uh, in Massachusetts, uh, small businesses uh, development ranked about 48th, I think, out of 50 states in Massachusetts, because the policies that you're promoting actually don't help small businesses. And the way you define small businesses include uh, folks at the very top, and they include you and me. That's not the kind of small business promotion we need, but, but let's take uh, an example that we know is going to make a difference in the 21st century, and that's our education policy. We didn't have a lot of chance to talk about this in the last debate. You know, under my leadership, what we've done is reformed education, working with governors, 46 states. We've seen progress and gains in schools that were having a terrible time, and they're starting to finally make progress. And what I now want to do is to hire more teachers, especially in math and science, because we know that we've fallen behind when it comes to math and science. And those teachers can make a difference. Now, Governor Romney, when you were asked by teachers whether or not uh, this would help the economy grow, you said this isn't going to help the economy grow. When you were asked about reduced class sizes, you said class sizes don't make a difference. But I tell you, if you talk to teachers, they will tell you it does make a difference. And if we've got math teachers who are able to provide the kind of support that they need for our kids, that's what's going to determine whether or not the new businesses are created here, companies are going to locate here, depending on whether we've got the most highly skilled workforce, and the kinds of budget proposals that you've put forward, when we don't ask either you or me to pay a dime more in terms of reducing the deficit, but instead we slash support for education, that's undermining our long-term competitiveness. That is not good for America's position in the world. And the world notices. Let me get I, back to foreign well, policy. Well, Can let, I just well, get back? Well, uh, well I, I need to speak a moment. If you okay. Let me, Bob, just about education, because okay. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm so proud of the state that I had the chance to be governor of. Um, we have, uh, uh, every two years, tests that look at how well our kids are doing. Fourth graders and eighth graders are tested in English and math. While I was governor, I was proud that our fourth graders came out number one of all 50 states in English, and then also in math. And our eighth graders, number one in English, and also in math. First time one state had been number one in all four measures. How do we do that? Well, Republicans and Democrats came together on a bipartisan basis to put in place education principles that focused on having great teachers in the classroom. Ten years and that was, what was, that was what allowed us to become the number one state in the nation. But that was ten and years is, before you took and office. We were, and, we were, and, absolutely. and then you the, cut education the first, spending when the you came first, into office. The first, and we kept our schools number one in the nation. They're still number one today. All right. And the principles that we put in place, we also gave kids not just a graduation exam that, that determined whether they were up to the skills needed to, to be able to compete, but also if they graduated the top quarter of their class, they got a four-year tuition-free ride at any Massachusetts public institution of higher learning. That happened Governor, before you came into office. Well, that right? was actually mine, actually. Uh, Mr. President, you got that just, fact wrong. I, I want to try to shift it because we have heard some of this in the other debates. Governor, you say you want a bigger military. You want a bigger Navy. Uh, you don't want to cut defense spending. Uh, what I want to ask you, we're talking about financial problems in this country. Where are you going to get the money? Well, let's, let's come back and talk about the military, but all the, way, all the way through. First of all, I'm going through from the very beginning, we're going to cut about 5% of the uh, discretionary budget, excluding military. That's number one. But can all right? you do and this without 
You know, the, the, good, the good news is I'll, you, I'll be happy to have you take a look. Come on our website. You'll look at how we get to a balanced budget within eight to ten years. We do it by getting by reducing spending in a whole series of programs. By the way, number one I get rid of is Obamacare. Uh, there, there are a number of things that sound good, but frankly, we just can't afford them. And that one doesn't sound good, and it's not affordable. So I get rid of that one from day one. I, to the extent humanly possible, we get that out. We take program after program that we don't absolutely have to have, and we t get rid of them. Number two, we take some programs that we are going to keep, like Medicaid, which is a program for the poor. We take that health care program for the poor, and we give it to the states to run because states run these programs more efficiently. As a governor, I thought, please, give me this program. Can he I do can, that? I can run this Mr. more efficiently Preston. than the federal government. And states, by the way, are proving it. States like Arizona, Rhode Island, have taken these, these Medicaid dollars, have shown they can run these programs more cost effectively. Bob, and but, so I want to do those two things. It, okay. gets us, it gets us to a balanced budget with eight in eight to ten years. Bob, but the military, let, let's, but let's, let's come back to the military, though. Well, you, well, well that's what, what I'm trying to find well, out. Let's talk about the military. Wanna, you should have answered the first question. Uh, Look, Governor Romney's called for $5 trillion of tax cuts that he says he's going to pay for by closing deductions. Now, the math doesn't work, but he continues to claim that he's going to do it. He then wants to spend another $2 trillion on military spending that our military is not asking for. Now, keep in mind that mil our military spending has gone up every single year that I've been in office. We spend more on our military than the next 10 countries combined. China, Russia, France, the United, United Kingdom, you name it. Next 10. And what I did was work with our Joint Chiefs of Staff to think about what are we going to need in the future to make sure that we are safe. And that's the budget that we've put forward. But what you can't do is spend $2 trillion in additional military spending that the military is not asking for, $5 trillion on tax cuts. You say that you're going to pay for it by closing loopholes and deductions without naming what those loopholes and deductions are. And then somehow you're also going to deal with the deficit that we've already got. The math simply doesn't work. But when it comes to our military, what we have to think about is not you know, just budgets. We've got to think about capabilities. We need to be thinking about cybersecurity. We need to th be thinking about space. That's exactly what our budget does, but it's driven by strategy. It's not driven by politics. It's not driven by members of Congress and what they would like to see. It's driven by what are we going to need to keep the American people safe. That's exactly what our budget does. And it also then allows us to reduce our deficit, which is a significant national security concern, because we've got to make sure that our economy is strong at home so that we can project military power overseas. Bob, uh, I'm pleased that I balance budgets. I was in the world of business for 25 years. If you didn't balance your budget, you went out of business. I went to the Olympics that was out of balance, and we got it on balance and made a success there. I had the chance to be governor of state. Four years in a row, Democrats and Republicans came together to balance the budget. We cut taxes 19 times, balanced our budget. The president hasn't balanced a budget yet. I expect to have the opportunity to do so myself. All right. I, I'm going to be able to balance the budget. Let's talk about military spending, and that's this. About our 30 Navy, seconds. Our Navy is older, excuse me, our Navy is smaller now than any time since 1917. The Navy said they needed 313 ships to carry out their mission. We're not under 285. We're headed down to the, to the low 200s if we go through with sequestration. That's unacceptable to me. I want to make sure that we have the ships that are required by our Navy. Our Air Force is older and smaller than any time since it was founded in 1947. We've changed for the first time since FDR. We all, since FDR, we had the, we've always had the strategy of saying we could fight in two conflicts at once. Now we're changing to one conflict. Look, the, the, this, in my view, is the highest responsibility of the President of the United States, which is to maintain the safety of the American people. And I will not cut our military budget by a trillion dollars, which is the combination of the budget cuts that the President has, as well as the sequestration cuts. That, in my view, is, is, is making our future less certain and less secure. Bob, I just need to comment on this. First of all, the sequester is not something that I proposed. It's something that Congress has proposed. It will not happen. The budget that we're talking about is not reducing our military spending. It's maintaining it. But uh, I think Governor Romney maybe uh, hasn't spent enough time looking at how our military works. You, you mentioned the Navy, for example. 
and that we have fewer ships than we did in 1916. Well, Governor, we also have fewer horses and bayonets because the nature of our military has changed. We have these things called aircraft carriers where planes land on them. We have these ships that go underwater, nuclear submarines. And so the question is not uh, a game of battleship where we're counting ships. It's, it's what are our capabilities? And so when I sit down with the Secretary of the Navy and the Joint Chiefs of Staff, we determine how are we going to be best able to meet all of our defense needs in a way that also keeps faith with our troops, that also makes sure that our veterans have uh, the kind of support that they need when they come home. And that is not reflected in the kind of budget that you're putting forward because it just doesn't work. All right. And, and you know, we visited the website quite a bit and it still doesn't work. A lot to cover. I'd like, I'd like to move to the uh, next uh, segment, Red Lines, Israel and Iran. Would either of you, and you'll have two minutes, and uh, President Obama, you have the first go at this one. Would either of you be willing to declare that an attack on Israel is an attack on the United States? Which, of course, is the same promise that we give to our close allies like Japan. And if you made such a declaration, uh, would not that deter Iran? It's uh, certainly deterred the uh, Soviet Union for a long, long time when we made that uh, we made, we made that uh, promise to our allies, Mr. President. First of all, Israel is a true friend. It is our greatest ally in the region. And if Israel is attacked, America will stand with Israel. I've made that clear throughout my presidency. So you're, you're saying I, we've already made that declaration. I will stand with Israel if they are attacked. And this is the reason why, uh, working with Israel, we have created the strongest military and intelligence cooperation between our two countries in history. In fact, this week we'll be carrying out the largest military exercise with Israel in history, this very week. But to the issue of Iran, you know, as long as I'm President of the United States, Iran will not get a nuclear weapon. I made that clear when I came into office. We then organized the strongest coalition and the strongest sanctions against Iran in history, and it is crippling their economy. Their currency has dropped 80%. Their oil production has plunged to the lowest level since they were fighting a war with Iraq 20 years ago. So their economy is in a shambles. And the reason we did this is because a nuclear Iran is a threat to our national security, and it's a threat to Israel's national security. We cannot afford to have a nuclear arms race in the most volatile region of the world. Iran's a state sponsor of terrorism, and for them to be able to provide nuclear technology to non-state actors. That's unacceptable. And they have said that they want to see Israel wiped off the map. So the work that we've done with respect to sanctions now offers Iran a choice. They can take the diplomatic route and end their nuclear program, or they will have to face a united world and a United States president, me, who said, we're not going to take any options off the table. The disagreement I have with Governor Romney is that during the course of this campaign, he's often talked as if we should take premature military action. I think that would be a mistake because when I've sent young men and women into harm's way, I always understand that that is the last resort, not the first resort. Two minutes. Well, first of all, um, I, I want to underscore the, the same point the president made, which is that if I'm president of the United States, when I'm president of the United States, we will stand with Israel. And, and if Israel is attacked, we have their back. Not just diplomatically, not just culturally, but militarily. That's number one. Number two, with regards to, to Iran and the threat of Iran. There's no question but that a nuclear Iran, a nuclear capable Iran, is unacceptable to America. It presents a threat not only to our friends, but ultimately a threat to us to have Iran have nuclear material, nuclear weapons that could be used against us or to use to be threatening to us. It's also essential for us to understand what our mission is in Iran, and that is to dissuade Iran from having a nuclear weapon through peaceful and diplomatic means. And crippling sanctions are something I called for five years ago when I was in Israel speaking at the Herzliya conference. I laid out seven steps. Crippling sanctions were number one, and they do work. You're seeing it right now in the economy. It's absolutely the right thing to do to have crippling sanctions. I'd have put them in place earlier, but it's good that we have them. Number two, something I would add today is I would tighten those sanctions. I would say that 
uh, uh, ships that carry Iranian oil can't come into our ports. I imagine the EU would agree with us as well. Not only ships couldn't, I'd say companies that are moving their oil can't, people who are trading in their oil can't, I would tighten those sanctions further. Secondly, I'd take on diplomatic isolation efforts. I'd make sure that Ahmadinejad is indicted under the Genocide Convention. His words amount to genocide incitation. I would indict him for it. I would also make sure that their diplomats are treated like the pariah they are around the world. The same way we treated the apartheid diplomats of South Africa. We need to increase pressure time and time again on Iran because anything other than a, a, uh, a solution to this which, says, which stops this, this nuclear folly of theirs is unacceptable to America. And of course, a military action is the last resort. It is something one would only, only consider if all of the other avenues had been, uh, had been uh, tried to their full extent. Let me ask both of you, there, as you know, there are reports that Iran and the United States as part of an international group have agreed in principle uh, to talks about Iran's nuclear program. What is the deal, if there are such talks, what is the deal that you would accept, Mr. President? Well, first of all, uh, those are reports in the newspaper. Uh, they are not true. Uh, but our goal is to get Iran to recognize it needs to give up its nuclear program and abide by the UN resolutions that have been in place because they have the opportunity to re-enter the community of nations. And we would welcome that. There are, there are people in Iran who have the same aspirations as people all around the world for a better life. And we hope that their leadership takes the right decision. But the deal we'll accept is they end their nuclear program. It's very straightforward. And you know, I'm glad that Governor Romney agrees with the steps that we're taking. Uh, I, you know, there have been times, Governor, frankly, during the course of this campaign where uh, it sounded like uh, you thought that you'd do the same things we did, but you'd say them louder, and somehow that, that would make a difference. And it turns out that the work involved in setting up these crippling sanctions is painstaking. It's meticulous. We started from the day we got into office, and the reason it was so important, and this is a testament to how we've restored American credibility and strength around the world, is we had to make sure that all the countries participated, even countries like Russia and China. Because if it's just us that are imposing sanctions, we've had sanctions in place for a long time. It's because we got everybody to agree that Iran is seeing so much pressure. And we've got to maintain that pressure. There is a deal to be had. And that is that they abide by the rules that have already been established. They convince the international community they are not pursuing a nuclear program. There are inspections that are very intrusive. But over time, what they can do is re uh, regain credibility. In the meantime, though, we're not going to let up the pressure until we have clear evidence that, that takes place. And one last thing, I'm, uh, just, just to make this point. The clock is ticking. Uh, we're not going to allow Iran to perpetually engage in negotiations that lead nowhere. And I've been very clear to them. You know, because of the intelligence coordination that we do with a range of countries, including Israel, we have a sense of when they would get breakout capacity which means that we would not be able to intervene in time to stop their nuclear program. And that clock is ticking. And All we're right. going to make sure that uh, if they do not meet uh, the demands of the international community, then uh, we are going to take all options necessary to make sure they don't have a nuclear war. Governor. I think uh, from the very beginning, one of the challenges we've had with Iran is that they have looked at this administration and, and felt that the administration was not as strong as it needed to be. I think they saw weakness where they had expected to find American strength. And I say that because from the very beginning, the president in his campaign some four years ago said he'd meet with all the world's worst actors in his first year. Uh, he'd sit down with Chavez and, and Kim Jong-il, uh, with uh, uh, Castro, and with, uh, with President Ahmadinejad of, of Iran. And, uh, and I think they looked and thought, well, that's an unusual uh, honor to receive from the president of the United States. And then the president began what I've called an apology tour of going to, to various nations in the Middle East and, and criticizing America. I think they looked at that and saw weakness. Then when there were dissidents in the streets of Tehran, a green revolution, uh, holding signs saying, is America with us? The president was silent. I think they noticed that as well. And, and I think that when the president said he was gonna create daylight between ourselves and Israel, that, that they noticed that as well. 
All of these things suggested, I think, to the Iranian mullahs that, hey, you know, we can keep on pushing along here. We can keep talks going on, but we're just going to keep on spinning centrifuges. Now there are some 10,000 centrifuges spinning uranium, preparing to, to create a, a, a nuclear threat to the United States and to the world. That's unacceptable for us, and, and it's essential for a president to show strength from the very beginning to make it very clear what is acceptable and not acceptable. And an Iranian nuclear program is not acceptable to us. They must not develop nuclear capability. And the way to make sure they understand that is by having from the very beginning the tightest sanctions possible. They need to be tightened. Our diplomatic isolation needs to be tougher. We need to indict Ahmadinejad. We need to put the pressure on them as hard as we possibly can. Because if we do that, we won't have to take the military action. Bob, let me just respond. Nothing Governor Romney just said is true, starting with this notion of me apologizing. Th this has been uh, probably the biggest whopper that's been told during the course of this campaign. And every fact checker and every reporter has looked at it. Governor has said this is not true. And when it comes to tightening sanctions, look, as I said before, we've put in the toughest, most crippling sanctions ever. And the fact is, while we were coordinating an international coalition to make sure these sanctions were effective, you were still invested in a Chinese state oil company that was doing business with the Iranian oil sector. So I'll let the American people decide, judge, who's going to be more effective and more credible when it comes to imposing crippling sanctions. And with respect to our attitude about the Iranian revolution, I was very clear about the murderous activities that had taken place, and that was contrary to international law and everything that civilized uh, people stand for. And, and so the strength that we have shown in Iran is shown by the fact that we've been able to mobilize the world. When I came into office, the world was divided. Iran was resurgent. Iran is at its weakest point economically, strategically, militarily, than, since, uh, than in many years. And we are going to continue to keep the pressure on to make sure that they do not get a nuclear weapon. That's in America's national interest, and that will be the case uh, so long as I'm president. We're four years closer to a nuclear Iran. We're four years closer to a nuclear Iran. And, and we should not have wasted these four years to the extent they've, they've continued to be able to spin these centrifuges and get that much closer. That's number one. Number two, Mr. President, the reason I call it an apology tour is because you went to the Middle East and you flew to, to Egypt and to Saudi Arabia and to, and to Turkey and Iraq. And, and by the way, you skipped Israel, our closest friend in the region. But you went to the other nations. And by the way, they noticed that you skipped Israel. And then in those nations, and on Arabic TV, you said that America had been dismissive and derisive. You said that on occasion, America had dictated to other nations. Mr. President, America has not dictated to other nations. We have freed other nations from dictators. Um, let, me, let me respond. Uh, you know, if, if we're going to talk about trips that we've taken, you know, when I was a candidate for office, first trip I took was to visit our troops. And when I went to Israel as a candidate, I didn't take donors. I didn't attend fundraisers. I went to Yad Vashem. The, the Holocaust Museum there, to remind myself the, the nature of evil and why our bond with Israel will be unbreakable. And then I went down to the border towns of Starot, which had experienced missiles raining down from Hamas. And I saw families there who showed me where missiles had come down near their children's bedrooms. And I was reminded of, of what that would mean if those were my kids, which is why as president, we funded an Iron Dome program to stop those missiles. So that's how I've used my travels, when I travel to Israel and when I travel to the region. And the, the central question at this point is going to be, who's going to be credible to all parties involved? And they can look at my track record, whether it's Iran sanctions, whether it's dealing with counterterrorism, whether it's supporting democracy, whether it's supporting women's rights, whether it's supporting religious minorities, and they can say that the President of the United States and the United States of America has stood on the right side of history. And, and, and that kind of credibility 
uh, is precisely why we've been able to show leadership on a wide range of issues facing the world right now. What if, what if the Prime Minister of Israel called you on the phone and said, our bombers are on the way, we're going to bomb Iran? What do you Bob, say? Is, it, let's not go into hypotheticals of that nature. Uh, our relationship with Israel, my relationship with the Prime Minister of Israel is such that we would not get a call saying our bombers are on the way uh, or their fighters are on the way. Uh, this is the kind of thing that, that uh, would have been discussed and, and thoroughly evaluated well before that kind of so last minute. So you say minute. it just wouldn't that's, that's Okay, just, that's, well, let's see what uh, but, but let, me, let, me, so let me come back. Let's, let's, come, back. let's come back and go back to what the president was speaking no. about, which is what's happening in the world. And, 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 and the, the president's statement. That, that things are going so well. Look, I, I look at what's happening around the world and I see Iran four years closer to a bomb. I see the Middle East with a rising tide of violence, chaos, tumult. I see uh, jihadists uh, continuing to spread. Uh, whether they're rising or just about the same level, hard to, hard to uh, uh, precisely measure, but this, it's clear they're there. They're very, very strong. I see Syria with 30,000 civilians dead. Assad is still in power. I see our trade deficit with China uh, larger than it's uh, growing larger every year, as a matter of fact. I, I look around the world and I, I don't feel that, that you see North Korea uh, continuing to export their nuclear technology. Russia said they're not going to follow Nun Luger anymore. Uh, they're back away from pro uh, nuclear proliferation uh, treaties that we had with them. I, I look around the world. I don't see our influence growing around the world. I see our influence receding in part because of the failure of the president to deal with our economic challenges at home, in part because of our withdrawal from our commitment to our military in the way I think it ought to be, in part because of the, the, um, uh, the turmoil with Israel. I mean, the president received a letter from 38 Democrat senators saying the tensions with Israel were a real problem. They asked him, please repair the tension. Democrat senators, please repair the damage right. in, his, in his own party. Governor, the, the problem is, is that on a whole range of issues, whether it's the Middle East, whether it's Afghanistan, whether it's Iraq, whether it's now uh, Iran, uh, you've been all over the map. I mean, I'm, I'm pleased that you now are endorsing our policy of applying diplomatic pressure and potentially having uh, bilateral discussions with the Iranians to end their nuclear program. But just a few years ago, you said that's something you'd never do. In the same way that you initially opposed a timetable in Afghanistan. Now you're for it, although it depends. In the same way that you say you would have ended the war in Iraq, but recently gave a speech saying that we should have 20,000 more folks in there. The same way that you said that it was mission creep to go after uh, Gaddafi. When it comes to going after Osama bin Laden, you said, well, any president would make that call. But when you were a candidate in 2008, as I was, and I said, if I got bin Laden in our sights, I would take that shot, you said, we shouldn't move heaven and earth to get one man. And you said, we should ask Pakistan for permission. And if we had asked Pakistan for permission, we would not have gotten it. And it was worth moving heaven and earth to get him. You know, after we killed bin Laden, I was at ground zero for a memorial and talked to a, a, a young woman who was four years old when 9-11 uh, happened. And the last conversation she had with her father was him calling from the Twin Towers, saying, Peyton, I love you and I will always watch it over you. And for the next decade, she was haunted by that conversation. And she said to me, you know, by finally getting bin Laden, uh, that brought some closure to me. And when we do things like that, when, when we bring those who have harmed us to justice, that sends a message to the world, and it tells Peyton that we did not forget her father. Right. And, and I make that point because that's the kind of clarity of leadership, and those decisions are not always popular. Those decisions generally, uh, generally are not poll tested. And even some in my own party, including my current vice president, had the same critique as you did. But what the American people understand is, is that I look at what we need to get done to keep the American people safe and to move our interests forward. 
and I make those decisions. All right. Let's go, and that leads us, this takes us right to the next segment, Governor. America's longest war, Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, Bob. Governor, you, you can't, get to go you can't, first. You can't, okay, but you can't have the, the president just lay out a whole series what, uh, of uh, items I, without giving me a chance well, to With respond. respect, sir, you had laid out quite a, a program there. Well, that's probably true. We'll, we'll, <laughs> give, you, we'll give you. We'll give uh, you. We'll agree. We'll on. catch you up. The United States is scheduled to turn over responsibility for security in Afghanistan to the Afghan government in 2014. At that point, we will withdraw our combat troops, leave a smaller force of Americans, if I understand our policy, in Afghanistan for training purposes. It seems to me the key question here is, what do you do if the deadline arrives and it is obvious the Afghans are unable to handle their security? Do we still leave? And I believe, Governor Romney, you go first. Well, we're going to be finished by 2014. And when I'm president, we'll make sure we bring our troops out by the end of 2014. The commanders and the generals there are on track to do so. We've seen progress over the past several years. The surge has been successful. And uh, the training program is proceeding apace. There are now uh, a large number of Afghan security forces, 350,000 that are, are, are ready to step in to provide security, and, and we're going to be able to make that transition by the end of, of 2014. So our troops will come home at that point. Uh, I, I can tell you at the same time that, uh, that we will uh, make sure that w w we look at what's happening in Pakistan and recognize that what's happening in Pakistan is going to have a major impact on the success uh, in, in Afghanistan. And, and I say that because I know a lot of people just feel like we should just brush our hands and walk away. And I don't mean you, Mr. President, but some people in, the, in, in our nation um, feel that Pakistan is being nice to us and that we should just walk away from them. But Pakistan is important to the region, to the world, and to us. Because Pakistan has 100 nuclear warheads, and they're rushing to build a lot more. They'll have more than Great Britain sometime in the, in the relatively near future. Uh, they also have the uh, Haqqani network and, and the Taliban uh, existent within their country. And so a, a, a Pakistan that falls apart, becomes a failed state, would be of extraordinary danger to Afghanistan and to us. And so we're going to have to remain helpful in encouraging Pakistan to move towards a, a, a more stable government and, and rebuild a relationship with us. And that means that, that, that our aid that we provide to Pakistan is going to have to be conditioned upon certain benchmarks being met. So for me, I look at this as both a, a, a need to help move Pakistan in the right direction and also to get Afghanistan to, to be ready, and they will be ready by the end of 2014. Mr. President, you know, when I came into office, we were still bogged down in, in Iraq, and Afghanistan had been drifting for a decade. We ended the war in Iraq, refocused our attention on Afghanistan, and we did deliver a surge of troops. That was facilitated in part because we had ended the war in Iraq. And we are now in a position where we have met many of the objectives that got us there in the first place. Part of what had happened is we'd forgotten why we had gone. We went because there were people who were responsible for 3,000 American deaths. And so we decimated al-Qaeda's core leadership in the border regions between uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan. We then started to build up Afghan forces. And we're now in a position where we can transition out. Because there's no reason why Americans should die when Afghans are perfectly capable of defending their own country. Now, that transition has to take place in a responsible fashion. We've been there a long time, and we've got to make sure that we and our coalition partners are pulling out responsibly and giving Afghans the capabilities that they need. But what I think the American people recognize is after a decade of war, it's time to do some nation building here at home. And what we can now do is free up some resources to, for example, put Americans back to work, especially our veterans, rebuilding our roads, our bridges, our schools, making sure that uh, you know, our veterans are getting the care that they need when it comes to post-traumatic stress disorder and uh, traumatic brain injury, making sure that the certifications that they uh, need for good jobs of the future are in place. You know, I, I was having lunch with some, uh, a veteran in Minnesota who had been a medic you know, dealing with the most extreme circumstances. When he came home and he wanted to become a nurse, he had to start from scratch. And what we've said is, let's change those certifications. 
Uh, the First Lady has done great work with an organization called Joining Forces, putting our veterans back to work. And, and as a consequence, veterans' unemployment is actually now lower than, than general population. It was higher when I came into office. So those are the kinds of things that we can now do because we're making that transition in Afghanistan. All right, let me go to uh, uh, Governor Romney. Uh, because you talked about uh, Pakistan and what needs to be done there. General Allen, our commander in Afghanistan, says that Americans continue to die at the hands of groups who are supported by Pakistan. We know that Pakistan has arrested the doctor who helped us catch Obama's uh, bin Laden. Uh, it still provides safe haven for terrorists, yet we continue to give Pakistan billions of dollars is it time for us to divorce Pakistan? No, it's not time to divorce uh, a nation uh, on earth that has uh, 100 nuclear weapons and is on the way to, to double that at some point. Uh, a nation that has uh, serious uh, threats from uh, uh, ter terrorist groups within its nation. As I indicated before, the Taliban, the Haqqani network, uh, it's a nation that's not like, like others and it does not have a civilian leadership that is calling the shots there. You've got the ISI, their intelligence organization is probably the most powerful of the uh, of, of three branches there. Then you have the military and then you have the, the civilian government. Uh, th this is a, a nation which if it falls apart, if it, if it becomes a failed state, uh, there are nuclear weapons there. And you've got, you've got terrorists there who could grab their, their hands under those nuclear weapons. This is, this is an important uh, part of the world for us. Uh, Pakistan is, is a, technically an ally. And, and they're not acting very much like an ally right now, but we have some work to do. And I, I don't blame the administration for the fact that the relationship with, with Pakistan is strained. Uh, we, we had to go into Pakistan. We had to go in there to get Osama bin Laden. That was the right thing to do. Uh, and, and that upset them, but there was obviously a great deal of anger even before that. But we're going to have to work with, the, with the, uh, the people in Pakistan to try and help them move to a more responsible uh, course than the one that they're on. And it's important for them, it's important for the nuclear weapons, it's important for the success of Afghanistan, because inside Pakistan you have a, a large group of Pashtuns that are, that are Taliban. They're, they're going to come rushing back in to Afghanistan when we go. And that's one of the reasons the Afghan security forces have so much work to do to be able to fight against that. But, but it's important for us to recognize that we can't just walk away from Pakistan. But we do need to make sure that as we, as we send support for them, that, that this is tied to them making progress on, on matters that would lead them to becoming a civil society. Uh, let me ask you, uh, Governor, because we know uh, President Obama's position on this. What is, his, what is your position on the use of drones? Well, I believe that we should use any and all means necessary to take out uh, people who p pose a threat to us and our friends around the world. And uh, it's widely reported that drones are being used in drone strikes, and I support that entirely and feel the president was right to up the usage of that technology and believe that we should continue to use it to continue to go after the people who represent a threat to this nation and to our friends. Uh, let me also note that, as I said earlier, we're going to have to do more than just going after leaders and, and killing bad guys. Important as that is, we're also going to have to have a far more effective and comprehensive strategy to help move the world away from terror and Islamic extremism. We haven't done that yet. We talk a lot about these things, but you look at the, the record. You look at the record of the last four years and say, is Iran closer to a bomb? Yes. Is the Middle East in tumult? Yes. Is, uh, is Al Qaeda on the run, uh, on its heels? No. Uh, is, is, are, are Israel and the Palestinians closer to, to reaching a peace agreement? No, they haven't had talks in two years. We have not seen the progress we need to have. And I'm convinced that with strong leadership and an effort to build a strategy based upon helping these nations reject extremism, we can see the kind of peace and prosperity the world demands. Well, keep in mind, our strategy wasn't just going after bin Laden. We've created partnerships throughout the region to deal with extremism in Somalia, in Yemen, in Pakistan. And what we've also done is engage these governments in the kind of reforms that are actually going to make a difference in people's lives day to day. To make sure that their governments aren't corrupt. To make sure that they are treating women with the kind of respect and dignity that every nation that succeeds has shown. And to make sure that they've got a free market system that works. 
So across the board, we are engaging them in building capacity in these countries, and we have stood on the side of democracy. One thing I think Americans should be proud of, when Tunisians began to protest, this nation, me, my administration, stood with them earlier than just about any other country. In Egypt, we stood on the side of democracy. In Libya, we stood on the side of the people. And as a consequence, there is no doubt that attitudes about Americans have changed. But there are always going to be elements in these countries that potentially threaten the United States. And we want to shrink those groups and those networks, and we can do that. But we're always also going to have to maintain vigilance when it comes to terrorist activities. The truth, though, is that al-Qaeda is much weaker than it was when I came into office, and they don't have the same capacities to attack the U.S. homeland and our allies as they did four years ago. Let's, uh, let's go to the next segment, because it's a very important one. It is uh, the rise of China and future challenges for America. I want to just begin this by asking uh, both of you, and uh, Mr. Preston, you, you go first this time. What do you believe is the greatest future threat to the national security of this country? Well, I think it will continue to be uh, terrorist networks. We have to remain vigilant, as I just said. Uh, but with respect to China, uh, China's both an adversary, but also a potential partner in the international community if it's following the rules. So my attitude coming into office was that we are going to insist that China plays by the same rules as everybody else. And I know Americans have, had seen jobs being shipped overseas, businesses and workers not getting a level playing field when it came to trade. And that's the reason why I set up a trade task force to uh, go after cheaters when it came to international trade. That's the reason why we have brought more cases against China for violating trade rules than the, other, uh, the previous administration had done in two terms. And we've won just about every case that we filed that, that has been decided. In fact, just recently, steel workers in Ohio and uh, throughout the Midwest, Pennsylvania, are in a position now to sell steel to China because we won that case. We had a tire case in which they were flooding us with cheap domestic tires, or, or, or cheap uh, Chinese tires. And we s put a stop to it, and as a consequence, saved jobs throughout America. Now, I have to say that Governor Romney criticized me for being too tough in that tire case. Said this wouldn't be good for American workers and that it would be protectionist. But I tell you, those workers don't feel that way. They feel as if they had finally an administration who was going to take this issue seriously. Over the long term, in order for us to compete with China. We've also got to make sure, though, that we're taking, business, taking care of business here at home. If we don't have the best education system in the world, if we don't continue to put money into research and technology that will allow us to, to create great businesses here in the United States, that's how we lose the competition. And unfortunately, Governor Romney's budget uh, and his proposals would not allow us to make those investments. All right. Governor. Well, first of all, it's not government that makes business successful. It's not government investments that make businesses grow and hire people. Uh, let me also note that the greatest threat that the world faces, the greatest national security threat, is a nuclear Iran. Um, let's talk about China. Uh, China has an interest that's very much like ours in one respect, and that is they want a stable world. They don't want war. They don't want to see uh, protectionism. They don't want to see uh, the, the world uh, break out into, into various forms of chaos because they have, to, they have to manufacture goods and put people to work. They have about 20, 000, 20 million rather, people coming out of the farms every year, coming into the cities, needing jobs. So they want the economy to work and the world to be free and open. And so we can be a partner with China. We don't have to be an adversary in any way, shape, or form. We can work with them. We can collaborate with them if they're willing to be responsible. Now, they look at us and say... Is it a good idea to be with America? How strong are we going to be? How strong is our economy? They look at the fact that we owe them a trillion dollars and owe other people 16 trillion in total, including them. They, they look at our, our decision to, to cut back on our military capabilities. A trillion dollars. The Secretary of Defense called these trillion dollars of cuts to our military devastating. It's not my term. 
It's the president's own secretary of defense called them devastating. They look at, at, at America's uh, commitments around the world and they see what's happening and they say, well, okay, is America going to be strong? And the answer is yes. If I'm president, America will be very strong. We'll also make sure that we have trade relations with China that work for us. I've watched year in and year out as companies have shut down and people have lost their jobs because China has not played by the same rules, in part by holding down artificially the value of their currency. It holds down the prices of their goods. It means our goods aren't as competitive and we lose jobs. That's got to end. They're making some progress. They need to make more. That's why on day one, I will label them a currency manipulator which allows us to apply tariffs where they're taking jobs. They're stealing our intellectual property, our patents, our designs, our technology, hacking into our computers, counterfeiting our goods. They have to understand, we want to trade with them, we want a world that's stable, we like free enterprise, but you've got to play by the rules. Uh, well, Governor, let me just ask you, uh, if you declare them a currency manipulator on day one, some people are say uh, you're just going to start a trade war with China on day one. Is that, isn't there a risk that that could happen? Well, they sell us about this much stuff every year. And we sell them about this much stuff every year. So it's pretty clear who doesn't want a trade war. And there's one going on right now, which we don't know about. It's a silent one, and, and they're winning. We have enormous trade imbalance with China, and it's worse this year than last year. And it's worse last year than the year before. And, and so we have to understand that we can't just surrender and, and lose jobs year in and year out, we have to say to our friends in China, look, you guys are playing aggressively, we understand it, but, but this can't keep on going. You can't keep on holding down the value of your currency, stealing our intellectual property, counterfeiting our products, selling them around the world, even into the United States. I was with one company that makes uh, uh, valves uh, in, in process industries. And they said, look, we were, we were having some valves coming in that, that were broken and we had to repair them under warranty. And we looked them up and, and they had our serial number on them. And then we noticed that, that there was more than one with that same serial number. There were counterfeit products being made overseas with the same serial number as a U.S. company, the same packaging. These were being sold into our market and around the world as if they were made by the U.S. competitor. This can't go on. I want a great relationship with China. China can be our partner. But, but that doesn't mean they can just roll all over us and steal our jobs on an unfair basis. Well, Governor Romney is right. Uh, you are familiar with jobs being shipped overseas because you invested in companies that were shipping jobs overseas. And, you know, that's, you're right. I mean, that's how our free market works. But I've made a different bet on American workers. You know, if we had taken your advice, Governor Romney, about our auto industry, we'd be buying cars from China instead of selling cars to China. If we take your advice with respect to how we change our tax codes so that companies that earn profits overseas don't pay U.S. taxes compared to companies here that are paying taxes, you know, that's estimated to create 800,000 jobs. The problem is they won't be here. They'll be in places like China. And if we're not making investments in education and basic research, which is not something that the private sector is doing at a sufficient pace right now and has never done, then we will lose the lead in things like clean energy technology. Now, with respect to what we've done with China already, U.S. exports have doubled since I came into office to China. And actually, currencies are at their most advantageous point for U.S. exporters since 1993. We absolutely have to make more progress. And that's why we're going to keep on pressing and when it comes to our military and Chinese security, part of the reason that we were able to uh, pivot to the Asia Pacific region after having ended the war in Iraq and transitioning out of Afghanistan is precisely because this is going to be a massive growth area in the future. And we believe China can be a partner, but we're also sending a very clear signal that America is a Pacific power, that we are going to have a presence there. We are working with countries in the region to make sure, for example, that ships can pass through, that, that commerce continues, and we're organizing trade relations with countries other than China so that China starts feeling more pressure about meeting basic international standards. That's the kind of leadership we've shown in the region. That's the kind of leadership that we'll continue to show. Uh, I just want to take one of those points. Um, again, uh, attacking me is not 
talking about an agenda for, for, for getting more trade and opening up more jobs in this country. But, but the president mentioned the auto industry and that somehow I would be in favor of jobs being elsewhere. Nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, I'm a son of Detroit. I was born in, in Detroit. Uh, my dad was head of a car company. Uh, I like American cars. And uh, I would do nothing to hurt the U.S. auto industry. My plan to get the industry on its feet when it was in real trouble was not to start writing checks. It was President Bush that wrote the first checks. I disagree with that. I said they need, these companies need to go through a managed bankruptcy. And in that process, they can get government help and government guarantees, but they need to go through bankruptcy to get rid of excess cost and the debt burden that they'd, they'd built up. And fortunately, Governor Romney, the that's president not took, what you said. Fortunately, the president, I, you, I, can take I, a, you can take a look Governor at the op Romney, you, you can not, take a look at the op You did not say you know, that I'm, you I'm would provide speaking. governor help. I said that we would provide guarantees and, and that was what was able to allow these companies to go through bankruptcy, to come out of bankruptcy. Under no circumstances would I do anything other than to help this industry get on its feet. And the idea that has been suggested that I would liquidate the industry, of course not. Of course not. Let's check That's the record. That's the height of silliness. Let, let, I have let's never check, said let's I, would check the record. I would liquidate the industry. Governor, I want the to keep the industry Detroit, going and forget. thriving. And, and that's why I have the kind of commitment to make sure that our industries in this country can compete and be successful. We in this country can compete successfully with anyone in the world. And we're going to. We're going to have to have a president, however, that doesn't think that somehow the government investing in, in car companies like Tesla and, and Fisker making electric battery cars. This is not research, Mr. President. These are the government investing in companies, investing in Solyndra. This is a company. This isn't basic research. I, I want to invest in research. Research is great. Providing funding to universities and think tanks, great. But investing in companies? Absolutely not. Governor, That's the wrong way the, to go. The, the I'm, st matters, I'm still speaking. Well, <laughs> so I want to make sure that we make, we make America more competitive yeah. and that we do those things that make America the most attractive place in the world for entrepreneurs, innovators, businesses to grow. But your investing in companies doesn't do that. In fact, it makes it less likely for them to come here Governor, because the private sector is not going to invest I'm, in a, in a, in a I'm, solar I'm, company I'm, I'm happy to respond. If, uh, if, if you're you investing the in government money in someone else's. The, uh, look, I think anybody out there can check the record. Governor Romney, you keep on trying to you know, airbrush history here. You were very clear that you would not provide government assistance to the U.S. auto companies even if they went through bankruptcy. You said that they could get it in the private marketplace. That wasn't true. They would have you're, gone through a liquid... You're wrong, I, uh, no, no, I am not you're wrong. wrong. I, I am not people wrong. People will look it and, up. You're right. People will look it up. Good. But more importantly, it is true that in order for us to be competitive, we're going to have to make some smart choices right now. Cutting our education budget, that's not a smart choice. That will not help us compete with China. Cutting our investments in research and technology, that's not a smart choice. That will not help us compete with China. Bringing down our deficit by adding $7 trillion of tax cuts and military spending that our military is not asking for before we even get to the debt that we currently have, that is not going to make us more competitive. Those are the kinds of choices that the American people face right now. Having a tax code that rewards companies that are shipping jobs overseas instead of companies that are investing here in the United States. That will not make us more competitive. And, and the one thing that I'm absolutely clear about is that after a decade in which we saw drift, jobs being shipped overseas, nobody championing American workers and American businesses, we've now begun to make some real progress. What we can't do is go back to the same policies that got us into such difficulty in the first place. And that's why we have to move forward and not go back. I could agree, agree more about going forward, but I certainly don't want to go back to the policies of the last four years. The policies of the last four years have seen incomes in America decline every year for middle-income families, now down $4,300 during your term. 23 million Americans still struggling to find a good job. When you came to office, 32 million people on food stamps. Today, 47 million people on food stamps. When you came to office, just over $10 trillion in debt. Now, $16 trillion in debt. It hasn't worked. You said by now we'd be at 5.4% unemployment. We're 9 million jobs short of that. I've met some of those people. I've met them in Appleton, Wisconsin. 
I, I met a young woman in, 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 in Philadelphia who's coming out of, out of college, can't find work. I've been, Anne was with someone just the other day that was just weeping about not being able to get work. It, it's just a tragedy in a nation so prosperous as ours that these last four years have been so hard. And, that, and that's why it's so critical that we make America once again the most attractive place in the world to start businesses, to, to build jobs, to grow the economy. And that's not going to happen by, by just hiring teachers. Look, I, I, love to hire, I love teachers, and I'm happy to have states and communities that want to hire teachers do that. I, by the way, I, I don't like to have the federal Governor. government start pushing its way deeper and deeper into, into our schools. Let the states and localities do that. I was a governor. The federal government didn't hire our teachers. But, I, but I, I love teachers. But I want to get our private sector growing, and I know how to do it. I think we all love teachers. Gentlemen, thank you so much uh, for, for a very vigorous debate. We have come to the end. It is time for closing statements. I believe you're first, Mr. President. Well, thank you very much, Bob, Governor Romney, and to Lynn University. Now, you've now heard three debates, months of campaigning, and way too many TV commercials. <laughs> and now you've got a choice. Now, over the last four years, we've made real progress digging our way out of policies that gave us two prolonged wars, record deficits, and the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. And Governor Romney wants to take us back to those policies. Uh, foreign policy that's wrong and reckless, uh, economic policies that won't create jobs, won't reduce our deficit, but will make sure that folks at the very top don't have to play by the same rules that you do. And I've got a different vision for America. I want to build on our strengths. And I've put forward a plan to make sure that we're bringing manufacturing jobs back to our shores by rewarding companies and small businesses that are investing here, not overseas. I want to make sure we've got the best education system in the world. And we're retaining our workers for the jobs of tomorrow. I want to control our own energy by developing oil and natural gas, but also the energy sources of the future. Yes, I want to reduce our deficit by cutting spending that we don't need, but also by asking the wealthy to do a little bit more so that we can invest in things like research and technology that are the key to a 21st century economy. As Commander-in-Chief, I will maintain the strongest military in the world, keep faith with our troops, and go after those who would do us harm. But after a decade of war, I think we all recognize we've got to do some nation building here at home, rebuilding our roads, our bridges and especially caring for our veterans who sacrificed so much for our freedom. You know, we've been through tough times, but we always bounce back because of our character, because we pull together. And if I have the privilege of being your president for another four years, I promise you I will always listen to your voices, I will fight for your families, and I will work every single day to make sure that America continues to be the greatest nation on earth. Thank you. Governor. Thank you. Bob, Mr. President. Folks at Lynn University, good to be with you. Um, I'm optimistic about the future. I'm excited about our prospects as a nation. I want to see peace. I want to see growing peace in this country. It's our objective. We have an opportunity to have real leadership. America is going to have that kind of leadership and continue to promote principles of peace that will make a world a safer place and make people in this country more confident that their future is secure. I also want to make sure that we get this economy going. And there are two very different paths the country can take. One is a path represented by the president, which at the end of four years would mean we'd have $20 trillion in debt heading towards Greece. I'll get us on track to a balanced budget. The president's path will mean continuing declining in take-home pay. I want to make sure our take-home pay turns around and starts to grow. The president's path means 20 million people out of work struggling for a good job. I'll get people back to work with 12 million new jobs. I'm going to make sure that we get people off of food stamps, not by cutting the program, but by getting them good jobs. America's going to come back. And for that to happen, we're going to have to have a president who can work across the aisle. I was in a state where my legislature was 87 percent Democrat. I learned how to get along on the other side of the aisle. We've got to do that in Washington. Washington is broken. I know what it takes to get this country back. And we'll work with good Democrats and good Republicans to do that. This nation is the hope of the earth. We've been blessed by having a nation that's free and prosperous thanks to the contributions of the greatest generation. They've held a torch for the world to see, a torch of freedom and hope and opportunity. Now it's our turn.
to take that torch. I'm convinced we'll do it. We need strong leadership. I'd like to be that leader with your support. I'll work with you. I'll lead you in an open and honest way. And I ask for your vote. I'd like to be the next president of the United States to support and help this great nation and to make sure that we all together maintain America as the hope of the earth. Thank you so much. Gentlemen, thank you both so much. That brings an end to this year's debates, and we want to thank Lynn University and its students for having us. As I always do at the end of these debates, I leave you with the words of my mom, who said, go vote. It makes you feel big and strong. That's great. Good night. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Nice thank job. you, Bob. Thank you.